Voyage to the North Pacific Ocean and Round the World by Captain George Vancouver. Book the Third, Chapter One. 1792, November, Thursday, 13. Thursday morning discovered our anchorage to be in a most excellent small bay within three fourths of a mile of the nearest shore, heaving by compass south, one point of the bay bearing N56W, the other S73E, the former at the distance of two degrees, the latter about three miles. The herds of cattle and flocks of sheep grazing on the surrounding hills were a sight we had long been strangers to and brought to our minds many pleasing reflections. These indicated that the residents of their proprietors could not be far remote, though we could perceive neither habitations nor inhabitants. On hoisting the colors at sunrise, a gun was fired, and in a little time afterwards, several people were seen on horseback coming from behind the hills down to the beach, who waved their hats and made other signals for a boat, which was immediately sent to the shore. And on its return, I was favored with the good company of a priest of the Order of St. Francisco and a sergeant in the Spanish army to breakfast. The Reverend Father expressed, and seemingly with great sincerity, the pleasure he felt at our arrival, and assured me that every refreshment and service in the power of himself, or mission to bestow, I might unreservedly command, since it would be conferring on them all a peculiar obligation to allow them to be serviceable. The sergeant expressed himself in the most friendly manner, and informed me that in the absence of the commandant, he was directed on our arrival to render us every accommodation the settlement could afford. We attended them on shore after breakfast, where they embraced the earliest opportunity of proving that their friendly expressions were not empty professions by presenting me with a very fine ox, a sheep, and some excellent vegetables. The good friar, after pointing out the most convenient spot for procuring wood and water, and repeating the hospitable offers he had before made in the name of the fathers of the Franciscan order, returned to the mission of St. Francisco, which we understood was at no great distance, and to which he gave us the most pressing invitation. From these gentlemen we learned that the station we had taken was far within the general anchoring place of the Spanish vessels, which they said was off that part of the shore where the light was shown and guns fired the preceding night on the beach near the entrance into the port. Our situation was, however, perfectly commodious and suitable to all our purposes, and with permission of the sergeant, I directed a tent to be pitched for the accommodation of the party employed in procuring wood and water, whilst the red of the crew were engaged on board in repairing the damages sustained in our sails, rigging, etc., during the tempestuous weather with which we had lately contended. We amused ourselves with shooting a few quails on the adjacent hills, and in the afternoon returned on board to partake of the excellent repast which had been supplied by our hospitable friends. Whilst we were thus pleasantly engaged, our boat brought off Father Amonio Dante, the principal of the mission of San Francisco, and Senor Don Hermegildo Sal, an ensign in the Spanish army and commandant of the port. This gentleman, like those who visited us in the morning, met us with such warm expressions of friendship and goodwill as were not less deserving our highest commendations than our moral grateful acknowledgments. The happiness they seemed to anticipate did not appeal to arise so much from any pleasure they might derive in our society as from the comforts and assistance which it was in their power to administer. This was manifested by all their actions and by their expressing that our arrival had empowered them to execute a task the most accordant to their own wishes, as well as to the directions of their sovereign, which had been communicated to them and to the neighboring settlements and missions. From Senor Sal, I was made acquainted that although the situation we had taken might answer our purposes in a certain degree, yet there was one which we had passed by the preceding evening that we should find infinitely more commodious, as we should then be more immediately in his neighborhood and more frequent opportunities would be afforded him of rendering us service. In addition to the motive of his politeness, I was induced to comply with his wishes by the falling tide, discovering to us a very great obstacle to our communication with that part of the shore, from whence the wood and water were to be procured. 
a large bank of soft mud was found at low water to extend nearly halfway between the ship and the shore. I understood from these gentlemen that Senor Quadra still waited our arrival at Monterey. I therefore entrusted to them a letter informing him of our arrival in this port, to which Senor Sal said an answer would most likely be procured in the course of three or four days. Having joined with us in drinking the healths of our royal masters, they took their leave and returned to the shore. In the afternoon, a fresh breeze from the southeast sprang up, attended with rainy, disagreeable weather, which continued during the night. The next morning, we had a strong gale from the south and southwest, with heavy squalls and much rain. Having no time to spare, and the pilot sent by Senor Sal being arrived, we proceeded under double reef topsails to the general place of anchorage, which we reached by noon and took our station about a quarter of a mile from the shore in five fathoms water. The outer anchor was in 13 fathoms soft muddy bottom. In this situation, the southeast and northwest points of the passage into this port in a line bore by compass south 80 west, distant about half a mile. The flagstaff at the Presidio bore south 42 east. The little we had seen of Port San Francisco enabled us to decide that it was very extensive in two directions. One spacious branch took its course east and southeastward to a great distance from the station we had quitted in the morning. The other, apparently of equal magnitude, led to the northward. In this were several islands. Although I had been informed by Senor Quadra that the boundaries of this inlet had been defined, yet I was anxious to be more particularly acquainted with its extent, having since been given to understand that Senor Quadra's information was by no means correct. Near the branch leading to the east and southeastward above mentioned is situated the mission of Santa Clara. These gentlemen informed me that this branch had been thoroughly examined, but that the branch leading to the north never had. I was, however, obliged to remain contented under the uncertainty of such contradictory information. For the port having been established by Spain, I did not consider it prudent to prosecute its examination without sufficient authority for so doing. Nor was the weather favorable for such an undertaking, though it did not prevent the exercise of those friendly dispositions in the Spanish commandant which he had before professed. He had been some time on the beach in the rain before we anchored for the purpose of instantly affording us any assistance in his power to supply. A message to this effect was brought by three of the native Indians who spoke Spanish and who came on board in a canoe of the country, which with another, though perhaps the same, seen crossing the harbor the evening we entered it, were the only Indian vessels we had met with and were without exception the most rude and sorry contrivances for embarkation I had ever beheld. The length of them was about 10 feet, the breadth about three or four. They were constructed of rushes and dried grass of a long, broad leaf, made up into rolls the length of the canoe, the thickest in the middle, and regularly tapering to a point at each end. These are so disposed that on their ends being secured and lashed together, the vessel is formed, which being broadest in the middle, and coming to a point at each extremity goes with either end foremost. These rolls are laid and fastened so close to each other that in calm weather and smooth water I believe them to be tolerably dry, but they appear to be very ill calculated to contend with wind and waves. The wind now blew strong with heavy squalls from the SW, and in the middle of this spacious inlet the sea broke with much force, notwithstanding which, as soon as these people had delivered their message. They crossed the inlet for the purpose of catching fish without seeming to entertain the least apprehension for their safety. They conducted their canoe or vessel by long double-bladed paddles like those used by the Eskimo. The SW wind, attended by much rain, blew very hard until the morning of the 17th when the weather becoming more moderate, I visited the shore. I was greatly mortified to find that neither wood nor water could be procured with such convenience nor of so good a quality as at the station we had quitted a league and a half within the entrance of the port on the southern shore. But as our Spanish friends had informed us that the water here was far superior, 
in its quality to that at Monterey, there was now no alternative but that of taking what the country afforded. A tent was immediately pitched on the shore, wells were dug for obtaining water, and a party was employed in procuring fuel from small, bushy, holly-leaved oaks, the only trees fit for our purpose. A lagoon of seawater was between the beach and the spot on which these trees grew, which rendered the conveying the wood, when cut, a very laborious operation. Whilst engaged in allotting to the people their different employments, some saddled horses arrived from the commandant with a very cordial invitation to his habitation, which was accepted by myself and some of the officers. We rode up to the Presidio, an appellation given to their military establishments in this country, and signifying a safe guard. The residence of the friars is called a mission. We soon arrived at the Presidio, which was not more than a mile from our landing place. Its wall, which fronted the harbor, was visible from the ships. But instead of the city or town, whose lights we had so anxiously looked for on the night of our arrival, we were conducted into a spacious verdant plain, surrounded by hills on every side, excepting that which fronted the port. The only object of human industry which presented itself was a square area, whose sides were about 200 yards in length, enclosed by a mud wall and resembling a pound for cattle. Above this wall, the thatched roofs of their low small houses just made their appearance. On entering the Presidio, we found one of its sides still unenclosed by the wall and very indifferently fenced in by a few bushes here and there, fastened to stakes in the ground. The unfinished state of this part afforded us an opportunity of seeing the strength of the wall and the manner in which it was constructed. It is about 14 feet high and five feet in breadth and was first formed by uprights and horizontal rafters of large timber between which dried sods and moistened earth were pressed as close and as hard as possible. After which the hole was cased with the earth made into a fort of mud plaster which gave it the appearance of durability and of being sufficiently strong to protect them with the assistance of their firearms against all the force which the natives of the country might be able to collect. The Spanish soldiers composing the garrison amounted, I understood, to 35, who, with their wives, families, and a few Indian servants, composed the whole of the inhabitants. Their houses were along the wall, within the square, and their fronts uniformly extended the same distance into the area, which is a clear open space, without buildings or other interruptions. The only entrance into it is by a large gateway facing which, and against the center of the opposite wall or side, is the church, which, though small, was neat in comparison to the rest of the buildings. This projects further into the square than the houses, and is distinguishable from the other edifices, by being whitewashed with lime made from seashells, as there has not yet been any limestone or calcareous earth discovered in the neighborhood. On the left of the church is the commandant's house, consisting, I believe, of two rooms and a closet only, which are divided by massy walls, similar to that which encloses the square, and communicating with each other by very small doors. Between these apartments and the outward wall was an excellent poultry house and yard, which seemed pretty well stocked, and between the roof and ceilings of the rooms was a kind of lumber garret. These were all the conveniencies the habitation seemed calculated to afford. The rest of the houses, though smaller, were fashioned exactly after the same manner, and in the winter, or rainy seasons, must at the best be very uncomfortable dwellings, for though the walls are a sufficient security against the inclemency of the weather, yet the windows, which are cut in the front wall and look into the square, are destitute of glass or any other defense that does not at the same time exclude the light. The apartment in the commandant's house into which we were ushered was about 30 feet long, 14 feet broad, and 12 feet high. And the other room or chamber I judged to be of the same dimensions, excepting in its length, which appeared to be somewhat less. The floor was of the native soil, raised about three feet from its original level without being boarded, paved, 
or even reduced to an even surface. The roof was covered in with flags and rushes. The walls on the inside had once been whitewashed. The furniture consisted of a very sparing assortment of the most indispensable articles, of the rudest fashion and of the meanest kind, and ill accorded with the ideas we had conceived of the sumptuous manner in which the Spaniards live on this side of the globe. It would, however, be the highest injustice, notwithstanding that elegancies were wanting, not to acknowledge the very cordial reception and hearty welcome we experienced from our worthy host, who had provided a refreshing repast, and such an one as he thought likely to be most acceptable at that time of the day. Nor was his lady less assiduous, nor did she seem less happy than himself in entertaining her new guests. On approaching the house, we found this good lady who, like her spouse, had passed the middle age of life, decently dressed, seated cross-legged on a mat, placed on a small square wooden platform raised three or four inches from the ground, nearly in front of the door, with two daughters and a son, clean and decently dressed, sitting by her, this being the mode observed by these ladies when they receive visitors. The decorous and pleasing behavior of the children was really admirable, and exceeded anything that could have been expected from them under the circumstances of their situation without any other advantages than the education and example of their parents, which however seemed to have been studiously attended to and did them great credit. This pleasing sight added to the friendly reception of our host and hostess, rendered their lowly residence no longer an object of our attention. And having partaken of the refreshments they had provided, we remounted our horses in order to take a view of the surrounding country before we returned on board to dinner, where Senor Sal and his family had promised to favor me with their good company, and who had requested my permission to increase their party by the addition of some other ladies in the garrison. Our excursion did not extend far from the Presidio, which is situated as before described in a plain surrounded by hills. This plain is by no means a dead flat, but of unequal surface. The soil is of a sandy nature and was wholly under pasture on which were grazing several flocks of sheep and herds of cattle. The sides of the surrounding hills, though but moderately elevated, seemed barren or nearly so, and their summits were composed of naked, uneven rocks. Two small spaces in the plain, very insecurely enclosed, were appropriated to kitchen gardens much labor did not appear to have been bestowed either in the improvement of the soil, in selecting the quality of the vegetables, or in augmenting their produce. The several seeds once placed in the ground, nature was left to do the rest without receiving any assistance from manual labor. Senor Sal, having been made acquainted with the difficulties we had to encounter in removing our wood to the seaside, politely offered us the carts he had for the use of the Presidio. But on their being, produced. I was greatly disappointed, as they were by no means so well calculated as the miserable straw canoes for the service they were intended to perform. Thus, at the expense of very little examination, though not without much disappointment, was our curiosity satisfied concerning the Spanish town and settlement of St. Francisco. Instead of finding a country tolerably well inhabited and far advanced in cultivation, if we accept its natural pastures, the stocks of sheep and herds of cattle, there is not an object to indicate the most remote connection with any European or other civilized nation. This sketch will be sufficient without further comment to convey some idea of the inactive spirit of the people and the unprotected state of the establishment at this port which I should conceive ought to be a principal object of the Spanish crown as a key and barrier to their more southern and valuable settlements on the borders of the North Pacific. Should my idea of its importance be overrated, certain it is that considered solely as an establishment which must have been formed at considerable expense, it possesses no other means for its protection than such as have been already described. With a brass three-pounder mounted on a rotten carriage before the Presidio, and a similar piece of ordnance which, I was told, was at the S.E. point of entrance, lashed to a log instead of a carriage, and was the gun whose report we heard the evening of our arrival. Before the Presidio, there had formerly been two pieces of ordnance, 
but one of them had lately burst to pieces. The examination of these few objects and the consequent observations upon them occupied our leisure until dinner time when we returned on board accompanied by Senor Sal, his wife and party and one of the fathers of the mission of St. Francisco, Martin de Landaeta, who brought me a pressing and polite invitation from his brethren and who proved to be a very pleasing and entertaining acquisition to our society. The next day, being Sunday, was appointed for my visiting the mission. Accompanied by Mr. Menzies and some of the officers and our friendly Senor Sal, I rode thither to dinner. Its distance from the Presidio is about a league in an eastwardly direction. Our ride was rendered at unpleasant by the soil being very loose and sandy and by the road being much incommoded with low groveling bushes. Its situation and external appearance in a great measure resembled that of the Presidio and, like its neighbourhood, the country was pleasingly diversified with hill and dale. The hills were at a greater distance from each other and gave more extent to the plain, which is composed of a soil infinitely richer than that of the Presidio, being a mixture of sand and a black vegetable mould. The pasturers bore a more luxuriant herbage and fed a greater number of sheep and cattle. The barren sandy country through which we had passed seemed to make a natural division between the lands of the mission and those of the Presidio and extends from the shores of the port to the foot of a ridge of mountains which border on the exterior coast and appear to stretch in a line parallel to it. The verdure of the plain continued to a considerable height up the sides of these hills, the summits of which, though still composed chiefly of rugged rocks, produced a few trees. The buildings of the mission formed two sides of a square only and did not appear as if intended at any future time to form a perfect quadrangle like the Presidio. The architecture and materials, however, seemed nearly to correspond. On our arrival, we were received by the Reverend Fathers with every demonstration of cordiality, friendship, and the most genuine hospitality. We were instantly conducted to their mansion, which was situated near and communicated with the church. The houses formed a small oblong square, the side of the church composed one end, near which were the apartments allotted to the Fathers. These were constructed nearly after the manner of those at the Presidio, but appeared to be more finished, better contrived, were larger and much more cleanly. Along the walls of this interior square were also many other apartments adapted to various purposes. Whilst dinner was preparing, our attention was engaged in seeing the several houses within the square. Some we found appropriated to the reception of grain, of which, however, they had not a very abundant stock, nor was the place of its growth within sight of the mission, though the richness of the contiguous soil seemed equal to all the purposes of husbandry. One large room was occupied by manufacturers of a coarse fort of blanketing made from the wool produced in the neighborhood. The looms, though rudely wrought, were tolerably well contrived and had been made by the Indians under the immediate direction and superintendence of the fathers, who, by the same assiduity, had carried the manufacture thus far into execution. The produce resulting from their manufactory is wholly applied to the clothing of the converted Indians. I saw some of the cloth, which was by no means despicable, and, had it received the advantage of fulling, would have been a very decent fort of clothing. The preparation of the wool, as also the spinning and weaving of it, was, I understood, performed by unmarried women and female children who were all resident within the square and were in a state of conversion to the Roman Catholic persuasion. Besides manufacturing the wool, they are also instructed in a variety of necessary, useful and beneficial employments until they marry, which is greatly encouraged. When they retire from the tuition of the fathers, to the hut of their husband. By these means it is expected that their doctrines will be firmly established and rapidly propagated, and the trouble they now have with their present untaut flock will be hereafter recompensed by having fewer prejudices to combat in the recent generation. 
they likewise consider their plan as essentially necessary in a political point of view for ensuring their own safety. The women and girls being the dearest objects of affection amongst these Indians, the Spaniards deem it expedient to retain constantly a certain number of females immediately within their power as a pledge for the fidelity of the men and as a check on any improper designs the natives might attempt to carry into execution either against the missionaries or the establishment in general. By various encouragements and allurements to the children or their parents, they can depend upon having as many to bring up in this way as they require. Here they are well fed, better clothed than the Indians in the neighborhood, are kept clean, instructed, and have every necessary care taken of them. And in return for these advantages, they must submit to certain regulations, amongst which they are not suffered to go out of the interior square in the daytime without permission, are never to sleep out of it at night, and to prevent elopements, this square has no communication with the country, but by one common door, which the fathers themselves take care of, and see that it is well secured every evening, as also the apartments of the women, who generally retire immediately after supper, if I am correctly informed by the different Spanish gentlemen with whom I conversed on this subject, the uniform, mild, and kind-hearted disposition of this religious order has never failed to attach to their interest the affections of the natives wherever they have sat down amongst them. This is a very happy circumstance, for their situation otherwise would be excessively precarious as they are protected only by five soldiers who reside under the directions of a corporal in the buildings of the mission at some distance on the other side of the church. The establishment must certainly be considered as liable to some danger. Should these children of nature be ever induced to act an ungrateful and treacherous part, they might easily conceal sufficient weapons to effect any evil purpose. There are only three fathers. These live by themselves and should any attempt be made upon them at night, the very means they have adopted for their security might deprive them of any assistance from the guard until it might be too late. And individually, they could make but little resistance. Should a conspiracy for their destruction take place, the mission would soon fall, and there would be little. Doubt of the conspirators being joined by the Indians of the village, which is in the vicinity of the mission, and was said to contain 600 persons, but on visiting it, I considered their number greatly overrated. The major part of them, I understood, were converted to the Roman Catholic persuasion. But I was astonished to observe how few advantages had attended their conversion. They seemed to have treated with the most perfect indifference the precepts and laborious example of their truly worthy and benevolent pastors whose object has been to allure them from their life of indolence and raise in them a spirit of emulous industry, which by securing to them plenty of food and the common conveniences of life would necessarily augment their comforts and encourage them to seek and embrace the blessings of civilized society. Deaf to the important lessons and insensible of the promised advantages, they still remained in the most abject state of uncivilization. And if we accept the inhabitants of Terra del Fuego, and those of Van Diemen's land. They are certainly a race of the most miserable beings I ever saw, possessing the faculty of human reason. Their persons, generally speaking, were under the middle size and very ill-made, their faces ugly, presenting a dull, heavy, and stupid countenance, devoid of sensibility or the least expression. One of their greatest aversions is cleanliness, both in their persons and habitations, which, after the fashion of their forefathers, were still without the most trivial improvement. Their houses were of a conical form, about six or seven feet in diameter at their base, which is the ground, and are constructed by a number of stakes, chiefly of the willow tribe, which are driven erect into the earth in a circular manner, the upper ends of which being small and pliable are brought nearly to join at the top in the center of the circle. And these being securely fastened, give the upper part or roof somewhat of a flattish appearance. Thinner twigs of the like species are horizontally interwoven between the uprights, forming a piece of basket work about 10 or 12 feet high. At the top, a small aperture is left, 
which allows the smoke of the fire made in the center of the hut to escape and admits most of the light they receive. The entrance is by a small hole close to the ground through which with difficulty one person at a time can gain admittance. The hole is covered over with a thick thatch of dried grass and rushes. These miserable habitations, each of which was allotted for the residence of a whole family, were erected with some degree of uniformity, about three or four feet asunder, in straight rows, leaving lanes or passages at right angles between them. But these were so abominably infested with every kind of filth and nastiness as to be rendered not less offensive than degrading to the human species. Close by stood the church, which for its magnitude, architecture and internal decorations did great credit to the constructors of it and presented a striking contrast between the exertions of genius and such as bare necessity is capable of suggesting. The raising and decorating this edifice appeared to have greatly attracted the attention of the fathers and the comforts they might have provided in their own humble habitations seem to have been totally sacrificed to the accomplishment of this favorite object. Even their garden, an object of such material importance, had not yet acquired any great degree of cultivation, though its soil was a rich black mold and promised an ample return for any labor that might be bestowed upon it. The whole contained about four acres, was tolerably well fenced in, and produced some fig, peach, apple and other fruit trees, but afforded a very scanty supply of useful vegetables, the principal part lying waste and overrun with weeds. On our return to the convent, we found a most excellent and abundant repast provided of beef, mutton, fish, fowls, and such vegetables as their garden afforded. The attentive and hospitable behavior of our new friends amply compensated for the homely manner in which the dinner was served, and would certainly have precluded my noticing the distressing inconvenience these valuable people labor under in the want of almost all the common and most necessary utensils of life had I not been taught to expect that this colony was in a very different stage of improvement and that its inhabitants were infinitely more comfortably circumstanced. After dinner, we were engaged in an entertaining conversation in which, by the assistance of Mr. Dobson, our interpreter, we were each able to bear a part. Amongst other things, I understood that this mission was established in the year 1775 and the Presidio of St. Francisco in 1778 and that they were the northernmost settlements of any description formed by the court of Spain on the continental shore of Northwest America or the islands adjacent exclusive of Nootka which I did not consider as coming under that description any more than the temporary establishment which in the preceding spring had been formed by Senor Quadra near Cape Flattery at the entrance of the Straits of Juan de Fuca and which has been already stated to be entirely evacuated. The excursions of the Spaniards seem to be confined to the neighborhood of their immediate place of residence and the direct line of country between one station and another as they have no vessels for embarkation excepting the native canoe and an old rotten wooden one which was lying near our landing place. Had they proper boats on this spacious sheet of water, their journeys would not only be much facilitated, but it would afford a very agreeable variety in their manner of life and help to pass away many of the solitary and wearisome hours which they must unavoidably experience. I understood that the opposite side of the port had been visited by some soldiers on horseback who obtained but little information. Some converted Indians were found living amongst the natives of the northern and western parts of the port who were esteemed by the Spaniards to be a docile and in general a well-disposed people, though little communication took place between them and the inhabitants of this side. The missionaries found no difficulty in subjecting these people to their authority. It is mild and charitable, teaches them the cultivation of the soil and introduces amongst them such of the useful arts as are most essential to the comforts of human nature and social life. It is much to be wished that these benevolent exertions may succeed, though there is every appearance that their progress will be very slow, yet they will probably lay a foundation 
on which the posterity of the present race may secure to themselves the enjoyment of civil society. The next establishment of this nature, and the only one within our reach from our present station, was that of Santa Clara, lying to the southeastward at the distance of about 18 leagues, and considered as one day's journey. As there was no probability of our wood and water being completely on board in less than three or four days, I accepted the offer of Senor Sal and the Reverend Fathers, who undertook to provide us horses for an expedition to Santa Clara the following morning. At the decline of day, we took our leave and concluded a visit that had been highly interesting and entertaining to us and had appeared to be equally grateful to our hospitable friends. On my return to the Presidio, I was favored with a polite reply from Senor Quadra, in which he informed me that neither the Chatham nor the Daedalus had yet arrived at Monterey, but that on their reaching that port, I might rely on their receiving every assistance and service in his power to bestow, and trusted it would not be long ere the discovery would rejoin them at Monterey. Tuesday 20th. During the night, the wind from the SW blew a strong gale and continued with much rain until the morning of the 20th. When the weather being serene and pleasant, we undertook our journey to Santa Clara. We called in our way on our friends at the Presidio and Mission, with whose company we were to have been favoured. But in consequence of some dispatches received by Senor Sal, which required his immediate attention, and of the indisposition of one of the fathers, they begged leave to decline the engagement. We therefore, agreeably with the fashion of the country, sat out, attended by a drove of spare horses, more than double the number of our party, under the guidance of the sergeant of the Presidio, who was accompanied by six stout active soldiers, fully accoutred for our protection and for affording us such assistance as we might require. We considered our route to be parallel with the sea coast, between which and our path the ridge of mountains before mentioned extended to the southeastward, and as we advanced, their sides and summits exhibited a high degree of luxuriant fertility, interspersed with copses of various forms and magnitude, verdant open spaces, and enriched with stately forest trees of different descriptions. The plain on which we rode stretched from the base of these mountains to the shores of the port, and gradually improved as we proceeded. The holly-leaved oak, maple horse chestnut, and willow were increased from dwarf shrubs to trees of tolerable size, having some of the common English dwarf oak scattered amongst them. Our journey was estimated at 18 leagues, in which distance the country afforded no house, hut, nor any place of shelter, excepting such as the spreading trees presented. About noon, having then advanced about 23 miles, we arrived at a very pleasant and enchanting lawn situated amidst a grove of trees at the foot of a small hill by which flowed a very fine stream of excellent water. This delightful pasture was nearly enclosed on every side and afforded sufficient space for resting of ourselves and baiting our cavalry. The bank which overhung the murmuring brook was well adapted for taking the refreshment which our provident friends had supplied and with some grog we had brought from the ship, spirits and wine being scarce articles in this country, we all made a most excellent meal. But it required some resolution to quit so lovely a scene, the beauty of which was greatly heightened by the delightful serenity of the weather. To this, however, after resting about an hour, we were obliged to submit. When a fresh supply of cavalry being selected from the drove of horses, we mounted and pursued our journey. We had not proceeded far from this delightful spot when we entered a country I little expected to find in these regions. For about 20 miles, it could only be compared to a park which had originally been closely planted with the true old English oak. The underwood that had probably attended its early growth had the appearance of having been cleared away and had left the stately lords of the forest in complete possession of the soil, which was covered with luxuriant herbage and beautifully diversified with pleasing eminences and valleys, which, with the range of lofty, rugged mountains that bounded the prospect, 
required only to be adorned with the neat habitations of an industrious people to produce a scene not inferior to the most studied effect of taste in the disposal of grounds. Especially when seen from the port or its confines, the waters of which extend some distance by the side of this country, and though they were not visible to us, I was inclined to believe they approached within about a league of the road we pursued. Our riding was attended with some inconvenience on account of the fox earths and burrows of rabbits, squirrels, rats, and other animals. But our sure-footed horses avoided every danger. Notwithstanding, we rode at a brisk rate. Having passed through this imaginary park, we advanced a few miles in an open, clear meadow and arrived in a low, swampy country, through which our progress was very slow, the horses being nearly knee-deep in mud and water for about six miles. The badness of our road rendered this part of our journey somewhat unpleasant. About dark we reached better ground, and soon after the night closed in, we arrived at the mission of Santa Clara, which according to my estimation is about 40 geographical miles from St. Francisco. Our journey, excepting that part of it through the morass, had been very pleasant and entertaining, and our reception at Santa Clara by the hospitable fathers of the mission was such as excited in every breast the most lively sensations of gratitude and regard. Father Thomas de la Pena appeared to be the principal of the missionaries. The anxious solicitude of this gentleman and that of his colleague, Father Joseph Sanchez, to anticipate all our wishes, unequivocally manifested the principles by which their conduct was regulated. Our evening passed very pleasantly and after a most excellent breakfast the next morning on tea and chocolate, we took a view of the establishment and the adjacent country. The buildings and offices of this mission, like those of St. Francisco, form a square, but not an entire enclosure. It is situated in an extensive fertile plain, the soil of which, as also that of the surrounding country, is a rich black productive mold, superior to any I had before seen in America. The particular spot which had been selected by the Reverend Fathers for their establishment did not appear so suitable to their purpose as many other parts of the plain within a little distance of their present buildings, which are erected in a low marshy situation for the sake of being near a run of fine water. Notwithstanding that within a few hundred yards they might have built their houses on dry and comfortable eminences. The stream of water passes close by the walls of the Fathers' apartments which are upon the same plan with those at St. Francisco, built near and communicating with the church, but appearing to be more extensive and to possess in some degree more comforts or rather less inconveniences than those already described. The church was long and lofty and as well built as the rude materials of which it is composed would allow, and when compared with the unimproved state of the country, was infinitely more decorated than might have been reasonably expected. Apartments within the square in which the priests resided were appropriated to a number of young female Indians, and the like reasons were given as at St. Francisco for their being so selected and educated. Their occupations were the same, though some of their woolen manufactures surpassed those we had before seen, and wanted only the operation of fulling, with which the fathers were unacquainted, to make them very decent blankets. The upper story of their interior oblong square, which might be about 170 feet long and 100 feet broad, were made use of as granaries, as were some of the lower rooms, all of which were well stored with corn and pulse of different sorts. And beside these, in case of fire, there were two spacious warehouses for the reception of grain, detached from each other, and the rest of the buildings, erected at a convenient distance from the mission. These had been recently finished, contained some stores, and were to be kept constantly full as a reserve in the event of such a misfortune. They cultivate wheat, maize, peas, and beans. The latter are produced in great variety, and the whole in greater abundance than their necessities require. Of these several sorts, they had many thousand bushels in store, of very excellent quality, 
which had been obtained with little labor and without manure. By the help of a very mean and ill-contrived plow drawn by oxen, the earth is once slightly turned over and smoothed down by a harrow. In the month of November or December, the wheat is sown in drills or broad east on the even surface and scratched in with the harrow. This is the whole of their system of husbandry, which uniformly produces them in July or August an abundant harvest. The maize, peas and beans are produced with as little labor. These are sown in the spring months and succeed extremely well as do hemp and flax or linseed. The wheat affords in general from 25 to 30 for one according to the seasons. 25 for one being the least return they have ever yet deposited in their granaries from the field. Notwithstanding the enormous waste occasioned by their rude method of threshing, which is always performed in the open air by the treading of cattle, the product of the other grains and pulse bears a similar proportion to that of the wheat. I was much surprised to find that neither barley nor oats were cultivated. On inquiry, I was given to understand that as the superior kinds of grain could be plentifully obtained with the same labor that the inferior ones would require, they had some time ago declined the cultivation of them. The labors of the field are performed under the immediate inspection of the fathers by the natives who are instructed in the Roman Catholic faith and taught the art of husbandry. The annual produce is taken under the care of these worthy pastors who distribute it in such quantities to the several persons as completely answers all the useful and necessary purposes. Besides a few acres of arable land, which we saw under cultivation near the mission, was a small spot of garden ground, producing several sorts of vegetables in great perfection and abundance. The extent of it, however, like the garden at St. Francisco, appeared unequal to the consumption of the European residents. The priests and their guard consisting of a corporal and six soldiers. Here were planted peaches, apricots, apples, pears, figs and vines, all of which excepting the latter promised to succeed very well. The failure of the vines here, as well as at St. Francisco, is ascribed to a want of knowledge in their culture, the soil and climate being well adapted to most sorts of fruit. Of this we had many evidences in the excellence of its natural unassisted productions, in this country, the oak, as timber, appears to take the lead. A tree of this description near the establishment measured 15 feet in girt and was high in proportion, but was not considered by the fathers as of extraordinary seas. And I am convinced that on our journey, we passed several oaks of greater magnitude. The timber of these trees is reputed to be equal in quality to any produced in Europe. The elm, ash, beech, birch, and some variety of pines grew in the interior and more elevated parts of the country in the greatest luxuriance and abundance. Our attention was next called to the village of the Indians near the mission. The habitations were not so regularly disposed, nor did it contain so many as the village at St. Francisco. Yet the same horrid state of uncleanliness and laziness seemed to pervade the whole a sentiment of companion involuntarily obtruded on the mind in contemplating the natural or habitual apathy to all kind of exertion in this humble race. There was scarcely any sign in their general deportment of their being at all benefited or of having added one single ray of comfort to their own wretched condition by the precepts and laborious exertions of their religious instructors whose lives are sacrificed to their welfare and seem entirely devoted to the benevolent office of rendering them a better and a happier people. They appeared totally insensible to the benefits with which they were provided, excepting in the article of food. This they now find ready at hand, without the labor of procuring it or being first reduced by cold and hunger nearly to a state of famine, and then being obliged to expose themselves to great inconvenience in quest of a precarious and often scanty means of subsistence. Not only grain, but the domestic animals have been introduced with success amongst them. Many of the natives have, by the unremitted labor of the fathers, been taught to manufacture very useful and comfortable garments from the wool of their sheep. 
for the introduction of this animal, they ought to be highly grateful, since by the mildness of the climate and the fertility of the soil, they are easily propagated and reared. And whilst they provide them with comfortable clothing, afford them also nourishing and delicate food. These advantages, however, seem to have operated as yet to little purpose on the minds of these untaught children of nature who appeared to be a compound of stupidity and innocence. Their passions are calm, and regardless of reputation as men or renown as a people, they are stimulated neither to the obtaining of consequence amongst themselves by any peaceful arts, nor superiority over their neighbors by warlike achievements so common amongst the generality of the Indian tribes. All the operations and functions, both of body and mind, appeared to be carried on with a mechanical, lifeless, careless indifference. And as the Spaniards assert they found them in the same state of inactivity and ignorance on their earliest visits, this disposition is probably inherited from their forefathers. Further efforts are now making at this mission to break through the gloomy cloud of insensibility in which at present these people are enveloped by giving them new habitations an indulgence that will most probably be followed by others as their minds appear capable of receiving them. A certain number of the most intelligent, tractable and industrious persons were selected from the group and were employed in a pleasant and well-adapted spot of land facing the mission under the direction and instruction of the fathers in building for themselves a range of small but comparatively speaking comfortable and convenient habitations. The walls, though not so thick, are constructed in the same manner with those described in the square at St. Francisco, and the houses are formed after the European fashion, each consisting of two commodious rooms below, with garrets over them. At the back of each house a space of ground is enclosed, sufficient for cultivating a large quantity of vegetables, for rearing poultry, and for other useful and domestic purposes. The buildings were in a state of forwardness, and when finished, each house was designed to accommodate one distinct family only. And it is greatly to be wished, for the credit of the rational part of the creation, that this supine race of our fellow creatures may not long remain insensible to, and unconvinced of, the superior advantages they may derive, or the new comforts they may possess, by this alteration in their mode of living. It is by no means improbable that by this circumstance alone they may be roused from their natural lethargic indifference and be induced to keep themselves clean and to exert themselves in obtaining other blessings consequent on civilized society. This once effected, the laborious task of their worthy and charitable benefactors will wear the appearance of being accomplished. And should it be hereafter attended with a grateful sense of the obligations conferred, it is not possible to conceive how much these excellent men will feel rewarded in having been the cause of meliorating the comfortless condition of these wretched, humble creatures. Our conversation admitted of no pause with these seemingly happy and benevolent priests. Whilst we acquired much information, we were highly entertained, and the day was far advanced by the time our curiosity was thus far gratified. In compliment to our visit, the fathers ordered a feast for the Indians of the village. The principal part of the entertainment was beef, furnished from a certain number of black cattle, which were presented on the occasion to the villagers. These animals propagate very fast, and being suffered to live in large herds on the fertile plains of Santa Clara, in a sort of wild state, some skill and adroitness is required to take them. This office, was at first intended to have been performed by the natives, but it was overruled by Senor Parias, an ensign in the Spanish army, who, with one of the priests of Senor Cuadra's vessel, had joined our party from a mission at some little distance called Santa Cruz. This gentleman conceived the business of taking the cattle would be better performed by the soldiers, who are occasionally cavalry and are undoubtedly very good horsemen. We mounted and accompanied them to the field to be spectators of their exploits. Each of the soldiers was provided with a strong line made of horse hair or of thongs of leather or rather hide with a long running noose. This is thrown with great dexterity whilst at full speed and nearly with a certainty over the horns of the animal by two men, 
one on each side of the ox, at the same instant of time, and having a strong high peaked pummel to their saddles, each takes a turn round it with the end of the line, and by that means the animal is kept completely at bay, and effectually prevented from doing either the men or horses any injury, which they would be very liable to, from the wildness and ferocity of the cattle. In this situation, the beast is led to the place of slaughter, where a third person, with equal dexterity, whilst the animal is kicking and plunging between the horses, entangles its hind legs by a rope and throws it down, on which its throat is immediately cut. Twenty-two bullocks, each weighing from four to six hundred weight, were killed on this occasion. Eighteen were given to the inhabitants of the village, and the rest were appropriated to the use of the soldiers, and the mission, in addition to their regular weekly allowance of twenty-four oxen, which are killed for their service every Saturday. Hence it is evident, as the whole of their stock has sprung from fifteen head of breeding cattle, which were distributed between this and two other missions, established about the year 1778, that these animals must be very prolific to allow of such an abundant supply. Their great increase in so short a time is to be ascribed to the rigid economy of the fathers, who would not allow any to be killed until they had so multiplied as to render their extirpation not easy to be effected. The same wife management has been observed with their sheep and their horses have increased nearly at the same rate. Although this village did not appear so populous as that at St. Francisco, I was given to understand that there were nearly double the number of inhabitants belonging to it and that in consequence of the many unconverted natives in the neighborhood of Santa Clara, several of the Christian Indians of good character were dispersed amongst their countrymen for the purpose of inducing them to partake of the advantages held out to them, in which they had not been altogether unsuccessful. All who have offered themselves as converts have been admitted and adopted, notwithstanding the artifices of several who have remained in and about the mission until they have acquired a stock of food and clothing with which they have decamped. This improper conduct has, however, had no sort of effect on the benevolent minds of the fathers, who have not only uniformly supplied their wants on a second visit, but also those of many wandering tribes that would be at the trouble of asking their assistance. Thursday, 22nd. Thus concluded our morning's entertainment and we retired to dinner. In the convent a most excellent and abundant repast of the productions of the country was provided, which were in the greatest perfection. The day passed to the mutual satisfaction of all parties, and we found ourselves under some difficulty the next morning to excuse ourselves from accepting the pressing solicitations of these good people to prolong our stay at Santa Clara this, however, necessity and not inclination obliged us to decline. We took our leave at an early hour, highly gratified by our reception and entertainment, which had amply compensated for the fatigue or inconvenience attending so long a journey, performed in a way to which we were so little accustomed. The mission of Staclara is situated at the extremity of the SE branch of Port St. Francisco, which terminates in a shallow rivulet extending some distance into the country from whence and the confines of the port in its vicinity Staclara is well supplied with a variety of excellent fish to the eastward at the distance of about five leagues near the sea coast or rather on the borders of the bay of monterey is the mission of Stacruz, very recently established and like those before described governed by three fathers of the order of saint francisco and protected by a corporal and six soldiers. As this establishment was in its infancy, I much wished to have seen it, but as my leisure would not admit of extending our excursion, we lost no time in proceeding to the ships. Our road back was over a more elevated country than that of the morass, leading through a continuation of the forest of oaks, but greatly inconvenienced by the many holes in the ground before noticed and our good friend and guide, the sergeant, apprehending that the approach of night might make us liable to accident, 
was induced to conduct us through a lower country, which he did not suspect to be so wet and unpleasant as we afterwards found it. We were, however, very fortunate in point of weather, which during our three days' excursion was very mild, serene and pleasant, and on our arrival at the ship in the evening, I had the pleasure to find the Chatham near us at anchor. Friday, 23rd. From Mr. Broughton, I had the additional happiness of understanding that all were well on board, and that during the time of our separation, he had been employed in prosecuting the examination of the River Columbia, which was found to extend further than we had supposed. The particulars of this survey, together with those of Mr. Whidbey's examination, whom we expected to meet at Monterey, and such information respecting a cluster of islands seen by the late Lieutenant Hergest as could be gained from his logbook and papers, I shall postpone for future consideration and recital. The arrival of the Chatham in some measure hastened our departure. Having by a very tedious process completed our stock of water and taken on board a small quantity of firewood, everything was received from the shore and the vessels unmoored the next morning in order to put to sea. But the wind and tide proving unfavorable, we remained at anchor during the day. I therefore employed this interval in noticing the following circumstances, which occurred after our return from Santa Clara. The average price of the large cattle at this port on my arrival, I understood to be six Spanish dollars each, the sheep in proportion. Having received as many of these as were wanted for the use of both vessels, with some vegetables, poultry, etc. I presented Senor Sal with the amount of their value, as our supply had been principally procured from him. Much to my surprise, he declined accepting the money in payment, and at length acquainted me that he had been strictly enjoined by Senor Quadra, on no pretense whatever, to accept any pecuniary recompense from me, as everything of that nature would be settled by himself on our meeting at Monterey. These injunctions from Senor Quadra removed my difficulties, as I should have known how to have requited such generosity or to have accepted such obligations from persons who, in every respect excepting that of food, had the appearance of poverty and of being much pressed for the most common conveniences of life. My late excursion into the country had convinced me that although its productions, in its present state, afforded the inhabitants an abundant supply of every essential requisite for human subsistence, yet the people were nearly destitute of those articles which alone can render the essentials of life capable of being relished or enjoyed. On this occasion, I experienced no small gratification in being able to relieve their wants by the distribution of a few necessary articles and implements, culinary and table utensils, some bar iron, with a few ornaments for the decoration of their churches, to which I added one hogshead of wine and another of rum, and consigned the whole to the care of Senor Sal, with a request that an equal distribution should be made between the Presidio and the missions of St. Francisco and Santa Clara. This was punctually attended to, and I had the satisfaction of finding the several articles were received as very acceptable presents. The inclemency of the weather and the short stay I purposed to make on our arrival in this port prevented my erecting the observatory on shore. Sufficient observations were, however, procured for ascertaining its latitude to be 37 degrees 48 degrees 30 and its longitude 237 degrees 52 degrees 30. The variation of the compass by six sets of azimuths varying from 12 degrees 2 to 13 degrees 32 degrees gave the mean of 12 and 48 hits eastwardly. Sunday, 25. The morning of the 25th brought a fresh breeze against us from the NW. But being prepared to depart, and having a strong ebb tide in our favor, we turned out of the port against a very disagreeable irregular sea produced by the opposing elements. After entering the channel leading out, soundings could not be gained with the hand line until we were about two miles to the southwestward of the SE point of entrance when we suddenly arrived in ten, seven and six fathoms water. In this situation we were about two miles to the south of our former track 
when going into the port, where in five fathoms water, the same disagreeable agitation of the sea was experienced. Hence I concluded that it was occasioned by a bank or bar at the distance of near four miles from the port, extending right across its entrance. This bar we soon passed over and again lost soundings with the hand line. At noon, our observed latitude was 36 degrees 53 years. The outer points of the entrance into the port of St. Francisco bore by compass N, 10 E and N, 28 E and the extremes of the coast in sight from NW to S 28 E along which our course was directed southerly at a little distance from the shore towards Monterey. Thus we quitted St. Francisco, highly indebted to our hospitable reception and the excellent refreshments, which in a few clays had entirely eradicated every apparent symptom of the scurvy. My engagements in the country on my first arrival and my haste to depart from St. Francisco on the arrival of the Chatham prevented me from obtaining any precise information respecting the port. Everything, however, that we were able to notice tended to confirm the original opinion that it was as fine a port as the world affords, sailing only in the convenience of obtaining wood and water. It is, however, probable that, on due examination, these essential articles might be obtained with less difficulty than we experienced. So far as we became acquainted with its soundings, they appeared regular and good. The bottom excellent holding ground and though we passed over some that was hard in going from our first anchorage to the other it was not in a situation where vessels are likely to remain stationary nor do i consider the bank or bar without as any detriment to the port though an unpleasant sensation is frequently occasioned in passing over it i have however been given to understand that the port is not much in repute with the maritime spaniards on account of the strength of its tides this disapprobation is easily accounted for when the manner of securing their vessels is considered. This is done invariably by mooring them head and stern with many anchors and cables, never less than four and seldom less than six. A very injudicious method when under the influence of rapid and irregular tides. The tides, however, at St. Francisco, to persons unaccustomed to navigate in tidesways, may be an objection but to those who know how to benefit by their stream, they are amongst its greatest advantages, since the prevailing winds are from the westward, frequently continue many days together and blow directly into the port, which would render its egress difficult at those times without the assistance of the ebb tide, which in the stream of the port takes, I believe, a regular course with the flood, nearly six hours each way, and is high water about 11 h 24s after the moon passes the meridian. Though in the place where we anchored, and particularly at the last, the tides were very irregular, nor could we form any true judgment of their rise and fall, which appeared to be very inconsiderable. Our first place of anchorage possesses many advantages, superior to those we found at the second. The tides are there infinitely the most regular, and notwithstanding the bank of mud prevented our landing in some places, it does not extend all round the cove. For its southwestern part is a steep shore and might easily be made commodious for obtaining fuel and water. The latter is very good and there is an abundance of the former immediately in its vicinity. The anchorage is more secure by being completely landlocked and further removed from the ocean. Independently of these places of safety, there is every reason to conclude that the northern parts of this extensive port would afford many situations preferable to either. With a fresh gale from the NW, we made great progress to the southward along the seacoast. Having the range of mountains which were to the right of us in our journey to Santa Clara, now on our left hand, and presenting us a very different aspect, their western side, exposed to all the violence and changes of an oceanic climate, was nearly destitute of wood or verdure. Some groveling shrubs were scattered in the valleys, and some dwarf solitary trees were seen on the sides of the mountains, which had in general a very naked and barren appearance. Wishing to delineate the coast, which we found to extend nearly S14 E, from the entrance of St. Francisco, we plied during the night, 
and the next morning showed our situation to be off the entrance of the Bay of Monterey, where we were becalmed until noon, when a pleasant breeze from the westward allowed us to steer for the center or bottom of the bay, whose shores were chiefly composed of low compact land. But in this point of view, the more southern and western parts of them seemed to be very much elevated and bore the appearance of being insular. As we steered along, I was in constant expectation of finding a proper place of anchorage, which was not discovered until four in the afternoon by making the signal I had settled with Senor Quadra, which was immediately answered from the Presidio. Our anchorage was directed to be nearly under the high land before mentioned on the southern side of the bay. About seven in the evening, Mr. Whidbey came on board from the Daedalus, which vessel had arrived all well on the 22nd, after having completed the service on which she had been employed. Soon after, we were met by some Spanish boats sent by Senor Quadra to our assistance. And in about an hour, we were safely moored with our anchors to the NW and SE, the latter lying in nine fathoms water, good holding ground. Our distance from the nearest or SW shore about a quarter of a mile, the points of the bay bore by compass N, 45W and N, 52W. The former point, Ano Nuevo, distant seven or eight leagues. The latter, called Point Pinos, was about a mile off. On our arrival, we found here at anchor, besides the Daedalus, the following vessels belonging to the Crown of Spain. The Brig Active, on board of which was Senor Quadra's broad pendant, the Aransasu, and a schooner. Voyage to the North Pacific Ocean and Round the World by Captain George Vancouver. Book the Third, Chapter Two. Having arrived in the famous port of Monterey, so distinguished by the Spaniards, I waited on Senor Quadra, who had taken up his residence at the governor's house in the Presidio. After the usual compliments had passed, and I had received repeated assurances of friendship and hospitality, I returned on board and at sunrise the next morning, the Presidio was saluted with 13 guns, which being equally returned, the topsails were hoisted, and Senor Quadra's broad pendant saluted with the same number. After receiving the return of this compliment, Senor Quadra, accompanied by the acting governor, Senor Arguello, with Senor Cayamano and several Spanish officers, returned my visit, all of whom were received on board the Discovery and Chatham, with such marks of respect and ceremony as were due to their rank and situation. When these formalities were over, I accompanied Senor Quadra on shore to partake the entertainment of his hospitable table. In the course of conversation, Senor Quadra informed me that on his arrival in this port from Nutka, he found orders directing him to capture all vessels he should find engaged in commercial pursuits on this coast, from these presidios northward to the extent where the general traffic is carried on excepting the vessels belonging to the people of Great Britain, who were to proceed without the least interruption or molestation. These orders from the court of Spain induced us both to believe that our respective sovereigns had adjusted and finally concluded every arrangement with respect to the territories at Nootka. This information appeared to me of a very important nature and in the event of my being able to procure a passage to England for an officer through New Spain would induce me to relinquish the design I had meditated of sending the Chatham home this season for the purpose of conveying such intelligence as I had now the power of communicating. Although I might have been materially incommoded by the absence of our little consort in the further prosecution of my voyage, yet the informing of government how far I had been able at this time to carry His Majesty's commands into execution appeared to me so absolutely indispensable that I had determined to submit to any inconvenience rather than omit so essential a part of my duty, especially as in addition to our own exertions during the preceding summer, I had obtained the possession of all the charts of the Spanish discoveries to the northward of our own researches. These surveys, together with an account of our transactions at Nootka and other information I had acquired respecting these countries, 
I considered of a nature too important to withhold, as it was only by such a communication that any just or reasonable conclusion could be drawn, either in respect of the national advantages which were likely to result from a further prosecution of commercial pursuits in these regions or of the most proper situations for the purpose of forming permanent establishments on the coast to protect and facilitate the trade if carried further into execution. This intelligence on which the accomplishment of one of the principal objects of our voyage might depend, together with my other dispatches, I propose to entrust to the care of Lieutenant Broughton, the commander of the Chatham, who had been privy to the whole of my transactions with Senor Quadra at Nootka, and whose abilities and observations would enable him, on his arrival in England, to satisfy the Board of Admiralty on many points of inquiry for which it was impossible I could provide in my dispatches. On this occasion I requested of Senor Quadra if it were compatible with his inclination and the disposition of the Spanish court that Mr. Broughton should be permitted to take his passage by the way of New Spain to England. To this Senor Quadra, without the least hesitation and in the most friendly manner replied, that Mr. Broughton might accompany him to St. Blas, where he would supply him with money and every other requisite in his power, which could contribute to render his laborious journey across the continent of America as pleasant as could be expected from the nature of the undertaking. At so obliging and generous an offer, I testified every sentiment I was capable of expressing and used my utmost endeavours that no time should be lost in preparing for Mr. Broughton's departure, since on that depended not only the sailing of ourselves, but the departure of Senor Quadra and the vessels under his orders. After having obtained permission, the observatories and tents were sent on shore, and on Wednesday I began to make the observations which were necessarily required. The decks of the Discovery in consequence of the late inclement weather, were found to be excessively leaky and to require caulking. Many of the sails wanted material repair. These, with various other services, were put in a train of execution. On board, the Chatham all were busily employed, particularly in recruiting their stock of provisions, as, in consequence of my former intention, no more had been received on board than would be absolutely necessary for her passage home. It now, however, became requisite that both vessels should receive from the Daedalus as large a proportion of stores, provisions, etc., as each was capable of stowing. Having given proper directions for carrying these several services into effect, on Sunday the 2nd of December, in consequence of a very polite invitation, I paid my respects to the mission of St. Carlos, accompanied by Senor Quadra, Senor Arguella, Senor Carmano, Mr. Broughton, and several other English and Spanish officers. This establishment is situated about a league to the southeastward of the Presidio of Monterey. The road between them lies over some steep hills and hollow valleys, interspersed with many trees. The surface was covered over with an agreeable verdure. The general character of the country was lively, and our journey altogether was very pleasant. Our reception at the mission could not sail to convince us of the joy and satisfaction we communicated to the worthy and reverend fathers, who in return made the most hospitable offers of every refreshment their homely abode afforded. On our arrival at the entrance of the mission, the bells were rung, and the reverend Fermin Francisco de la Suen, father president of the missionaries of the order of Saint Francisco in New Albion, together with the fathers of this mission, came out to meet us and conduct us to the principal residence of the Father President. This personage was about 72 years of age, whole gentle manners, united to a most venerable and placid countenance, indicated that tranquilized state of mind that fitted him in an eminent degree for presiding over so benevolent an institution. The usual ceremonies on introduction being over, our time was pleasantly engaged in the society of the Father President and his two companions, the priests regularly belonging to the mission of St. Carlos, who attended us over their premises. These seemed to differ but little from those at St. Francisco or Santa Clara, 
accepting that the buildings were smaller, the plan, architecture and materials exactly corresponding. In their granaries were deposited a pretty large quantity of the different kinds of grain before noticed at the other establishments, to which was added some barley, but the whole was of an inferior quality, and the return from the soil by no means equal to that produced at Santa Clara. Here also was a small garden on the same confined scale, and cultivated in the same manner as observed at the other stations. An Indian village is also in the neighborhood. It appeared to us but small, yet the number of its inhabitants under the immediate direction of this mission was said to amount to 800, governed by the same charitable principles as those we had before visited. Notwithstanding these people are taught and employed from time to time in many of the occupations most useful to civil society, they had not made themselves any more comfortable habitations than those of their forefathers, nor did they seem in any respect to have benefited by the instruction they had received. Some of them were at this time engaged under the direction of the fathers in building a church with stone and mortar. The former material appeared to be of a very tender, friable nature, scarcely more hard than indurated clay. But I was told that on its being exposed to the air, it soon becomes hardened and is an excellent stone for the purpose of building. It is of a light straw color and presents a rich and elegant appearance in proportion to the labor that is bestowed upon it. It is found in abundance at no great depth from the surface of the earth. The quarries are easily worked, and it is, I believe, the only stone the Spaniards have hitherto made use of in building. At Santa Clara, I was shown a ponderous black stone that Father Thomas said was intended to be so appropriated as soon as persons capable of working it could be procured. The lime they use is made from seashells, principally from the ear shell, which is of a large size and in great numbers on the shores not having as yet found any calcareous earth that would answer this essential purpose. The heavy black store is supposed to be applicable to grinding, and should it be found so to answer, it will be a matter of great importance to their comfort, since their only method of reducing their corn to flour is by two small stones placed in an inclined position on the ground. On the lower one, the corn is laid and ground by hand by rubbing the other stone nearly of the same surface over it. The flour produced by this rude and laborious process makes very white and well-tasted, though heavy bread. But this defect is said by the Spaniards to be greatly remedied when mixed with an equal proportion of flour properly ground. After we had satisfied our curiosity in these particulars, we rode round the neighborhood of the mission. It was pleasantly situated, and the country, agreeably broken by hills and valleys, had a verdant appearance and was adorned like that in the vicinity of Monterey, with many clumps and single trees, mostly of the pine tribe, holly-leaved oak, and willows, with a few trees of the poplar and maple, and some variety of shrubs. That rather incommoded our traveling, which was chiefly confined to one of the valleys, and within sight of the buildings. Through this valley, a small brook of water about knee-deep, called by the Spaniards Rio Carmelo, takes its course, passes the buildings of the mission, and immediately empties itself into the sea. In this valley, near the sides of the Carmelo, a few acres of land exhibited a tolerably good plant of wheat. But as the soil here, as well as at Monterey, is of a light sandy nature, its productions are consequently inferior to the other two missions I had visited. Yet I was given to understand that the interior country here like that at St. Francisco, improves in point of fertility as it retires from the ocean. On our return to the convent, we found a most excellent repast served with great neatness in a pleasant bower constructed for that purpose in the garden of the mission. After dinner, we were entertained with the methods practiced by the Indians in tacking deer and other animals by irritating them. They equip themselves in a dress consisting of the head and hide of the creature they mean to take. With this, when properly put on and adjusted, they resort to the place where the game is expected 
and they walk about on their hands and feet, counterfeiting all the actions of the animal they are in quest of. These they perform remarkably well, particularly in the watchfulness and the manner in which deer feeds. By these means they can, nearly to a certainty, get within two or three yards of the deer when they take an opportunity of its attention being directed to some other object and discharge their arrows from their secreted bow, which is done in a very stooping attitude, and the first or second seldom fails to be fatal. The whole was so extremely well contrived and executed that I am convinced a stranger would not easily have discovered the deception. In the evening, I returned on board and was the next day honored with the company of most of the party to dinner, including Signora Arguello, the governor's wife, and some other ladies of the Presidio. But the motion of the ship, though very inconsiderable, greatly to my disappointment obliged the ladies, and indeed some of the gentlemen, very soon to retire. The various employments which constantly engaged my time when on board, joined to my attendance on the observatory on shore, left me but little leisure to indulge either in exercise or social entertainment. Nor was it without much difficulty that I now and then snatched a few hours of relaxation to partake of the society of our attentive and hospitable friends. It was not until the ninth that my arrangements permitted me to make another short excursion with Senor Quadra and our numerous friends to dine at the garden of the Presidio. This spot might contain about four acres of land situated in a valley about a league to the eastward of the Presidio. Its soil, like the generality in this neighborhood, when compared with that of Santa Clara, could be considered only as indifferently good. It is, however, greatly benefited by a fine stream of water that runs close past it and enables the gardener to keep it properly moist in dry weather and in the rainy season of December, January and February prevents its being floated. With these advantages, it generally produces a great abundance of the several kitchen vegetables with some fruit. But in consequence of the many vessels that have been employed on the coast of Northwest America this season, resorting hither for refreshments, both on their passage from and on their return to St. Blas, the productions of this and the only other garden at St. Carlos were nearly exhausted, where a little labor, however, bestowed on the cultivation of an additional space for this essential purpose a scarcity would not be likely to happen, as the soil seems well adapted to horticulture and the climate produces a perpetual spring. Of this we had manifest proof by seeing peas, beans, lettuces, cabbages, and various other esculent plants, some springing from the ground and some in perfection, whilst others had produced their feed or were fallen to decay. This garden, though situated at a pleasant distance for an excursion, was not provided with any fixed accommodation for visitors. The only places of shelter near it, for they could scarcely be called houses, were a few miserable mud huts, the residence of the gardener, and a few soldiers who are stationed there for its protection. This deficiency afforded to Senor Paris a second opportunity of exercising his genius in the construction of another temporary bower for our reception similar to that which he had erected in the garden of the mission at St. Carlos. In both, he had succeeded much to the approbation of all his friends, who had greatly profited by his kind solicitude for their comfort and happiness. Few objects or circumstances occurred in the course of this excursion worthy of notice. The surrounding country consisted chiefly of a sandy heath, overgrown with a naturally impassable thicket of shrubs about four or five feet high, which afforded an excellent cover for deer, foxes, hares, rabbits, quails, etc., some of which we saw in passing along the roads cut through it. The late inconvenience experienced by some of my visitors in consequence of the ship's motion became a subject of our conversation, and as this was impossible to be provided against, I solicited the honor of my Spanish friend's company at our encampment on shore. This, accordingly, took place the following day, when I was gratified with the presence of most of the ladies, as well as the gentlemen, at dinner. A display of fireworks was exhibited in the evening. These, still remaining in excellent preservation, afforded a very high degree of satisfaction, not only to our visitors, but their dependents of every description. 
the whole of whom in the neighborhood, with a great number of Indians, were assembled on this occasion, and most probably partook of an entertainment to which most of them were before entire strangers. The evening was concluded by a dance and supper, which was not ended until a late hour. The Daedalus, having delivered such provisions and stores as could be taken on board the Discovery, and Chatham, on Wednesday her hold was restowed, and our carpenters were employed in fitting up commodious stalls on board of her for the reception of live cattle. Senor Quadra, having with his accustomed politeness and liberality, offered me any number of those animals, with such other productions of the country, as I might judge to be necessary for the service of His Majesty's infant colony in New South Wales. Twelve cows with six bulls and the like number of ewes and rams were received on board the Daedalus on the 24th, but the ship was detained until a sufficient quantity of provender for their maintenance could be procured. The country, at this season affording but a scanty supply, furnished employment for almost all our people in cutting it wherever it could be found. Water also was not very easily obtained, since it could only be had in small quantities at a time from a number of shallow wells dug by ourselves. It was, however, extremely good and might have been procured in any quantity with little labor by thinking wells of a proper construction to a moderate depth. Notwithstanding this, the Spaniards are content to take on board for their common use at sea water of a very inferior quality because it is procured without any trouble. That which is drunk at the table of the officers is however very fine water and is brought in carts from the river Carmelo. But to return, these several employments prevented the sailing of the Daedalus until the 29th, when she departed with the cattle in very high condition. On this occasion, Lieutenant James Hansen received from me his orders to proceed to New South Wales, to call at her guest's islands in his way thither for a supply of water and food for the cattle and any refreshments for the crew that could be procured, passing thence to the north of all the low islands to proceed to Otaheite, from Otaheite to New Zealand, and from thence to Port Jackson, where I was particularly anxious the Dedalus should arrive as soon as possible, because the cattle, sheep, etc., in the event of their being preserved, could not sail to be a very valuable acquisition to that country. Beside these, it was by no means improbable that Mr. Hansen might be enabled to procure a considerable number of hogs and fowls at the several islands he might touch at. These I also conceived would be highly acceptable at Port Jackson, and he had my directions to use his discretion in thus appropriating such articles of traffic consigned to me, as yet remained on board the Daedalus. His visit to Otaheite had another object beside that of procuring refreshments, which was to receive on board 21 English seamen who had been east away in the ship Matilda of London on the 25th of February, 1792, on a ledge of rocks, not within sight of any land, and said to be situated in latitude 26 Sing South and longitude 138 died on 30 West. After this unfortunate accident, the crew returned in their boats to Otaheite, from whence, six days before, they had departed in the ship. From Otaheite, the second mate and two of the sailors had, in one of their open whale boats, proceeded towards New South Wales. The rest of the crew remained on the island, excepting Mr. Matthew Weatherhead, the commander of the vessel, who, with two men and two boys, had taken their passage from Otaheite on board the Jenny of Bristol, and on their arrival at Nootka, Senor Quadra not only provided Mr. Weatherhead with a passage towards England through New Spain, but benevolently furnished him with a sum of money to defray his expenses through a country where the inhabitants would necessarily be strangers to himself and all his connections. The misfortune of this shipwreck appeared to have been attended with very unpleasant consequences to our friends at Otaheite. The few valuable articles which these unfortunate people had been able to save from the wreck instead of having been secured and properly taken care of, had been indiscriminately dispersed or left to the disposal of the natives. This had produced a jealousy between the chiefs of Matavai 
and those of Opare. And on their disagreement concerning the division of the spoil, some of the Englishmen had sided with the chiefs of the one party, whilst others had taken up the cause of the other. A war was the necessary consequence between the two districts, which had terminated very disastrously for Matavai. Nearly the whole of that beautiful district had been laid waste, their houses burnt down, and their fruit trees torn up by the roots, and other ways destroyed. This was the sum of what I was able to learn, but the very confused and incoherent detail that was given me of all these transactions prevented my acquiring any satisfactory information on this melancholy event. Having now positively determined on the mode to be pursued in the execution of the remaining objects of our voyage, I requested Commodore Phillips Wood at Port Jackson complete the cargo of the Daedalus to a year's provisions of all species, and such stores as I judged would be necessary for the discovery in Chatham and to forward them by this vessel to me at Nootka, where her commander should find sufficient instructions for the regulation of his conduct, should he arrive there in my absence. I communicated to Commodore Phillips the few discoveries we had made in the South Pacific Ocean, and transmitted him a copy of my survey of that part of the southwest coast of New Holland, which we had visited. We had, by this time, procured such observations as were necessary for determining the situation of this place, as likewise for ascertaining the rate of the chronometers and for correcting my survey of the coast of New Albion, southward, from Cape Mendocino to this bay. These several matters, owing to the very unfavorable passage we had had from Nootka, not being yet entirely completed, produced a longer delay at Monterey than I could have wished not only because I was anxious that our time should be other ways employed, but also that Senor Quadra's departure should not be postponed on our account. I was, however, in some degree reconciled to his detention by the repeated friendly assurances he gave me that his time was mine, earnestly requesting that I would not hesitate so to employ it as to make my dispatches as complete as I might on the present occasion deem it expedient. Every hour was therefore dedicated to this purpose, which necessarily precluded me from making more than a few cursory remarks on Monterey. These, with the astronomical and nautical observations that were made on shore at the observatory, will conclude this chapter. This famous bay is situated between Point Pinos and Point Anonuevo, lying from each other N72W and S27E, 22 miles apart. Between these points, this spacious but very open bay is formed by the coast falling back from the line of the two points, nearly four leagues. The only part of it that is at all eligible for anchoring is near its south extremity, about a league southeastward from Point Pinos, where the shores form a fort of cove that affords clear good riding with tolerable shelter for a few vessels. These, for their necessary protection from the sea, must lie at no very great distance from the southwest shore, where, either at night or in the morning, the prevailing wind from the land admits the sailing of vessels out of the bay, which other ways would be a tedious tack, by the opposition of the winds along the coast, which generally blow between the NW and NNW. To these points of the compass this anchorage is wholly exposed, but as the oceanic swell is broken by the land of Point Pinos, and as these winds, which prevail only in the daytime, seldom blow stronger than a moderate gale, the anchorage is rendered tolerably safe and convenient, and notwithstanding these northwesterly winds are common throughout most part of the year, I have not heard of an instance of their being so violent as to affect the safety of vessels tolerably well found with anchors and cables. The soundings are regular from 30 to 4 fathoms. The bottom, a mixture of sand and mud, and the shores are sufficiently steep for all the purposes of navigation without shoals or other impediments. Near Point Ano Nuevo are some small rocks detached from the coast at a very little distance. The shores of Point Pinos are also rocky and have some detached rocks lying at a small distance from them, but which do not extend so far into the ocean as to be dangerous. 
the rocky shores of Point Pinos terminated just to the south of the Anchoring Place, where a fine sandy beach commences, which extends, I believe, all round the bay to Point Anonuevo. In a direction N42 E, at the distance of four leagues from Point Pinos, is what the Spaniards call Monterey River, which, like the River Carmelo, is no more than a very shallow brook of fresh water that empties itself into that part of the bay. Here, a small guard of Spanish soldiers are generally posted, who reside on the spot in miserably wretched huts. Near Point Ano Nuevo is another of these rivers, something less than the other, in whose neighborhood the mission of Santa Cruz is planted. Such are the rivulets to which the Spaniards in their representation of this country, as well by their writings as their charts, have given the appellation of rivers and delineated them as spacious and extensive. The anchorage already described is the only situation in the bay where vessels can ride with any degree of safety or convenience. In its neighborhood is the Spanish establishment. The Presidio is about three quarters of a mile to the southward of the spot where the sandy beach before mentioned commences. This is the landing place where they have erected a mod wretched kind of house, which they call a storehouse, serving for that purpose, and for the reception of a guard of soldiers generally posted there. The Presidio, like that of St. Francisco, is situated in an open clear plain, a little elevated above the level of the sea. The space between the Presidio and the landing place is very low swampy ground. The former does not appear to be much benefited by its vicinity to fresh water, since in the dry season it must be brought from a considerable distance, as the Spaniards had not been at the pains of thinking wells to ensure a permanent supply. There were many delightful situations in the immediate neighborhood of the Presidio, with great diversity in the ground to favor the taste of the ingenious, and a soil that would amply reward the labor of the industrious, in which our Spanish friend might with equal case have fat themselves down, more comfortable, more convenient, and I should conceive more salutary than their present residence appeared to be. The most important of all blessings, health, is here treated with great indifference, since not only the climate of Monterey, but the whole of the surrounding country has the reputation of being as healthy as any part of the known world. Other objects of a secondary nature such as the place of their abode, convenience or comfort, have no greater influence on their consideration, as the present Presidio is the identical one that was built on the first establishment of this port in the year 1770, without having undergone the least improvement or alteration since that period. The buildings of the Presidio form a parallelogram or long square, comprehending an area of about 300 yards long, by 250 yards wide, making one entire enclosure. The external wall is of the same magnitude and built with the same materials. And except that the officer's apartments are covered in with a sort of red tile made in the neighborhood, the whole presents the same lonely, uninteresting appearance as that already described at St. Francisco. Like that establishment, the several buildings for the use of the officers, soldiers, etc., and for the protection of stores and provisions are erected along the walls on the inside of the enclosure which admits of but one entrance for carriages or persons on horseback. This, as at St. Francisco, is on the feed of the square fronting the church, which was rebuilding with stone like that at St. Carlos. Besides the principal gateway, they have small doors that communicate with the country nearly in the middle of the side walls, to the right and left of the entrance. One of these, on the right hand, is through the apartments of the commanding officer. These are much more extensive than those at St. Francisco, as they consist of five or six spacious rooms with boarded floors, but under the same disadvantage of wanting glass or any substitute for it. The window places are open, and only on that side of the houses which looks into the area. As no apertures, I believe, are allowed to be made in the grand wall of the enclosure, excepting for the doors, which are those already mentioned, 
with one at each of the officers' houses contiguous to the governor's and one other on the opposite side. These are all the apertures in the wall, which when seen at a distance has the appearance of a place of confinement. At each corner of the square is a small kind of blockhouse, railed a little above the top of the wall, where swivels might be mounted for its protection. On the outside, before the entrance into the Presidio, which fronts the shores of the bay, are placed seven cannon, four nine, and three three-pounders, mounted. These, with those noticed at St. Francisco, one two-pounder at Santa Clara, and four nine-pounders dismounted, form the whole of their artillery. These guns are planted on the open plain ground, without any breastwork or other screen for those employed in working them, or the least cover or protection from the weather. Such, I was informed, was also the defenceless state of all the new settlements on the coast, not excepting San Diego, which from its situation should seem to be a post of no small importance. The four dismounted cannon, together with those placed at the entrance into the Presidio, are intended for a fort to be built on a small eminence that commands the anchorage. A large quantity of timber is at present in readiness for carrying that design into execution which, when completed, might certainly be capable of annoying vessels lying in that part of the bay, which affords the greatest security, but could not be of any importance after a landing was accomplished, as the hills behind it might be easily gained from whence the assailing party would soon oblige the fort to surrender, nor do I consider Monterey to be a very tenable post without an extensive line of works. The Presidio is the residence of the governor of the province, whose command extends from St. Francisco southward along the exterior shore to Cape St. Lucas, and on the eastern side of the peninsula of California, up that gulf to the Bay of St. Louis. The rank in the Spanish service required as a qualification to hold this extensive command is that of Lieutenant Colonel. Whether the governor interfered in the common garrison duty, I know not. A lieutenant and ensign, sergeants, corporals, etc., resided also in the Presidio. The establishment of which I understood was similar to all the rest in the province, but was then incomplete in consequence of the recent death of the late commandant. By this event, Lieutenant Arguello, properly the commander at St. Francisco, as being the senior officer, had taken upon him the government and had sent the Alcerez, or Ensign Senor Sal, to command at St. Francisco, which posts we understood they were severally to retain until another lieutenant colonel should be appointed to the government. By what I was able to learn, I did not consider the number of soldiers who composed the garrison as exceeding 100, including the non-commissioned officers. From this body, detachments are drawn for the protection of the neighboring missions. The remainder, with their wives and families, reside within the walls of the Presidio, without seeming to have the least desire for a more rural habitation where garden ground and many other comforts might easily be procured at no great distance from the feet of the establishment. This seemed to be composed entirely of military people. At least we did not see amongst them those of any other description. The few most necessary mechanical employments were carried on in an indifferent manner by some of the soldiers under permission of the commanding officer. I must now for the present quit the interesting subject of these establishments in which we unexpectedly not only found an asylum and pleasant retreat from the vicissitudes and labors of our voyage, but the gratification of social intercourse with a set of liberal-minded, generous people, each of whom endeavored to surpass the other in manifesting an interest for our welfare and expressing on every occasion the happiness they felt in relieving our wants or rendering us any kind of service. Their friendly and hospitable behavior daily proved the sincerity of their professions by making our residence whilst amongst them as comfortable and agreeable as their circumstances would permit. And With the most grateful recollection of the attentive civilities, disinterested kindnesses, and benevolent assistance received at the hands of entire strangers, I should very insufficiently requite their goodness or comply with the dictates of my heart were I to omit the opportunity which now presents itself of making this, though rude and unpolished, yet grateful record, 
of the weighty obligations I shall forever feel to have been conferred upon us on this occasion. The well-known generosity of my other Spanish friends will, I trust, pardon the warmth of expression with which I must ever advert to the conduct of Senor Quadra, who, regardless of the difference in opinion that had arisen between us in our diplomatic capacities at Nootka, had uniformly maintained towards us a character infinitely beyond the reach of my powers of encomium to describe. His benevolence was not confined to the common rights of hospitality, but was extended to all occasions, and was exercised in every instance, where His Majesty's service, combined with my commission, was in the least concerned. To Senor Quadra, we were greatly indebted for waiting our arrival at Monterey, for the friendly and hospitable reception we experienced, and afterwards for remaining there for the sole purpose of affording me an opportunity of transmitting through the medium of his kind offices my dispatches to England, when his time, no doubt, would have passed infinitely more to his satisfaction at the town of Tepic, the place of his residence in the vicinity of St. Blas. Such sacrifices did not, however, sill the measure of Senor Quadra's liberality, for on my requesting an account of the expenses incurred for the refreshments with which the three vessels under my command had been so amply supplied here and at St. Francisco, together with the charges attendant on the cattle, sheep, corn, etc., etc., put on board the Daedalus for His Majesty's infant, New South Wales, he not only revolted at the idea of receiving any ment, but gave street dares that no account whatever should be rendered. Nor would he accept of the most common voucher or other acknowledgement for the very liberal supply we had received of such essential importance, not only to our health and comfort at the time, but to our subsequent welfare. On my first arrival at Monterey, I had questioned Senor Quadra as to the supply of refreshments and the price of the different species we should require. To the first he allured me that everything the country afforded was at our service. And as to the last, he laid that could be easily settled on our departure. On this ground, I now strongly urged his compliance with his former promise, especially as the account between us was of a public nature, but all my remonstrances were to no effect. He insisted that he had fulfilled his promise since the only settlement in which he could possibly engage was that of seeing we were accommodated to the extent of our wishes with every supply the country could bestow, adding that repayment would most amply be made by the promised success attending every creature and production that we had either received for our own use or that were destined for other purposes. And as it was probable our respective courts would become acquainted with our several transactions, he should submit all further acknowledgement to their determination. The venerable and respectable Father President of the Franciscan Missionaries, with all the excellent and worthy members of that religious order, together with Senora Camano, Arguello, Sal, and the whole of the Spanish officers with whom we had the honor of being acquainted, demand from us the highest sentiments of esteem and gratitude. Even the common people were entitled to our good opinion and respect, as they uniformly subscribed to the exemplary conduct of their superiors by a behavior that was very orderly and obliging. To the reverence, esteem and regard that was shown Senor Quadra by all persons and on all occasions, I must attribute some portion of the respect and friendship we received and consider the general disposition in our favor to have acquired no little energy by the noble example of that distinguished character. Captain King, when speaking in his pleasing language of our benevolent friend Major Bem at Kamchatka, portrays with justice the character of Senor Quadra, whose general conduct seems to have been actuated by the same motives of benevolence and governed by principles of similar magnanimity. The parting from a society for which we had justly conceived a very sincere regard could not take place without sensations of much regret. My concern on this occasion was increased by my powers of administering to their comfort by a supply of the necessary utensils which they needed, being so much lighted. 
Such articles, however, as I could possibly spare, or make shift without, I consigned to their use. And having selected an assortment of the most necessary kind, I had the satisfaction to understand that they were highly valued and thankfully received. Longitudinal observations omitted. Thus conclude the transactions of the voyage, appertaining particularly to the discovery, to the end of the year 1792. The two following chapters will contain the services performed and the information acquired by the officers under my command during the time of our separation. Voyage to the North Pacific Ocean and Round the World by Captain George Vancouver. Book the Third, Chapter Three. Lieutenant Broughton's Account of Columbia River, 1792, December. On reference to the preceding part of this narrative, it will be found that on the 21st of October, we stood to sea at the commencement of a heavy gale of wind from off the entrance of Columbia River. Leaving the Chatham there at anchor, in full confidence that her commander, Mr. Broughton, would, prior to his departure, endeavour to gain all possible information respecting the navigable extent of that inlet and such other useful knowledge of the country as circumstances would admit of. The implicit reliance I had in Mr. Broughton's zeal and exertions will be found to have been worthily placed by the perusal of the following narrative of that officer's transactions. The situation the Chatham had gained in the entrance of Columbia River was by no means comfortable at low water when the depth did not exceed four fathoms and the sea broke very heavily about a cable's length within the vessel on a bank of 212 fathoms which obtained the name of Spit Bank. The place of their anchorage was, by observation, in latitude 46 to 18 bearing S50E, about a mile and a quarter, from the inner part of Cape Disappointment, from whence to the opposite shore. Across the channel leading to sea, the breakers formed nearly one connected chain, admitting only of one very narrow passage, which lies in a direction about W by N, from a point. Mr. Broughton called Village Point, there being in its vicinity a large deserted village. The discovery having put to sea without making any signal to the Chatham, Mr. Broughton very judiciously concluded that I was desirous he should explore and examine this opening on the coast. And in order that no time should be lost in carrying this service into execution, he proceeded at two in the afternoon with the first of the flood and a strong gale at SW up the inlet, keeping the village point, which lies S70E five miles distant from Cape Disappointment, well open with a remarkable projecting point, that obtained the name of Tongue Point on the southern shore, appearing like an island. The depth of water here was not less than four fathoms, and as they approached the deserted village, the depth increased to six, seven, and eight fathoms. The wind by this time obliged them to bring to, for the purpose of double reefing the topsails, and whilst thus engaged, the rapidity of the flood tide impelled them into three fathoms water before sufficient sail could be made on the vessel to render her governable. By this means she was driven on a bank of sand where the strength of the stream, preventing an anchor being carried into deep water, she remained aground until high tide when they hove into 10 fathoms with the greatest case and there rested for the night. Mr. Broughton had, for his guidance thus far up the inlet, a chart by Mr. Gray, who had commanded the American ship Columbia but it did not much resemble what it purported to represent. This shoal, which is an extensive one lying in mid-channel, having completely escaped his attention. The next day, being the 22nd of October, the wind blew strong from the eastward, and there was little probability from the appearance of the weather of soon being able, with any degree of safety, to remove the vessel further up the inlet. That intention being laid aside, Mr. Broughton proceeded with the cutter and launch to examine the shores of its southern side. He first landed at the deserted village on the northern shore and on the eastern side of Village Point, which he found a good leading mark for clearing the shoals that lie between it 
and Cape Disappointment, carrying regular soundings of four fathoms. From this point, he passed over to Point Adams, the starboard or SE point of entrance into this inlet, and in his way, crossed a shoal bank, supposed to be a continuation of that on which the Chatham had grounded. The least water found upon it was 212 fathoms, and the sea was observed to break at intervals in several places. Point Adams is a low, narrow, sandy spit of land projecting northerly into the ocean and lies from Cape Disappointment, S44E, about four miles distant. From this point, the coast takes a sudden turn to the south and the shores within the inlet take a direction, S, 74E, four miles to another point, which obtained the name of Point George. From Point Adams, the breakers stretched into the ocean, first N, 68W, about a league, then S83W, about four miles, from whence they took a rounding course to the southward, extending along the coast at the distance of two leagues and upwards. These form the south side of the channel leading into this inlet, which is about half a league wide. The northern side is also formed by the breakers extending 212 miles from Cape Disappointment. In this point of view, the breakers were so shut in with each other as to present one entire line of heavy broken water from side to side across the channel. At this place was found the remains of a deserted Indian village and near it three large canoes supported from the ground, each containing dead human bodies. These canoe coffins were decorated at the head and stern with rude carved work and from their decayed state seem to have been thus appropriated for a great length of time. Another sepulcher was discovered, bearing some affinity to our mode of burial. The body was rolled up in deer skins, after these with mats, and then laid at full length in a wooden box, which exactly fitted it. The flesh of the body was preserved quite firm. After the party had satisfied their curiosity, everything that had been displaced by their examination was restored to its original situation. The shoal on which the Chatham had grounded was found to extend within half a mile of the eastern side of Point Adams. The space between the shoal and the land formed a shallow channel over a kind of bar on which was found little more than three fathoms water into a bay that lies between Point Adams and Point George. Whither Mr. Broughton directed his course and found on each side of the bar the soundings regular from three to seven fathoms. The shores of this bay were low land and the water again shoaled as he advanced to three and two, one, two fathoms. Near the shores on Sither side, the sea broke very high and on the water were seen many pelicans. As the party approached the center, or rather the S-E corner of the ray, they discovered a small river whose entrance was about two cables length in width and the depth of water five fathoms, gradually diminishing to two fathoms. By the shores it appeared to be high water, yet the stream attended them up the river, which now took a southeasterly direction in a winding form and branched off into several creeks. After advancing about seven miles, the width decreased to 19 fathoms, and it being then high water, any further examination was deemed unnecessary. The evening at this time, having nearly closed in, the party returned about a mile and took up their residence for the night on the bank of the river, which, after Sir George Young of the Royal Navy, Mr. Broughton distinguished by the name of Young's River, whose termination was supposed to have been seen by some of the party, but Mr. Broughton was of opinion from the strength of the tide that its source was at some distance. The night was windy and it rained without ceasing until daylight the next morning, which was very pleasant and greatly enriched the prospect of the beautiful surrounding country. From the banks of the river, a low meadow, interspersed with scattered trees and shrubs, extended to the more elevated land. This was of easy ascent and was agreeably variegated with clumps and copies of pine, maple, alder, birch, poplar, and several other trees, besides a considerable number of shrubs, greatly diversifying the landscape by the several tints of their autumnal foliage. The marshy edges of the river 
afforded shelter to wild geese, which flew about in very large flocks. Ducks were in abundance, as were the large brown cranes, before noticed in the more northern parts of New Georgia. On leaving the river, as they proceeded to Point George, they found the greatest depth of water at about two-thirds flood neap tides was 212 fathoms. This continuing entirely across the entrance of Young's River renders it navigable for small vessels only. From hence the launch was lent on board with orders to found in a direct line to the Chatham, then at anchor off the deserted village. The continuation of the shoal in this passage was found to be a great obstacle to the navigation of the inlet. Mr. Broughton proceeded in the cutter at a moderate distance from the shore with soundings of three, four, five, six, and seven fathoms to Tongue Point. On the eastern side of this point, the shores first fall to the southward and then stretch nearly E, N, E. From this point was seen the center of a deep bay lying at the distance of seven miles, N, 26 E. This bay terminated the researches of Mr. Gray and to commemorate his discovery, it was named after him Gray's Bay. Mr. Broughton now returned on board in the hope of being able to proceed the next flood tide higher up the inlet. In the afternoon, he reached the Chatham, finding in his way thither a continuation of the same shoal on which he had grounded with a narrow channel on each side between it and the shores of the inlet. On this middle ground, the depth of water was in overfalls from three fathoms to four feet. Mr. Broughton got the Chatham immediately underway with a boat ahead to direct her course. His progress was greatly retarded by the shoalness of the water. A channel was found close to the northern shore where, about dark, he anchored for the night in seven fathoms waiter about two miles from the former place of Anchorage. Before day break the next morning, October 24th, the vessel intending to the teed, tailored on a bank. This, however, was of no consequence, as on heaving short, she was soon afloat again. At daylight, Mr. Manby was sent to found the channel up to Gray's Bay, where in Mr. Gray's sketch, an anchor is placed. But on Mr. Manby's return, he reported the channel to be very intricate and the depth of water in general very shallow. This induced Mr. Broughton to give up the idea of removing the Chatham further up the inlet the examination of which he determined to pursue in the boats. After ascertaining the vessel's station to be in latitude 46 to 17, longitude 236 to 17 12s, he departed with the cutter and launch with a week's provisions to carry his determination into effect. A strong easterly gale attended with squalls was against them, but the flood tide favored their progress until six in the evening when on the ebb making, they took up their abode for the night on the western side of Gray's Bay. They rowed across the bay the next morning in squally, unpleasant weather with regular soundings of four, five, six, seven, and eight fathoms. The depth of water within the bay was not more than two fathoms, interspersed near the bottom of the bay with frequent overfalls of four fathoms. After passing Gray's Bay, the continental shores became high and rocky, about a mile SW by W from the cast point of the bay, which lies from its west point N. 78 E, at the distance of four miles, commences a range of five small low sandy islets, partly covered with wood and extending about five miles to the eastward. The easternmost, which was also the largest, was nearly at the extremity of the shallow space they had thus examined. Between the ocean and that which should properly be considered the entrance of the river, is a space from three to seven miles wide, intricate to navigate on account of the shoals that extend nearly from side to side, and ought rather to be considered as a found than as constituting a part of the river. Since the entrance into the river, which they reached about dark, was found not to be more than half a mile wide, formed by the contracting shores of the found. Between the points of entrance, lying from each other N50E and S50W, there were seven fathoms water. The northernmost point is situated in latitude 46 degree 1812 e, longitude 236 dig 3412, 
from whence the river takes a direction about S45E. From the east point of Grays Bay to this station, the shore is nearly straight and compact and lies in a direction S, 87W. They stop to dine about three miles from the east point of the bay, on the side of a high steep hill, on the northern shore, facing one of the above low islets, from whence extended a long, sandy, shallow spit down the channel, inclining towards the opposite or southern shore, which was low and appeared also very shoal. From this steep hill, a remarkable pillar rock lies, S 79W, about a mile from the shore on the starboard or southern side of entrance into the river. Not only within, but without this rock, the water is very shallow, with overfalls from 212 to 6 fathoms. But by keeping the northern shore on board from Grays Bay, a sufficient depth of water will be found. The two points of entrance into the river are formed by low marshy land, the southernmost seem to be an island. And to the NW of the most northern, a branch took a northerly direction, which was named Orchards River. In one of these, the party passed a very uncomfortable night, owing to the dampness of their situation. At daylight the next morning, 26th October, with the first of the stood, Mr. Broughton proceeded up the river, whose width was nearly half a mile. The shores on either side were low and marshy. On the NE were from eight to ten fathoms, but on the opposite shore the depth of water did not exceed four fathoms, one third of the channel over. After advancing about two leagues, the land became high and rocky on both sides. Here, a well-wooded island, about a league and a half long, divided the stream and afforded a good passage on each side of it. The deepest is on the knee side, in which was found 10 and 12 fathoms water. About a league past the Essi point of this island, which received the name of Puget's Island, the river continued its direction to latitude 46 degrees 10 town, longitude 236 and 50s, where it took a short turn N, 56E for about a league. At this turn, a small river presented itself, which Mr. Broughton named Swain's River. In this neighborhood, they were joined by some of the natives in four canoes. Their clothing was chiefly deer skins, though a few had garments made of sea otter skins. These good people fold the party a few fish and then took their leave. Their language was so totally different from that of the other American Indians that not a single word could be understood. The shores abounded with fine timbers. The pine predominated in number on the higher lands, but near the banks of the river grew ash, poplar, elder, maple, and several other trees unknown to the party. The ebb tide rendered their progress very flow, and it was evening before they arrived at the end of the above-mentioned northeastwardly reach. On the northern shore was seen a village of the natives who evidently solicited the landing of the party, but choosing to waive their civility, they proceeded up the river, which took a direction S. 62E, from the village passing some islands lying in the middle of it. These occupy about two miles. Their easternmost point is about a league from the above village, and after the second lieutenant of the discovery, they were named Baker's Islands. The bold northern shore now became low near the banks of the river, and rose high again at a distance in a gradual ascent. Mr. Broughton crossed over half a mile to the eastward of Baker's Islands to a high bluff point named by him Point Sheriff, where good shelter for the night was found on a sandy beach. At this time, they had gained only 22 miles after rowing 12 hours. The river here was about half a mile wide, and the best channel from Point Sheriff was found along the southern shore. Nine canoes with a number of Indians took up their lodging in a small creek at a little distance from the party. This circumstance served to convince Mr. Broughton that the further he proceeded, the more the country we inhabited. At first, their warlike appearance produced some small degree of caution, but this was afterwards, by their orderly behavior, proved to have been unnecessary. From 10 in the morning, when it appeared by the shore to be high water, the party had ruled against the stream to their landing place, where, 
Although the tide continued to rise until midnight, the stream had ran up only two hours. At seven the next morning, October 27th, with the stream still running down very rapidly, they proceeded in their examination, passing to the north of a small woody island, which, after the surgeon of the Chatham, was named Walker's Island. The soundings were from four to seven fathoms. About 10 o'clock, the tide was flowing fast, according to the appearance of the shore, and for about two hours, the stream favored their progress. After this, great delay and much fatigue was endured by a strong ebb tide and a fresh easterly wind. The nine canoes attended them, and as they passed some small creeks and openings on the sides of the river, their numbers kept increasing. Eastward from Walker's Island and nearly into mid-channel, a bank partly dry extends for two or three miles, but admits of a clear passage on either side. The passage to the south, being the widest and deepest, has five or six fathoms water. After passing this bank, the channel continued on the southern side, with soundings from six to ten fathoms. They now again approached high land, and on the northern shore was a remarkable mount about which were placed several canoes containing dead bodies. To this was given the name of Mount Coffin. About a mile to the eastward of Mount Coffin, their Indian attendants flopped at a single hut, but Mr. Broughton continued rowing until three in the afternoon, when, having increased their distance only nine miles from Point Sheriff, the Marty slopped to dine on the southern shore. This was high and rocky and terminated the direction of this reach in latitude 47 5 longitude of 237 11, 11, from whence the river ran S18E, and the same depth of water continued. The northern shore, instead of being the steepest, now consisted of low, flat, sandy shores, through which, nearly opposite to their dinner station, where the river was about half a mile wide, two other dreams fall into it. The western most was named River Pool, and the eastern most Knights River. This last is the largest of the two. Its entrance indicated its being extensive, and by the signs of the natives, they were given to understand. The people up that river possessed an abundance of sea otter skins. After dinner, the party proceeded up the reach, extending S18E, passing a low sandy island at its entrance against a very strong stream, and having advanced about four miles, they took up their residence for the night. Several of their friendly Indian attendants, as usual, lodged at a small distance. It was low water at half past ten at night and high water about two in the morning. About six o'clock on Sunday morning, October 28th, Mr. Broughton continued to proceed against the stream and soon passed a small rocky islet about twenty feet above the surface of the water. Several canoes covered the top of this islet in which dead bodies were deposited. About two miles from hence is a low sandy island, having a spit stretching from each end to some distance. On each side, the channel is clear. The south side is the deepest, having three or four fathoms water. From this island, the reach takes a more eastwardly course about four miles to a point on the north shore in latitude 45 degrees 56, longitude 237 degrees 18, the soundings to this point, which is high and rocky, were from four to seven fathoms. The shores of the opposite or southern side of the river are low and produce many willow trees. The high and rocky banks were covered with pine trees down to the water's edge. From hence, with little variation, the river's direction is about S5E. The channel is narrow, and on the eastern shore, the depth of water was from four to six fathoms. Here were three openings stretching in an easterly direction formed by two small woody islands, on one of which was a grove of tall and straight poplars. These were distinguished by the name of Uri's Islands. Abrist of these is a shoal that joins the south side of the river and renders the passage it closed to their shores very narrow. Beyond them, the river, now about a quarter of a mile wide, is free from obstruction, and the general depth five and six fathoms to another point, about four miles to the south of the above-mentioned high one where, for the first time in this river, some oak trees were seen, one of which measured 13 feet in girth. This obtained the name of O.K. Point. 
close to the south of it was a small brook that ran to the eastward, off which a bank of sand diverted the channel to the western shore, where soundings were found from five to eight fathoms. About three miles and a half from Oak Point, Mr. Broughton arrived at another, which he called Point Warrior, in consequence of being there surrounded by 23 canoes, carrying from three to 12 persons each, all attired in their war garments and in every other respect prepared for combat. On these strangers discoursing with the friendly Indians who had attended our party, they soon took off their war dress and with great civility disposed of their arms and other articles for such valuables as were presented to them, but would neither part with their copper swords nor a kind of battle axe made of iron. At Point Warrior, the river is divided into three branches. The middle one was the largest, about a quarter of a mile wide, and was considered as the main branch. The next, most capacious, took an easterly direction and seemed extensive. To this, the name of Rushley's River was given. And the other, that stretched to the SSW, was distinguished by the name of Calls River. On the banks of Rushley's River, was seen a very large Indian village, and such of the strangers as seemed to belong to it strongly solicited the party to proceed thither, and to enforce their request very unequivocally represented that if the party persisted in going to the southward, they would have their heads cut off. The same entreaties, urged by similar warnings, had before been experienced by Mr. Broughton during his excursion, but having found them to be unnecessary cautions, he proceeded up that which he considered to be the main branch of the river until eight in the evening, when, under the shelter of some willows, they took us their lodging for the night on a low sandy point, accompanied by twelve of the natives in a canoe, who fixed their abode very near to the Uring. The whole of this day little assistance had been derived from the flood tide. The ebb had slackened for about two hours, but no current upwards during that time was perceptible. The next morning, October 29th, they again proceeded up the river and had a distant view of Mount St. Helens, lying N42E. In founding across the river, whose width was here about a quarter of a mile, from three to twelve fathoms, water was found. Owing to the rapidity of the stream against them, they were under the necessity of stopping to dine at not more than four or five miles from their resting place. Here it was, low water at noon, and though the water of the river evidently rose afterwards, yet the stream continued to run rapidly down. The greatest perpendicular rise and fall appeared to be about three feet. In this situation, the latitude was observed to be 45 degree 41 mun, longitude 237 degree 20. When Mount St. Helens was seen lying from hence N, 38 E, our distance from Point Warrior being about eight miles. In their way hither, they had passed two Indian villages on the west side of the river and had been joined by 150 of the natives in 25 canoes. To avoid any surprise, they dined in their boats. This precaution was, however, unnecessary, for on some trivial presence being made, a trade immediately commenced, in which the Indians conducted themselves with the utmost decorum. No attempts were made to pass the line drawn on the beach, excepting by two, who appeared to be the principal chiefs and who were permitted to join the party. These seemed to be very well disposed and inclined to communicate every information. But unfortunately for our gentlemen, a total ignorance of the Indians' language precluded their profiting by these friendly intentions. At one o'clock they quitted their dinner station and after rowing about five miles, still in the direction of the river S5E, they passed on the western side a small river leading to the southwestward, and half a mile further on the same shore came to a larger one that took a more southerly course. In the entrance of the latter, about a quarter of a mile in width, are two small woody islets, the soundings across it from two to five fathoms. The adjacent country, extending from its banks, presented a most beautiful appearance. This river Mr. Broughton distinguished by the name of River Mannings. 
its southern point of Entrance situated in latitude 45 de Gram 39, longitude 237 de Gram 21, commanded a most delightful prospect of the surrounding region and obtained the name of Bellevue Point, from whence the branch of the river, at least that which was so considered, took a direction about S57E for a league and a half. A very distant high snowy mountain now appeared riling beautifully conspicuous in the midst of an extensive tract of low or moderately elevated land, lying S67E, and seemed to announce a termination to the river. From Bellevue Point, they proceeded in the above direction, passing a small wooded island, about three miles in extent, situated in the middle of the stream. Their route was between this island and the southern shore, which is low. The soundings between its northwest point and the main land were three fathoms, increasing to four, five, and six, off its southeast point. From whence, the river took its course, S-75E. This obtained the name of Menzies Island, near the east end of which is a small, sandy, woody island that was covered with wild geese. From Bellevue Point, a small stream of flood had attended them to this station. But here, a rapid downward current was met though it was by no means high water. At the several creeks and branches they had passed, they lost successively most of their Indian companions, excepting one elderly chief, who, in the most civil and friendly manner, had accompanied them from the first, and had a village still further up the river. Having received many presents, he had become much attached to the party, and to manifest his gratitude, he now went forward to provide them with lodgings, and whatever acceptable refreshments his village might afford. About seven in the evening, they reached his habitation, where he much wished them to remain. But preferring a more secluded resting place, they resorted to a shallow creek a mile further up the river and about eight miles from Bellevue Point, where they passed the night. Here it was, low water about two, and high water at half past five o'clock the next morning. At seven they again departed, but were obliged to retire some distance to clear a shoal spit that lies off this creek. After this they proceeded to the northern shore. This shore was well wooded, composed of stony beaches, and the soundings were regular from two to seven fathoms. The southern shore, though low and sandy, was also well clothed with wood. The breadth of the river was about a quarter of a mile, and its direction was the same as before mentioned. The wind blew fresh from the eastward, which, with the stream against them, rendered their journey very slow and tedious. They passed a small rocky opening that had a rock in its center, about 12 feet above the surface of the water. On this were lodged several large trees that must have been left there by an unusually high tide. From hence, a large river bore S5E, which was afterwards seen to take a southwestwardly direction and was named Bering's River. Between it and the Shoal Creek is another opening, and here that in which they had rested stretched to the E, N E, and had several small rocks in it. Into this creek, the friendly old chief who had attended them went to procure some salmon, and they pursued their way against the stream, which was now become so rapid that they were able to make but little progress. At half past two, they stopped on the northern shore to dine, opposite to the entrance of Baring's River, Ten canoes with the natives now attended them, and their friendly old chief soon returned and brought them an abundance of very fine salmon. He had gone through the rocky passage and had returned above the party, making the land on which they were at dinner an island. This was afterwards found to be about three miles long and after the lieutenant of the Chatham was named Johnstone's Island. The west point of Bering's River is situated in latitude 45 and 28, longitude 237 41, from whence the main branch takes rather an irregular course about N. 82 E. It is near half a mile wide, and in crossing it, the depth was from six to three fathoms. The southern shore is low and woody, and contracts the river by means of a low sandy flat that extends from it, on which were lodged several large dead trees. The best passage is close to Johnstone's Island, this has a rocky, bold shore, but Mr. Broughton pursued the channel on the opposite side, where he met with some scattered rocks.
These, however, admitted of a good passage between them and the main land, along which he continued until towards evening, making little progress against the stream. Having now passed the sand bank, says Mr. Broughton, I landed for the purpose of taking our last bearings. A sandy point on the opposite shore bore S. 80 E, distant about two miles. This point terminating our view of the river, I named it after Captain Vancouver. It is situated in latitude 45 to 27, longitude 237 to 50. The same remarkable mountain that had been seen from Bellevue Point again presented itself, bearing at this station S67E. And though the party were now nearer to it by seven leagues, yet its lofty summit was scarcely more distinct across the intervening land, which was more than moderately elevated. Mr. Broughton honored it with Lord Hood's name. Its appearance was magnificent, and it was clothed in snow from its summit, as low down as the high land by which it was intercepted, rendered it visible. Mr. Broughton lamented that he could not acquire sufficient authority to ascertain its positive situation, but imagined it could not be less than 20 leagues from their then station. Round Point Vancouver, the river seemed to take a more northerly direction. Its southern shores became very hilly, with bar spots of a reddish color on the sides of the hills, and their tops were thinly covered with pine trees. The opposite shore was low, well wooded, and mostly composed of shingly beaches. The breadth of the river here was a quarter of a mile. It afforded a clear, good channel on the northern shore, with soundings across from six to two fathoms, shoaling gradually to the bed of sand that stretches from the opposite side. During this day, they had constantly rowed against the stream, having increased their distance only 12 miles up the river, and notwithstanding there had been a sensible regular rise and fall of the waiter, it had not in the least degree affected the stream, which had run constantly down with great rapidity. Mr. Broughton at this time calculated the distance from what he considered the entrance of the river to be 84, and from the Chatham, 100 miles, to reach this station had now occupied their time, with very hard labor, seven days. This was to the full extent for which their provisions had been furnished, and their remaining supplies could not, with all possible frugality, last more than two or three days longer. And as it were impossible under the most favorable circumstances, they should reach the vessels in a less space of time, Mr. Broton gave up the idea of any further examination and was reconciled to this, monsieur, because even thus far the river could hardly be considered as navigable for shipping. Previously to his departure, however, he formally took possession of the river and the country in its vicinity in His Britannic Majesty's name, having every reason to believe that the subjects of no other civilized nation or state had ever entered this river before. In this opinion, he was confirmed by Mr. Gray's sketch in which it does not appear that Mr. Gray either saw or was ever within five leagues of its entrance. The friendly old chief, who still remained of their party, assisted at the ceremony and drank His Majesty's health on the occasion. From him they endeavored to acquire some further information of the country. The little that could be understood was that higher up the river they would be prevented passing by falls. This was explained by taking up water in his hands and imitating the manner of its falling from rocks, pointing at the same time to the place where the sun rises, indicating that its source in that direction would be found at a great distance. By the time these ceremonies and inquiries were finished, the night had closed in. Notwithstanding this, Mr. Broughton re-embarked and with the stream in his favor, sat out on his return. All the Indians now very civilly took their leave, excepting the old chief and his people, who, their route being the same way, still bore them company. Little opportunity had been afforded, especially at the latter part of their journey up the river, to ascertain the depth of the channels. To supply this deficiency, the two boats spread and found it regularly all the way down. By this means, a bank was found extending entirely across Barings River, and from thence across the main branch, which they had navigated, to the rocky passage at the west end of Johnstone's Island. 
the greatest depth having been only three fathoms, Mr. Broughton was confirmed in the opinion he had previously formed that any further examination of this branch would be useless. After passing to the west of the rocky passage, the best channel is on the southern shore, but even that is intricate, and the greatest depth of its water is only four fathoms. They took up their abode for the night about half a mile from their preceding night's lodging, having returned in three hours the same distance that had taken them 12 hours to ascend. In the morning of the 31st of October, it was low water at four and high water at six o'clock. The rise and fall of the water did not appear generally to exceed two feet and the stream constantly ran down. Mr. Broughton departed early and off the village of their friendly old chief was joined by him and his whole tribe. Soundings were pretty regular until the party were abreast of some barren land off which is an extensive bank. On this there were only three feet water. This depth continued nearly to the east point of the islet that was observed before to be covered with wild geese and obtained the name of Goose Island. The channel here is on the southern shore until the passage between Menzies Island and the north shore is well open. This is good and clear with regular soundings from three to seven fathoms quite to Bellevue Point where a spit lies out at some small distance. The land in the neighborhood of this reach, extending about five leagues to Berings River, is on the southern side low, sandy, and well wooded. On the north side, the country rises beyond the banks of the river with a pleasing degree of elevation, agreeably adorned with several clumps of trees, and towards the eastern part of the reach, it finishes at the water's edge in romantic rocky projecting precipices. The good old chief here took his leave of the party. In commemoration of his friendly behavior and his residence being in the neighborhood, this part of the river obtained the name of Friendly Reach and a point on the northern shore, bearing from Bellevue, point S67E, parting point. From this place to the station where Mr. Broughton observed the latitude on the 29th, the soundings were from six to ten fathoms, from whence a bank of sand extended along the western shore about a league, reaching over two-thirds of the channel, leaving a very narrow passage of the depth of ten to twelve fathoms. This bank terminates at Willow Point, from whence the soundings decreased from nine to six fathoms. About three miles from this point, on the opposite or eastern side of the river, an opening or arm was passed, leading to the N.E., this was named by Mr. Broughton after the master of the discovery, Whidbey's River. The western point was slat and produced some grass and willow trees. The opposite shore still continued more elevated and from Whidbey's River was covered with pine trees. At the entrance into this river, the depth of water was six or seven fathoms. But on approaching point, Warrior for about two miles, it decreased to three and four fathoms and again increased to 10 and 12 fathoms. Off that point, from thence to Oak Point, the depth was from 10 to 5 fathoms. Here the party rested for the night and perceived it to be low water at half past three and high water at five in the morning of the less tea of November. In this situation, they had before seen many of the natives, but the night most probably now prevented their appearance. The weather had the preceding day been gloomy, attended with fog and rain. This morning it was fair and pleasant, with a favorable eastwardly breeze. In passing from Uri's Islands, the soundings were first from seven to three, then from four to nine fathoms. The depth again decreased as the low sandy island was approached to six, three, and four fathoms. This latter depth continued between the island and the northern shore which is the best channel, passing close to the mainland. From this island, where the water all round it is shoal, a spit extends some distance to the westward, on which there was no more than three fathoms. But from thence to the rocky islet, where the canoes with the dead bodies were deposited, it increases to seven and twelve fathoms. About a mile above this rock, a bank extends to the eastern shore nearly into mid-channel, 
where the depth of water did not exceed 212 fathoms, all the way to Knight's River. The shores on this side are low, flat and sandy, on the western side high and woody, and affording a clear, though narrow, channel, with soundings from five to eight fathoms. Knight's River is about the eighth of a mile in width, and from its entrance, where its depth is four fathoms, it takes a direction S, 51E. Leaving Knight's River, the soundings increased from seven to 12 fathoms until Mount Coffin was reached, where the depth of water was only six fathoms, and passing between the northern shore and the dry sandbank, from three to five fathoms only were found. But the soundings increased from six to 10 fathoms as the party advanced towards Walker's Island. On the western point of this island, they made a late dinner and had an opportunity of observing that during the rising of the water, the stream did not run up, the surface of the water being still and stationary. It was high water at five in the afternoon. From this point, the depth continued from five to seven fathoms until Baker's Islands were approached. A shoal spit extends from the longest and largest of these islands, or that which was so considered to the eastward. On this was found only two, one, two or three fathoms water. To the north of this apparently large island are three smaller ones, which admit a clear though narrow passage between them and the northern shore. On one of these, under the shelter of a grove of fine poplars, Mr. Broughton rested for the night. At daylight the next morning their journey was resumed, and in passing Swain's River, which takes a southwesterly direction, no bottom could be found with 15 fathoms of line, but towards its western point, soundings were had of three and four fathoms. About a league to the westward of this is Manby's River, taking a course S. S.W. From hence, the depth of water was from seven to nine fathoms until they approached near the east point of Puget's Island, from whence a shoal extends about a mile nearly into mid-channel. On this, there were only two fathoms, but on crossing over to the southern shore, it deepened to seven fathoms. Mount St. Helens was here very distinctly seen lying S.81E. Puget's Island was patted on the south and observed to produce on that side only a few pine trees of inferior size. But it afforded a good channel of seven, 10, and 13 fathoms of water. The latter depth was off its western extremity, which is a low marshy point covered with reeds. Soon after patting this point, another branch of the river was opened, which appeared by the high land on the southern side to lead into the found in a direction N, 56 W. But as in its entrance, the depth of water was only two, one, two fathoms. Mr. Broughton was induced to give up his intention of examining it and pursued his former course, keeping near the southern shore, consisting apparently of a cluster of marshy islands. The northwestern most of these forms the south point of the entrance into the river and on the west or found side of this point. The low marshy land takes a southwest direction whose other openings appeared to communicate with the last mentioned. Before these openings lie, the shoals already noticed. On the northern shore, immediately without the entrance into the river, is an Indian village. A part of it only was occupied by the natives, who supplied our friends very liberally with salmon and promised to follow them with more to the vessel. From hence they steered for a low sandy island, partly covered with trees, in the eastern part of the found with soundings from seven to five fathoms until they drew very near to it, when the water became so shallow that they were obliged to haul off. Towards its northwest part, two, one, two fathoms were found close to it. Mr. Broughton had no opportunity of examining whether there was any passage in this situation towards the southern shore, as it was at this time dark. But by its former appearance from the elevated land on the northern shore, he was of opinion there was not. A bank nearly dry continued all the way from this island to Point Adams. He, however, passed some distance along the north edge of the bank towards Tongue Point in three fathoms water until nearly abreast of Gray's Bay. Here they came to overfalls from three to seven fathoms and found themselves within or to the south of 
a dry bank, which obliged them to pull back in order to clear it, after which they had regular soundings in Crossing Gray's Bay, from four to six fathoms water. At nine in the evening, the party arrived on board the Chatham, having employed exactly half the time in returning that had been occupied in going up this river in consequence of the general rapidity of the stream downwards and of being assisted sometimes by a favourable wind. Mr. Broughton had now lost sight of the discovery twelve days, and though he had received no orders for the investigation he had undertaken, yet he was convinced that in so doing he would act agreeably to my wishes. And having obtained so much information, he deemed it expedient to join the discovery with all possible dispatch. Much to his satisfaction, he found the Chatham ready in every respect for sea. The next morning she was unmoored, but the wind from the east shifting suddenly to the southward and blowing in squalls very hard, attended with a heavy rain, they remained at their anchorage until the next day, when the weather being more moderate, they got under way. But they had scarcely filled their fails when the wind, as on the preceding day, came round, and as they had a very narrow space to work in between the northern shore and the shoals, they again anchored in eight fathoms water to wait a more favourable opportunity. This presented itself in the afternoon, but by the time they had reached the large deserted village, it again became stormy, with a heavy rain from the westward, which compelled them again to stop in six fathoms water, a little below the deserted village called by the natives Chinoke. Cape Disappointment bore by compass N. 84W, tongue point N. 64, E, one mile distant, point Adams, Dar Air S, 51W, and the nearest shore north, at the distance of a quarter of a mile. The same unpleasant weather continued until the next morning, November 6th, when, with the wind at Eni, they stood towards Cape Disappointment. The launch founded the channel before the vessel, and the surf was soon seen to break across the passage leading to sea with great violence, and in such a manner as to leave no apparent opening. The wind at this time, also veering to the south, induced Mr. Broughton to bear away for a bay that is situated immediately within and on the eastern side of Cape Disappointment. The southeast end of that promontory forms its west point of entrance, its east point being formed by the west extremity of the spit bank, lying from each other, ESE and WNW, about three quarters of a mile asunder. In passing the channel, a sufficient depth of water was found until bordering too much on the bank they came into three fathoms with a very confused sea that broke violently on the bank. At ten in the forenoon they anchored in five fathoms water. Point Adams, by compass, hearing S46E. Chinoke Point S, 86E. The inner part of Cape Disappointment forming the west point of entrance into the Bay S4E, half a mile distant, and the southernmost part of the coast in sight S. 26E. Here was found the Jenny of Bristol, the same vessel that had been passed by the Chatham on her first arrival. Mr. Broughton was informed by the master of this vessel, Mr. Baker, that a constant succession of bad weather had prevented his putting to sea, that he had made several attempts, but from the violence of the surf and its breaking entirely across the entrance, he had not been able to effect that purpose. In the afternoon, Mr. Broughton went on shore in order to view from the hills the state of the channel into the ocean. This presented one entire range of heavy breakers reaching across from side to side. Fresh gales with squally weather from the SE on the 7th. The Chatham, with half a cable only, rode very easy. And the Jenny lying within her in three fathoms water at low tide with the cape bearing by compass SE, was entirely becalmed under its high land. The afternoon being more moderate, the Seine was hauled, but with little success. The weather still continuing unfavourable, the next day was employed in replenishing their stock of wood and water, and Mr. Broughton in person founded the bay and pert of the channel, the depth of water between the Chatham and Jenny, and within the spit bank, 
towards a small river in the northern part of this bay was from five to three, four, five, six, seven, and then overfalls of two and three fathoms to the spit bank, where the water broke very heavily. From the Chatham across to the breakers off Point Adams were found not less than four, one, two fathoms, but the sea broke so violently that he was prevented founding through the channel, which was not distinguishable in any direction. Mr. Manby and some others of the gentlemen who with Mr. Baker had been up the small river, returned in the evening with 18 geese, besides a great number of ducks and some smaller birds. The morning of the 9th brought fair and pleasant weather with the wind at S.E. Mr. Broughton again visited the hills of the Cape to take some angles. The sea was too much agitated by the breakers to allow the appearance of any opening through them towards the ocean. In his walk, he killed a fine deer. The weather being more moderate than it had been for many days, induced a number of the inhabitants to visit the Chatham. These brought a large supply of fish and moose deer sufficient for the crew. Amongst the Indians were several who had followed them up the river and who now brought their various commodities for sale in the same friendly manner they had done before. The latitude observed this day was 46 to 19. In the afternoon, Mr. Sheriff was sent to found and view the channel out to sea. On his return, it was reported to be clear, smooth, and nowhere less than four fathoms water. The next morning, with a moderate breeze at E.N.E., &E, the Chatham weighed at half ebb from Baker's Bay, so named by Mr. Broughton after the commander of the Jenny, whose track he followed. Mr. Baker, having obligingly offered, as his was the smallest vessel, to lead out, and having been here in the earlier part of the year, he was better acquainted than Mr. Broughton with the course of the channel. After making two short trips, the Chatham just weathered the Cape and the breakers that lie off it. The foundings were from six to nine and eleven fathoms, the sea extremely irregular and confused. On standing over towards Point Adams, the depth decreased to six, five, and four, one, two fathoms. Their course was now directed W-1-2-S, close to the southern side of the channel. Here the heavy breakers rolled with impetuous force against the wind and tide, and greatly retarded their progress. For notwithstanding the fresh, favorable breeze that blew right aft, there was much difficulty to keep the vessel's head the right way, owing to the violence of the sea that made her pitch so incessantly as to shake the wind out of her sails. The Jenny appeared to get out without shipping any water. The Chatham followed her track, but the sea broke several times over her from stem to stern. Due precautions, however, having been taken, none of the water got below. In this unpleasant situation, little progress was made. Mr. Broughton, suspecting they might have occasion for the boats, had kept them both out in readiness for any emergency. Unfortunately, one of these tremendous surges stove the launch, which filled, and by the violence of the jerk, broke the tow rope. One of their marines was unhappily the boat keeper, and it was impossible at the moment to afford him any other assistance than that of veering a buoy astern. This expedient, however, sailed, and they had every reason to fear that the poor fellow would be drowned. After contending with three other such violent billows, the wind and tide carried the vessel out with great velocity, and on their arriving in smoother water, the cutter was instantly dispatched to the assistance of the marine, who was perceived amidst those violent agitations of the water still holding fast of the launch, which, having been more sensibly operated upon than the vessel by the strength of the tide, had drifted clear out. And those on board the Chatham had the inexpressible happiness of seeing the cutter bring both their shipmate and the launch safely alongside, with the loss only of the furniture that she had contained. Both boats were immediately hoisted in, and the Chatham made sail to the SSE with a fine breeze at NW, in company with the Jenny. Soon after the Chatham was out, a ship was seen in that quarter, which Mr. Broughton would have concluded to be the Daedalus store ship, had not Mr. Baker informed him that they had joined the discovery off the entrance the day after he went up the river. The sequel, however, showed that he was not mistaken, this vessel proving to be the Daedalus, 
which had been detained by the inclemency of the weather in Grays Harbour until within a few hours of her being seen by the Chatham. Thus, the Chatham quitted Columbia River the rest of the time, till she joined the Discovery, was employed in performing a very boisterous and unpleasant passage until she passed Cape Mendocino, exactly similar to that which we had experienced. I shall conclude this account of Columbia River by a few short remarks that Mr. Broughton made in the course of its survey, in his own words. The discovery of this river we were given to understand is claimed by the Spaniards who call it Entrada de Ceta, after the commander of the vessel, who is said to be its first discoverer, but who never entered it, he places it in 46 degree north latitude. It is the same opening that Mr. Gray stated to us in the spring. He had been nine days off the former year, but could not get in in consequence of the outsetting current. That in the course of the late summer, he had, however, entered the river, or rather the found, and had named it after the ship he then commanded. The extent Mr. Gray became acquainted with on that occasion is no further than what I have called Gray's Bay, not more than 15 miles from Cape Disappointment, though according to Mr. Gray's sketch it measures 36 miles. By his calculation, its entrance lies in latitude 46 to go 10, longitude 237 to go 18, differing materially in these respects from our observations. The entrance, as already stated, lies between the breakers extending from Cape Disappointment on the north side and those on the south side from Point Adams over a fort of Bar, or more properly speaking, over an extensive flat on which was found no less depth of water than 412 fathoms. The best leading mark is to bring the tongue point, which looks like an island near the southern shore, to bear by compass about E by N and then steer for it. This was observed in the passages of the Chatham in and out, though on the latter occasion, circumstances were too unpleasant to allow of great precision. From the information and experience derived by this visit, it appears to be highly advisable that no vessel should attempt entering this port, but when the water is perfectly smooth, a passage may then be effected with safety, but ought even then to be undertaken with caution. Bordering on the breakers off Point Adams and keeping the tongue point well open with Chenoke or Village Point will avoid the spit bank and give a clear channel up to Chenoke. But in case of failure in the wind or tide, it will then be most advisable to anchor in Baker's Bay, bringing its entrance to bear north and keeping close round the Cape Breakers, where the depth of water is from 11 to 9 and 6 fathoms, close to the Cape shore. Within the Cape are three rocky islets in the bay, the middle one being the largest. Just on with the Cape is the line of direction going in, or out, leading along the southern side of the spit bank in deep water, and near this is lit, bringing the Cape to bear between S and S. E is good and Choroje, in five fathoms water. The latitude is 46 x 19, longitude 200 and the variation of the compass 20 degrees eastwardly. The greatest rise and fall of the tide in this bay, observed by Mr. Baker, was 12 feet. High water at full, and change at half pale one o'clock. Manby's. Observations on board the Chatham confirmed those of Mr. Baker as to the time of high water, but the rise and fall of the tide with him did not exceed six feet, and the greatest strength of the tide was about four knots. This bay, besides affording good and secure anchorage, is convenient for procuring wood and water, and by keeping upon good terms with the natives, who seemed much inclined to be friendly, a supply of fish and other refreshments may easily be obtained. The heavy and confused swell that in bad weather constantly rolls in from the sea over its shallow entrance and breaks in three fathoms water, renders the space between Baker's Bay and Chinoke point a very indifferent roadstead. Cape Disappointment is formed by high steep precipices covered with coarse grass, the sides and tops of the hills with pine trees. Point Adams, being the southeast point of entrance, is low and sandy, from whence the country rises with a gradual ascent 
and produces pine and other trees. Any further nautical information that may be required will be better obtained by reference to the sketch. With respect to its natural productions and other interesting matter, the weather experienced on board the vessel having uniformly been similar to that afterwards encountered at sea precluded any competent knowledge being acquired. The trees principally composing the forest were pines of different kinds, growing to a large size, but were unequal to those of Nootka. Near the waterside were found maple, alder, and ash, and at some distance up the river beside these, the oak, poplar, and oriental strawberry tree were produced, with many other forest trees, unknown to the gentlemen, who made a short excursion into the country, and who were only able to judge of the indigenous quadrupeds, or animals, by the skins the natives wore or brought to barter. These were similar to those found on other parts of the coast. The birds that were procured were large brown cranes, white swans, white and brown geese, ducks, partridges, and snipes. A variety of others were seen that could not be taken. All that were brought on board, excepting the brown cranes, proved excellent at table. The river seemed to abound with fish from the supply the natives provided, consisting of two forts of salmon, both very good, sturgeon of a large size and very fine flavor, with silver bream, herrings, flat fish, and soardinias. Of these four last sorts, some were caught in the Seine. The skirts of the woods afforded a most excellent green vegetable, resembling in appearance and taste the turnip top when young. A bulbous root, about the size, and not unlike the crocus, that ate much like mealy potato, wild mint, ground ivy, and wild lavender. All these the natives make great use of, together with berries of various kinds, particularly the cranberry, of a most excellent flavor, and the first we had seen on this coast. The natives differed in nothing very materially from those we had visited during the summer, but in the decoration of their persons. In this respect, they surpassed all the other tribes, with paints of different colors, feathers, and other ornaments. Their houses seemed to be more comfortable than those at Nootka, the roof having a greater inclination and the planking being thatched over with the bark of trees. The entrance is through a hole in a broad plank, covered in such a manner as to resemble the face of a man, the mouth serving the purpose of a doorway. The fireplace is funk into the earth and confined from spreading above by a wooden frame. The inhabitants are universally addicted to smoking. Their pipe is similar to ours in shape. The bowl is made of very hard wood and is externally ornamented with carvings. The tube, about two feet long, is made of a small branch of the elder. In this they smoke an herb, which the country produces, of a very mild nature and by no means unpleasant. They, however, took great pleasure in smoking our tobacco. Hence, it is natural to conclude it might become a valuable article of traffic amongst them. In most other respects, they resemble their neighbors as to their manners and mode of living, being equally filthy and uncleanly. The soil of the low ground was mostly a stiff, rich clay, capable to all appearance of being made very productive that on the high land amongst the pine trees, a black mold seemingly composed of decayed vegetables. Having now concluded Mr. Broughton's very interesting account of the River Columbia and the adjacent country, I shall in the next chapter proceed with the transactions of the Daedalus, and in the first place notice Mr. Whitby's account of Gray's Harbor, where although he was longer detained from us, he had not an opportunity of employing his time to so much advantage in geographical pursuits as Mr. Broughton. The regions allotted to his examination having been found of very limited extent. Voyage to the North Pacific Ocean and Round the World by Captain George Vancouver. Book the Third, Chapter Four. At sunset, on the 18th of October, the Daedalus anchored before the entrance of Gray's Harbour in seven fathoms water, 
about half a mile from the reef that extends from the north point of entrance. A boat was sent to examine the passage into this harbour, but returned with little more information than that of its being very intricate, and that it would require much time to become acquainted with it. At daylight the next morning, a boat was again sent for the same purpose here, and afterwards the ship was got underway, in order to be in readiness. But the boat not returning, another was dispatched at noon, and at three o'clock both returned, the first having been detained by the strength of the stood tide. From their report, the ship immediately bore away, and passed a bar in eighteen feet water. The bar extends directly across the entrance into the harbour, which is about a mile wide. From whence they proceeded up the channel, formed by two reefs about three quarters of a mile asunder, extending into the ocean from the points of land which form the entrance into this harbour. Here the depth of water regularly increased from four to eleven fathoms, but the ebb tide made so strong that although the ship went nearly at the rate of five knots, little progress was made. This compelled them to anchor about seven o'clock in the latter depth, having a clear sandy bottom. The outer breakers on the reef forming the northern side of the passage bore by compass S, 58, W distant two miles, a dry sand bank, N, 81 W, half a mile distant, the inner breakers on the same side, N, 31 E, at the like distance, the outer breakers on the southern side, S, 32 W, distant two miles, and the inner breakers on that side, N, 65 E. These form the channel within the bar. There is also a breaker on the bar about a quarter of a mile from the SW point of the northernmost ledge of breakers, which bore S 50 W. On the morning of the 20th, the wind blowing a strong gale from the NE prevented the ship moving. But whilst the stood tide lasted, the boats were profitably employed in the further examination of the channel. The observed latitude was found to be 40 spodi 6 degrees and 50 quarters 1 to 2. Fair weather attended the ND gale, which continued until the next morning, when the wind veered to the S. E. The Daedalus then flood into the harbour, and was moored about noon in four fathoms water, off the north point of entrance. This is a rounding point, bearing by compass from N, 34W to N68W, the former distant half a mile, the south point of entrance bore S, 20W, and the intermediate space was shut in from the sea by the reefs. This anchorage was found to be a very snug and safe situation, and it was a fortunate retreat, as a hard gale of wind set in from the SE with a great deal of rain, which continued until the next morning, when Mr. Widbay began his examination of the harbour. It seemed to be of no great extent, as the land appeared to be closely connected on every side. The operation, however, proved to be very tedious in consequence of the very bad weather and the difficulty of approaching the several parts of the shore on which it was necessary to land. This survey was not finished so far as the boats could proceed until the morning of the 26th. The north point of entrance, named by Mr. Whidbey after Captain Brown, is situated in latitude 47 degrees longitude 236 to 7 an, the variation of the compass 18 did an easterly, from hence its southern point of entrance, which obtained the name of Point Hansen after Lieutenant Hansen who commanded the Daedalus, lies S10E, distant about two miles and a quarter from the former. The breakers of the northern side of the channel stretch first, S33W for half a league, and then S-72W, two miles and three quarters further, where they terminate on that side. Those on the southern side extend first, N, 59W for a mile, and then S, 61W, two miles and three quarters further, where these also terminate. From these terminations of the reefs, the bar stretches across from point to point, on which at high neap tides, there is only 20 feet water, having on it the breaker before noticed, contracting the width of the passage, which can only be considered to lie between it and the southern reef. After passing the bar, the channel appeared to be uninterrupted, the northern fide being the deepest, with regular foundings from four to fourteen fathoms. The latter depth was found in the narrowest part, not more than half a mile wide, 
between the two first mentioned projecting points of the reef from the points of the harbor. Thence in the line of mid-channel, the depth decreases to six fathoms between the points of the harbor and to four and three fathoms towards the southern side, which is the shallowest. It, however, increases to ten and decreases again to six and three fathoms near Point Brown. This is the boldest shore and affords a space of near two miles in extent to the any east and se of it, where may be found good and secure anchorage with regular soundings from. Ten to four fathoms. To the north is excellent anchorage also in four to six fathom water, though this is more confined by the shoals. From Point Brown to a point up the harbour, lying from it, N, 65E, at the distance of four miles and a quarter, which obtained the name of Point New after the master of the storeship, the northern shore forms a deep bay, falling back near a league and a half from the line of the two points. This bay is occupied by shoals and overfalls commencing about a mile to the north of Point Brown, stretching nearly in an eastern direction and passing about a mile to the southward of Point New, up to the navigable extent of the harbour, which terminates in an eastern direction about two leagues from Point Brown, though the shore on each side retires about half a league further back. But the intermediate space, consisting of a shallow flat, prevented the head of the harbour from being approached. Where was the appearance of a small rivulet? From this station, the shoals on its southern side take a direction nearly S73W, until they reach within about one mile and three quarters of Point Brown, lying from that point, S. 45E. There, a point is formed that stretches to the southward and admits of a narrow channel of about four and five fathoms water between them and the shoal that lies on the eastern side of Point Hansen into a small cove lying from that point, S50E, two miles distant. These shoals, extending entirely round the harbour, are in some parts, particularly on its southern side, dry at low water, and on them are lodged great numbers of dead trees and logs of drift timber. There are also two other shoals, situated at the distance of two miles to the eastward of Point Brown, lying nearly in a north and south direction. The easternmost, which is the largest, and partly a dry sand, nearly connects the two shoal banks admitting a narrow passage to the north of it with five fathoms and another to the south of it in which there is only three fathoms water. The rise and fall of the tide was here found to be about ten feet and it is high water about fifty das after the moon passes the meridian. The only leading mark for sailing into this harbour are two small red cliffy islets lying to the NW of Point New the outermost of these, having the resemblance of a flower pot in a line with Point Brown, leads over the center of the bar, as also over part of the northern reef, easily avoided by keeping in the depth of water already mentioned after crossing the bar. Any further nautical information that may be required will be found by reference to the sketch of this survey. This port appears to be of little importance in its present state as it affords but two or three situations where the boats could approach sufficiently near the shores to effect a landing. The most commodious place was at Point Brown, another near Point Hansen, and one in the cove or creek to the S.E. of that point. The shallowness of the water on the bar also renders it by no means a desirable port. To pass this is impracticable unless near high water, even with vessels of a very moderate size and it should then be attempted with the utmost caution, since Mr. Whitby had great reason to believe that it is a shifting bar, there being a very apparent difference in the channel on their arrival and at their departure, when it seemed to have become much wider but less deep. A dry sand bank which lay near their anchorage the first evening, Ura 1-1, the north side of the channel, was now entirely washed away by the violence of the sea, which had incessantly broke upon the shoals and bar, Wood and water are at too great a distance to be easily procured, particularly the latter, which is found in small springs only, running through the sand near Point Hansen, at the distance of a mile from the landing place, over a very heavy sand. The surrounding shores are low and apparently swampy, with salt marshes. 
The soil is a thin mixture of red and white sand over a bed of stones and pebbles. At a small distance from the waterside, the country is covered with wood, principally pines of an inferior stunted grout. Both the Daedalus and Chatham had greatly the advantage of the discovery by being detained in port during the boisterous weather that we contended with. There they procured a most abundant supply of excellent fish and wild fowl. The productions of Gray's Harbor being similar to those found in and about Columbia River, salmon, sturgeon and other fish were plentifully obtained from the natives and geese, ducks and other wild fowl shot by themselves in such numbers as sometimes to serve the whole of their crews. The best sporting ground in Grays Harbor was found to be on its south side. Mr. Whidbey estimated the number of Indians inhabiting this place at about 100. They spoke the Nootka language, but it did not appear to be their native tongue. And they seemed to vary in little or no respect from those people we had occasionally seen during the summer. Their behavior was uniformly civil, courteous, and friendly. In Mr. Whidbey's excursion to the head of the harbor, he was visited by 19 of them, who, having satisfied their curiosity and received some trivial presents, were about to depart when the boat, in endeavoring to approach a small rivulet, became entangled amongst shoals, sunken logs of wood and stumps of trees, on which there, being some sea, occasioned the boat frequently to strike and rendered its situation very disagreeable. The friendly Indians, perceiving their embarrassment, very kindly by signs and other means, afforded them such assistance as soon conducted them into deep water when they took their leave and departed. Mr. Whidbey considered them to be rather a more slender race than we had been accustomed to see, and that, contrary to the generality of the men we had become acquainted with on the coast of Northwest America, these did not appear to be jealous of their women, but allowed them to repair on board the vessel where they remained many hours at a time, much to their satisfaction. They appeared to be divided into three distinct tribes or parties, each having one or two chiefs. When inquiries were made of any one party respecting the other two, they would reply that the others were bad people and that the party questioned were the only good Indians in the harbor. Hence may be inferred that they were at this time at variance and that their interests were totally separate from each other. Some of their war canoes were seen. These had a piece of wood rudely carved, perforated, and placed at each end, three feet above the gunwale. Through these holes, they are able to discharge their arrows without exposing their persons to their adversaries, either in advancing or retreating. Each canoe held 20 people or upwards. Little difference appeared in their bows or arrows from those generally met with. The former were somewhat more circular and the latter were pointed with iron, copper, or shells, some of which were barbed. These seemed to be their most favorite weapon and were managed with great dexterity. One of the Indians desired the mate of the Daedalus to shoot a pelican sitting on the water about 50 yards off. The mate fired twice with a single ball without hurting the bird, which kept its station. The Indian missed it with the first arrow, but with the second he pierced through the wing and body of the pelican to the great exultation of all the natives present. They are well versed in commercial pursuits and dealt very fairly and honestly. For sea otter skins, they sometimes required iron in exchange, but in general sold them for copper and woolen cloth. About 30 or 40 good sea otter skins, with many of inferior quality, were thus purchased. For their less valuable commodities, they were partial to pale blue beads, two of which would buy a large salmon they appeared to be a hardy people and inured to the inclemency of the weather, which, when at the worst, did not deter them from visiting the ship, though the sea frequently broke entirely over them. On such occasions, they bail their canoe and paddle on without the least apparent concern. This is the substance of the information acquired by Mr. Whidbey in his visit to Gray's Harbor, and as the observations made on the passage of the Daedalus from thence to Monterey, would, like those of the Chatham, be only a repetition of what has been already related. 
I shall now proceed to date some interesting intelligence collected from letters written off Owehi by the late Lieutenant Hergest, agent to the Daedalus transport, respecting his transactions at the Marquesas, and the discovery of some islands to the W of them, with an extract from his logbook on the same subjects, together with the account given by Mr. Thomas New, the master of the unfortunate death of that officer, and of the late Mr. Gooch, the astronomer. As the preceding part of Mr. Hergest's voyage appeared by the journals on board to contain no very interesting intelligence, the narrative will commence on the arrival of the Daedalus at the Marquesas. The length of the passage from Falklands Islands into this ocean rendered it necessary that Mr. Hergest should embrace the earliest opportunity to recruit his water and procure refreshments, especially as the character that had been lately published in England of the inhabitants on the Sandwich Islands made it uncertain that any supplies would be procured from that quarter. Having made the Marquesas, Lieutenant Hergest directed his course for Resolution Bay in the island of Ohetahu, where the Daedalus anchored on the evening of the 22nd of March, 1792, in 22 fathoms water sandy bottom, having worked into the bay against very heavy squalls and gusts of wind, which came down with great fury from the hills that overlook the shores. In one of these heavy squalls, about four o'clock the next morning, they parted from their anchor and drove out of the bay. The vessel was scarcely clear of the points when Mr. Hergus discovered the ship to be on fire. They had all been prevented sleeping during the night by the ship having been full of smoke. Those who had the watch on deck attributed this circumstance to the smoke having come from the shore. And this opinion, very inconsiderately and without reflection, had been generally adopted, until Mr. Hergist, after the ship had cleared the points of the bay, in going into the cabin was convinced that the smoke originated from a nearer and more alarming cause. On listing up the gunroom scuttle, there immediately issued an immense column of smoke, which left no doubt of their perilous situation, as the fire was close to the magazine. Not a moment was lost in getting out the powder and putting it into a boat alongside, but this was no easy task to perform, as the gun room was extremely hot and full of smoke, and the powder, very injudiciously, had been promiscuously stowed amongst the ship's provisions. On this occasion, there appears to have been no exertion wanting in the crew of the Daedalus, to whose credit Mr. Hergist observes, that in that trying moment every man flood firm to his duty, without suffering fear or panic, to swerve them from its execution although on some other occasions they had given him much trouble and serious concern. At first the fire was supposed to have been occasioned by some oakum stowed in the forepart of the gun room, taking fire by accidentally getting wet, since no lights had ever been near it. After a large quantity of provisions had been hoisted up to get out the powder, the smoke was still found to ascend from below. This circumstance, with that of the deck being so hot, as not to allow the people keeping their hands upon some lead that was laid upon it, convinced them that the fire must be in the lazaretto below, where some pusses' beds were now recollected to have been very improperly stowed. And from the seas they had shipped during the tempestuous weather which they had experienced in their passage round Cape Horn, no doubt was entertained that these beds had got wet and had taken fire. Every minute, confirming Mr. Hergest in this opinion, care was immediately taken to stop every avenue and crevice about the after hatchway to prevent any communication of air before they ventured to scuttle the deck for the purpose of extinguishing the fire by pouring water over it. Happily, they had daylight for executing this and were soon convinced that the fire had originated as they had last conjectured from the appearance of the ascending smoke on scuttling the deck as also of the good effect of their judicious labors. Other holes were now bored immediately over the beds, and after pouring down large quantities of water, they soon had reason to be gratefully thankful to divine providence for so timely and critical a preservation. Some of the beds were entirely consumed. A case on which they were laid, as also the deck over them, were burnt some way into the wood to a black cinder. Little else was flowed with these beds but rum and oil, so that had the fire once broke out into a blaze, the extinguishing it, or preventing its communication with these inflammable substances, would have been morally impossible, and their destruction would have been inevitable. 
The fire thus providentially discovered and happily extinguished, all the bedding, being either burnt or rotten, was got up and thrown overboard. Fearful of drifting too far to leeward, they were obliged to make sail in order to work into the bay, although the decks at this time were very much encumbered. Many of the natives were about the ship, employed in picking up the rotten bedding that had been thrown into the sea. At eleven in the forenoon, they anchored near their former station. The natives had taken away the buoy, but had fastened a piece of wood to the buoy rope, which answered all the purposes of recovering their anchor. This was soon effected, and the ship steadied with the kedge anchor to the southward. The south point of the bay, bearing by compass SW, the north point NW, and the watering place E by N, one mile distant. The village in the south cove being the nearest shore was at the distance of about a quarter of a mile. In the afternoon, Mr. Hergest in the cutter, attended by the second mate in the long boat, went to procure water and landed with the mate and three men, though not without much difficulty on account of the surf. This did not permit them to put more than two casks on shore. Many of the natives were assembled and in consequence of there being no chief amongst them, were soon found to be very troublesome, as they stole everything they could make off with, so that not a bucket was left them to fill the casks with water. Mr. Hergest, finding that his party on shore would require considerable reinforcement to effect his purpose, was about to embark when one of his people claimed his attention. The natives had amused themselves by pulling the hair of a young man and other waggish tricks, whilst his endeavours to prevent this rudeness afforded the rest of the Indians as high an entertainment as it would have done an English rabble. These indignities were so galling to the poor fellow that no longer able to endure them, and not being in a situation to resent the insults he received, he burst into a flood of tears. On Mr. Hergest reproaching him in rather harsh terms for exposing so great a proof of his weakness, he found himself suddenly turned round by the natives who were behind him and his fowling piece forcibly wrenched out of his hand. On the impulse of the moment he called to the mate to fire and bring down the thief. But fortunately, I say fortunately, repeats Mr. Hergest, his piece was not cocked and I had time to recollect that his musket was then the only one on shore and there is no saying what consequences might have followed had the thief been shot. Mr. Hergest and his party very prudently retired immediately to their boats, which they effected without any opposition. But on re-embarking, it was found that some of the Indians had dived under water and cut the long boat's grapnel rope, by which means they lost the grapnel. These unprovoked injuries and indignities were not easily to be put up with, and Mr. Hergest very properly reflected that passing by such insults and depredations would only encourage the islanders to persevere in these unwarrantable practices. In order, therefore, to awe them into better behaviour, he rode close to the beach and discharged a volley of musketoons and small arms over their heads. This measure had the good effect of driving them all, excepting one man, from the beach among the trees. This fellow was bold enough to remain and throw stones with his fling at the boats. Mr. Hergist, however, took no notice of him, being determined to show them the effect of their great guns, four of which were fired over the village on his return to the Daedalus. These produced such consternation that the natives were seen making the best of their way in every direction towards the mountains. The clearing the ship's decks and putting her to rights employed all hands till nearly dark, when one of the natives swam off with their usual ensigns of peace, a green bough wrapped up in white cloth. This he threw into the ship and immediately returned to the shore. By this act of humiliation on the part of the natives, Mr. Hergist had great reason to expect that he should be enabled to carry into execution the service they had to perform on shore without further molestation, and to hope that none of the Indians were killed or materially hurt, as his intention was only to frighten them, and by the superiority of his powers to show them that such improper behavior should not long remain unchastised. 
In these expectations, the next morning, October 24th, he met with no disappointment, though it was not possible to restrain entirely the exercise of their thievish faculties, even on board the ship. The astronomer's theodolite, in its case, happening to be on deck, one of them contrived to convey it away, but being discovered swimming with it to his canoe, a musket was discharged by the chief mate, and it had the good effect of making the Indian abandon his prize, which was recovered, the case being sufficient to keep it afloat. After this, the natives supplied them with breadfruit, together with a large quantity of other vegetables and a few small pigs. On Mr. Hergist's return to the shore, with a guard well armed for the purpose of procuring water, no inconvenience arose from the natives. On the contrary, they cheerfully assisted in swimming off to the boats, filling and rolling down the water casks, and in other services, for which they were liberally rewarded with such trivial articles as they most highly esteemed. One person only had been seen bearing the appearance of a chief, whose name was Tu Ao, and who had been amongst their first visitors on their arrival. In the afternoon, he brought as a present some vegetables with a small pig or two, for which he received a suitable reward, and was also presented by Mr. Hergist with the only English sow he had left for the purpose of improving the breed of those animals in that country. Their operations were now carried on in a very amicable manner, but the number of visitors greatly impeded their business. To obviate this inconvenience, the colors were hoisted in order to signify that the ship was tabooed. This had the desired effect with respect to the men. But the women, who probably had more incitements than bare curiosity, were not to be so easily restrained. They still continued to swim from the shore in such numbers that they were obliged frequently to fire muskets over their heads to deter them from advancing. A tolerable supply of vegetables was obtained, but so few hogs that it was noon on the 26th before a sufficient number were procured to serve the ship's company at the rate of one pound and a half per man. And these were purchased with 12 inches of bar iron for each small pig. Two chiefs who visited the ship on the 27th restored the grapnel that had been stolen and promised to bring back Mr. Hergest's fowling piece. In the afternoon, Mr. Hergest was employed in surveying and founding the bay. The depth of water was found to be regular from 30 fathoms at its entrance to nine fathoms towards the shore, admitting of good anchorage within that space. Round the shores of the bay, at a very small distance, the depth of water was from seven to five and four fathoms. Having completed their supply of water on the 29th of October, and having finished all the business they were here desirous of executing, just as they were preparing to sail the two chiefs who had returned, the grapnel revisited the ship and repeated their promise that the fowling piece should be restored. In consequence of their former good behavior, they had received many valuable presents, and as they were now in Mr. Hergis's power, and as he was well assured that they could obtain the restitution of his gun, he informed one of the chiefs that the ship was immediately going to sea and that if the fowling piece was not instantly sent on board, he should be carried away from his island. To these threats he paid little attention until an armed sentinel was placed to guard him in the cabin. When his apprehensions became visible and were not a little augmented by the alarm of the Indians on board, most of whom quitted the ship. Mr. Hergist, perceiving his agitation, used every means to assure him that he should not be hurt, but yet, if the gun was withheld, that he would on a certainty proceed with him to sea. This conversation had the desired effect. A message was sent to the chief in whole possession. The peace was, and in about half an hour, a canoe was seen coming towards the ship, displaying the usual emblems of peace, in which was a chief who had brought back the gun, and to whom Mr. Hergest delivered up the prisoner Unhurt. The tears, eager salutation, and the fond delight expressed by the chief who had been detained on again embracing his countrymen, plainly discovered the terror of his mind under the apprehension of seeing them no more. They now parted very good friends, and both the prisoner and the other chief 
seemed perfectly reconciled on receiving some useful presents. Thus the Daedalus quitted the island and its inhabitants, with whom they seemed to be continually on the eve of a quarrel in consequence of their repeated and daring thefts. Mr. Hergest very humanely concludes the account of his transactions at the Marquesas by expressing much happiness that he had not been driven to the melancholy necessity of putting any of the natives to death for the security of their property and excepting one man who was detected in stealing a bucket and who was suffered to reach his canoe before a musket was fired with the intention to frighten him by passing the ball through his canoe but which unintentionally passed through the calf of his leg no other person appeared to have received the least injury this was a very fortunate circumstance as the shot fired from the great guns went far up the valley where were many of their habitations and their escaping unhurt on that occasion was more than could well have been expected it is however very probable they may not fare so well on the future arrival of other vessels since their inordinate propensity to thieving seems beyond all restraint or control and there did not appear to be any chief amongst them who possessed either inclination or authority sufficient to deter them from such practices in the evening about five o'clock they weighed and steered to the northward at daylight the next morning 30th october they came within sight of some islands which appeared to mr hergest to be new discoveries those first seen were three in number one bearing by compass n by e the other n by w and the third s w by s they fetched the s w part of the easternmost where a good bay was found with a tandy beach some rocky islets lie to the se of it and from a gully in the nw part of the bay there was an appearance of procuring a supply of water to the east of the south point there appeared another good bay and along the western shore shallow broken water but on rounding that point and hauling to the north along the west side the broken water was found to extend not more than a quarter of a mile from the shore on this side there is neither cove nor inlet only a rocky shore with two small rocky islets off its nw point this island is about six leagues in circuit and is in latitude eight card of south longitude 220 to 51 east it is inhabited by a tribe of seemingly friendly indians some of whom visited the ship in their canoes in the valleys were a great number of cocoa nut and plantain trees and the whole island presented an infinitely more verdant and fertile appearance than those they had just quitted from hence they flood over to the southernmost island which appears at a distance like a remarkably high rock with three peaked rocks close to it these are about the middle of the island the night was spent in keeping their station near it and in the morning their course was directed towards its sw point as the shore was approached the land was seen to be well cultivated and numerously inhabited more than 100 indians were soon assembled round the ship in their canoes disposing of coconuts plantains etc for beads and other trifles and behaving in a very friendly manner at the SW end of this island is a very good bay with a sandy beach in its eastern part. Along the southern side are other bays. One in particular appeared to retire deeply in towards the SE end of the island, having a small islet lying off it, not unlike in shape to a cathedral and other rocks and islets. From the west point of this island, forming also the west point of the finest and deepest bay it affords, its shores trend round to the N.E. and, like the west side of the island, they were at the preceding day, which received the name of Rouse Island, a rocky and bare, rather a sterile appearance. This island obtained the name of Trevenen's Island. It is situated in latitude 9 to 14 south, longitude 292 to 21 east. In the forenoon of the 1st of April, the south side of the third island was passed, which was named Sir Henry Martin's Island. Immediately to the west of its S.E. point, called Point Martin, is a deep, well-sheltered bay bounded by sandy beaches. This obtained the name of Comptroller's Bay. It was not examined, but on passing had the appearance of a safe and commodious port.
At its head was a break in the shores, supposed by some to be the mouth of a rivulet, but as it appeared too large for so small an island to afford, Mr. Hergist was rather inclined to believe it only a deep cove. They were here visited by many of the natives paddling and sailing in their canoes, who behaved in a very civil and friendly manner. About two leagues to the westward of Point Martin is a very fine harbor, extending deep into the island and bounded by a most delightful and fertile country. Mr. Hergest, accompanied by Mr. Gooch, went with the cutter to take a sketch and to examine the port, which he called Port Anna Maria. It was found to be very easy of access and egress without any shoals or rocks that are not sufficiently conspicuous to be avoided. The depth at its entrance 24 fathoms, gradually decreasing to seven fathoms. Within a quarter of a mile of its shores, the bottom of fine sand and the surrounding land affording most perfect security against the winds and sea in all directions. An excellent run of fine water flows into the harbor, which possesses every advantage that could be desired. The country seemed to be highly cultivated and was fully inhabited by a civil and friendly race of people readily inclined to supply whatever refreshments their country afforded. Our people were induced to entertain this opinion from the hospitable reception they experienced on landing from the chiefs and upwards of 1,500 of the natives who were assembled on the shores of the harbor. On their return to the ship, they found the same harmony subsisting there with the Indians, who had carried off and fold a supply of vegetables and some pigs. They renewed their route along the south side of the island to its SW point, when they hauled their wind along the western side. This is a rocky iron-bound shore without cove or bay. It had a verdant appearance, but no great sign of fertility, nor were any habitations or natives perceived. About sunset, they discovered what appeared like a large rock to the northwestward, about six or seven leagues distant. And during the night, they remained near Sir Henry Martin's island. But in the morning, not being able to fetch its NE point, they quitted it. Its NW side appeared to contain some small bays, and towards its NE extremity, the land turned apparently short round, forming a bay something similar to, but not so deep as Comptroller's Bay. Another rock just above water now shewed its head to the eastward and to the northward of that before mentioned. These Mr. Hergist represents to be dangerous. They lie about W by N, about six leagues from the western side of Sir Henry Martin's Island, which is about 16 leagues in circuit. Its center is situated in south latitude, 8 dig 51 na, longitude 220 dig 19 east. After leaving this island, two others were discovered to the northward of them. On the morning of the 3rd of April, they bore up to the southward, along the east side of the southwesternmost. This is the largest of the two. Its shores are rocky, without any coves or landing places. And though its surface was green, it produced no trees yet a few shrubs and bushes were thinly scattered over the face of the rocks. Nor did it seem to be other ways inhabited than by the tropical oceanic birds. These were in great numbers about it, and it seemed to be a place of their general resort. The NW side, however, had a more favorable aspect, and although its shores were also rocky, a number of trees were produced, as well on the sides of the hills, as in the valleys. This side, afforded some coves where there is good landing, particularly in one near the middle. This, from the appearance of its northern side, was called Battery Cove. A little more than a mile to the north of this cove is a bay, which Mr. Hergest and Mr. Gooch examined. Good anchorage and regular soundings were found from 18 to 5 fathoms water, the bottom a fine clear sand. An excellent run of fresh water discharged itself into the bay near a grove of coconut trees. Here they landed and found a place of interment and a hut near half a mile from it by the side of a hill. But there were no people, nor the appearance of any having been recently there. Although it was manifest that they did, on some occasions, resort to the island. This induced Mr. Hergest to forbear cutting down any of the coconut trees as he had at first intended to do, 
and he procured by other means as many of the fruit as served the whole crew, with five to each person. The landing was but indifferent on account of the surf, but water is easily obtained. After ascertaining the last mentioned island to be eight miles long and two miles broad, and to be situated in south latitude 7 degrees 53, longitude 290 degrees 47 east, they took leave of these islands the next morning. And to the NE of the last, at the distance of about a league, they discovered another. Nearly round and much smaller, with two islets lying off its SW point. To this was given the name of Roberts's Island. Mr. Hergest states that during the time he was amongst these islands and at the Marquesas, they were subject to frequent heavy squalls and much rain. He compares the inhabitants of this group to those of the Marquesas in color and in size, but in manners, behavior, dress and ornaments, excepting that of their being less punctured they more resembled the people of Otaheite and the Society Islands. On the first information of the Daedalus having visited these islands, I concluded they had not been seen before, and to commemorate the discovery of a very worthy though unfortunate friend and fellow traveller in my more early periods of navigating these seas, I distinguished the whole group by the name of Hergest's Islands, but I have since been informed that these islands had been discovered and landed upon by some of the American traders, and that in fine weather the southernmost is visible from Hood's Island, the most northern of the Marquesas. Hence they are considered by some as properly appertaining to that group, although neither the Spanish navigator nor Captain Cook, who visited the Marquesas after him, had any knowledge of such islands existing. This is the amount of all the information I have been able to collect from Mr. Hergest's papers respecting his voyage thus far. The imperfect arrangement of which offers an additional cause, if an additional cause could be wanting, to lament the untimely and melancholy fate of that valuable officer, who, in several interesting particulars in his observations on these islands, refers to documents which I have never seen, and which would, of course, have enabled me to illustrate many points and descriptions which, for that reason, I have not been able to insert. The unfortunate as well as the successful adventures of persons employed on services of a public nature, being generally objects of minute inquiry, I shall conclude this chapter with the account delivered to me by Mr. New, the master of the Daedalus transport, of the melancholy fate that attended Lieutenant Hergest, her commander, Mr. Gooch, the astronomer, and the unfortunate seaman who was murdered with them. In their passage from her guests to the Sandwich Islands, there did not appear anything worthy of remark, except a strong current that set at the rate of 30 miles a day, and obliged them to stand to the eastward left they should fall to leeward of those islands. The Daedalus by this means arrived off Auhaihi, and Mr. Hergest received the orders I had left there. From thence, he proceeded to the N.W. side of Wahoo, not having any expectation of finding the discovery at that time on the south side of the island, as I had appointed. This unfortunate determination, though contrary to the orders I had given, appeared to him at the time to be right, in order to ensure the most expeditious passage towards Nootka. In the morning of the 7th of May, the Daedalus arrived in that bay, where the resolution and discovery had anchored in 1779. But Mr. Hergest declined anchoring there, as he considered the inhabitants of that neighborhood to be the most savage and deceitful of any amongst those islands. For this reason, he lay to and purchased from the natives some hogs, vegetables, and a few gourds of water. In the evening, he stood offshore and desired that the inhabitants would bring a further supply of water and refreshments the next morning, but it falling calm and the current setting the ship to the westward. It was near noon on the 11th before they regained the shore, when Mr. Hergest receded from his former wife determination, and unhappily for himself and those who fell with him, ordered the ship to be anchored. The cutter was hoisted out and veered astern, for the better convenience of purchasing water from the natives. But before three casks were filled, which was soon done, he ordered the cutter alongside, 
the full casks to hoe taken out and replaced by empty ones, and then, accompanied as usual by Mr. Gooch. He went on shore, and another boat was hoisted out for the purpose of obtaining water, while those on board continued making purchases until near dark. At this time the cutter returned, with only five persons instead of the eight who had gone on shore in her, from whom was learned the distressing intelligence that Mr. Her guest, Mr. Gooch, and two of the boat's crew having landed unarmed with two of the water casks to fill, their defenseless situation was perceived by the natives, who immediately attacked them, killed one of the people, and carried off the commander and the astronomer. The other, being a very stout, active man, made his escape through a great number of these ravages, fled to the boat, and with two others landed again, with two muskets, and with the intention to rescue their officers and to recover the body of their messmate. They soon perceived that both Mr. Hergest and Mr. Gooch were vet alive amongst a vast concourse of the inhabitants, who were stripping them and forcing them up the hills behind the village. They endeavoured to get near the multitude, but were so assailed by stones from the crowd, who had now gained the surrounding hills, that they were under the painful necessity of retiring. And as night was fast approaching, they thought it molt advisable to return on board, that more effectual means might be resorted to on this unfortunate occasion. Mr. New immediately assembled all the officers to consult with them what was best to be done. It was agreed to stand off and on with the ship during the night, and in the morning to send the cutter well manned and armed on shore, and if possible to recover their unfortunate commander and shipmates. An old chief belonging to Atawai, who had been on board since the Daedalus entered the bay, and had been promised by Mr. Hergest a passage to his native island, went also in the boat to assist as an interpreter and to employ his good offices. He was first landed and went towards the natives, of whom he demanded the absent gentleman, on which he was informed they were both killed the preceding night. Having delivered this message, he was sent back to demand their bodies, but was told in reply that they had both been cut in pieces and divided among seven different chiefs. At least it was so understood by those in the boat from the language and signs which the chief made use of. After this conversation, the savages came in great numbers towards the seaside and threw stones at the party in the boat, who fired several times and at length obliged them to retire. Finding their errand to be completely fruitless, the boat returned on board, in which the old chief re-embarked and the vessel bore away to land him, agreeably, to a former promise at Atawai. But when they were about five or six leagues to leeward of Wahoo, about five in the evening, the old chief made a sudden spring overboard and swam from the ship, which was instantly brought to. But on finding that he still continued to swim from them, without the least inclination of returning on board, they filled their sails, and having then no business at Atawai, they made the best of their way towards Nootka, agreeably to my directions. On the 13th of June, they made the American coast. The wind having been constantly in the NW quarter, they were not able to fetch higher up than the latitude of 430, from whence they beat to windward the rest of the way to Nootka, where they arrived on the 4th of July. In compliance with a letter of instructions, left by the late commander of the Daedalus in his bureau, addressed to Mr. Thomas New in case of his death. Mr. New opened the dispatches, addressed to me from the Lords of the Admiralty, and agreeably with the directions they contained, he delivered to Senor Quadra, the commanding officer at that port, the letter therein enclosed, and addressed to him from the Spanish minister. Thus conclude all the matters and transactions of our voyage up to the end of the year 1792. In the following chapter, I shall resume the narrative of our proceedings at Monterey. Voyage to the North Pacific Ocean and round the world by Captain George Vancouver. Book the Third, Chapter Five. The preceding chapters brought to a conclusion the various occurrences of our voyage to the end of 1792. 
The beginning of the following year was not marked by anything of very particular moment. Senor Quadra's benevolent disposition encouraged me again to obtrude on his goodness by requesting some black cattle and sheep for the purpose of establishing a breed of those valuable animals in the Sandwich Islands. A dozen, being as many as we could possibly take on board, were immediately provided, consisting of four cows, four ewes, two bulls, and two rams. The prospect we had of a good passage to those islands induced me to lay myself under this additional obligation, hoping by such an importation to accomplish at once the purpose I had in contemplation, which, if effected, could not sail of being highly beneficial, not only to the resident inhabitants, but also to all future visitors. Sunday 6. Notwithstanding that I was extremely anxious to get away from Monterey, that the further objects of our pursuit might recommence, and that we might be no longer the cause of Senor Quadra's detention, yet, with our utmost labours and exertions, it was not until the 6th that the several charts, drawings, letters, and other documents were in readiness to be transmitted to England. Monday 7th. Ne After this, having no further occasion for our establishment on shore, the tents, observatory, instruments, and every other article were reshipped, it being my full determination to sail with the land wind the following evening. In the interval, I was honored on board with the company of Sen Quadra, Carmano, the commandant of the Presidio with his Lely, and most of our Spanish friends. Sunday 13. In the course of the afternoon, a very material alteration took place in the weather for the first time since our arrival in this bay. The wind blew a hard gale from the S.E. attended with heavy squalls and torrents of rain. In addition to this, another circumstance concurred to detain us some time longer. The armorer of the Chatham, a most industrious and excellent workman, found an opportunity in the course of the day, with one of the Chatham's best marines, to absent themselves. The abilities and generally good conduct of the armorer made his loss a matter of no small consequence especially as there was no other person in our little community that was competent to fill his post. The only mode to be pursued for their recovery was to make a proper and formal application to Senor Quadra and to Senor Argello, the commandant of the Presidio. In consequence of this, these gentlemen took similar steps to those which on a former occasion had recovered a seaman belonging to the Discovery who had attempted to make his escape. The better to ensure success in this instance, a reward of $25 for each of the deserters was offered to the soldiers, who were dispatched in every direction in search of them. The like sum was offered by Senor Quadra, by the Commandant, and by myself, to any person who would deliver them up, or who should be the cause of their being taken. The loss we had thus sustained and the active exertions making to repair it would at any rate have induced me to wait a few days for the event of our researches. The SW and southerly winds with succeeding calms continued, however, to prevent our failing until the 13th, when in the morning the regular sea breeze from the NW prevailed. During this interval, no tidings had been gained of the absentees, and the soldiers who had been sent in quest of them returned unsuccessful. Senor Quadra evidently felt much distressed that so unfortunate an occurrence should take place just on the eve of our separation and issued orders that on their being apprehended they should be imprisoned, that they might be forwarded to me at Nootka during any period of our remaining in these seas, and as a proof that these people had absconded without the knowledge, privity or encouragement of any of the Spanish officers, he very obligingly offered to replace the armorer by substituting the only smith in this establishment, who, being reported to be a very good workman, was an artificer of too much importance to persons in our situation to be hastily declined. With great reluctance, and though contrary to my wishes, I was induced to accept the advantage of so friendly an offer, to which the urgency of the case alone could have obliged me to assent. He was accordingly received on board the Chatham and Senor Quadra's vessels, as well as our own being in readiness to depart. It was agreed we should sail together, 
so long as our southern course answered the purpose of our respective routes, that we might continue as long as possible to benefit by each other's society. We now waited only for the favourable land breeze to take our departure. I consigned to the charge of Mr. Broughton the dispatches I had prepared with orders, as far as it might depend upon himself, not to admit a moment's loss of time, in repairing to England. And I directed my first lieutenant, Mr. Puget, to take upon him the command of the Chatham during the absence of Mr. Broughton. Monday, the 14th. The night was perfectly calm. About nine o'clock on Monday morning, a light breeze sprung up from the eastward with which the discovery weighed. But as neither the Chatham nor any of the Spanish vessels were able to move, we waited for them. Off Point Pinos, this we passed at the distance of two or three miles and had soundings from 38 to 55 fathoms, black sand and muddy bottom. Tuesday 15. The next morning we found ourselves more to the southward and further from the shore than we expected. The wind blew a fresh breeze from the land and we stood to the northward in quest of our friends. The Chatham joined us about nine o'clock when our situation afforded a good opportunity of making such observations as were required to prove the rate of the chronometers. At noon, the latitude was found to be 36 to 23. Kendall's chronometer showed 238 to 18. Arnold's number 14, 238 to 7, her 1 to 2, number 176, 238 to 10, 3 to 4, and Earnshaw's pocket watch, 238 to 3. In this situation, the southernmost land in sight, bore by compass S, 56E, an apparently detached piece of land like a small islet, S, 72E, and point Pinos, N, 31E. This point, according to our observations made on shore at Monterey, is situated in latitude 36 to ground 38, longitude 238 to ground 22, from which it appeared that the chronometers, since they had been taken on board, had acquired the following errors, viz. Kendall's 13 tears, Arnold's number 14, 230s. Arnold's number 176, 545, to the east of the truth. Earnshaw's pocket watch appeared to be correct. By these observations, Kendall's had acquired the greatest error, and Earnshaw's had gone perfectly right. The great regularity of Kendall's hitherto made it difficult to account for this sudden alteration, which could be attributed to nothing but the change that had taken place in the climate on their being removed from the shore to the ship. The thermometer was found daily to vary at the observatory between midday and the evening, from about 70 said to do to, to 40 to. The excess was more, as it would sometimes rife to 70 snisixtig and fall to 30 wandig, but this did not frequently happen. Though early in the mornings it was not unusual to find the little wells we had dug skimmed over with thin flakes of ice and the ground covered with hoarfrost. On board the ship, the mean temperature of the air in which they were kept was between 54 and 60 degrees. This opinion appeared to be particularly corroborated in the instance of Kendall's watch, which evidently went nearly at its nootka rate during our passage from thence to Monterey but on its being there landed, the increase and continuation of the cold appeared soon to accelerate its motion from that of gaining 11.14 to 18.12 per day. On allowing its rate of gaining at Nootka, from the time of its last coming on board at Monterey, it was found to agree very nearly with the longitude of Point Pinos, as affixed to it by our observations. And as I am perfectly satisfied of the accuracy of our observations, the difference can surely be attributed to no other cause than that the best of these delicate pieces of mechanism are not yet, with all the ingenious and valuable improvements that have been made on them, able to withstand for any length of time the transitions and vicissitudes of different climates. Mr. Arnold's two watches on board the Discovery being of later date by some years than Mr. Kendall's, appear to have continued their rate of going more correctly. But even these felt the effect of their altered situation. Mr. Earnshaw's was the newest and was the least sensible of the change in the climate to which it was removed. Future experience may, however, enable me to form other conjectures, which may tend to elucidate more fully 
a subject of so much importance to nautical science. In resuming the narrative of our proceedings, it is necessary to state that the longitude shown by the chronometers will in future be inserted according to the Monterey rate until an opportunity may offer of making further observations. Wednesday 16, we remained off Point Pinos until the evening when, being joined by our Spanish friends, we directed our course to the southward with so light a northerly breeze that by the next day at noon we had only reached the latitude of 36 dig, the land bearing by compass from N20E to S83E, the nearest shore NE, distant about four leagues. Friday 18, the active brig considerably outsailed our little squadron, and the Aransasu, the word sailor of the whole party, was by sunset nearly out of sight astern as neither Senor Quadra nor myself wished to experience the least delay. We agreed to avail ourselves of the favorable gale from the north, and without waiting for Senor Cayamano and the Aransasu to make the bed of our way. By the 18th at noon, we had reached the latitude of 30 Soudig 30, longitude 239 Dig 14, and the variation of the compass 12 Dig eastwardly. From this station, the tracks we each had to pursue began to diverge, so that by continuing together, we should not only have drawn each other from the proper line of direction, but, in consequence of the superiority which the active had in point of sailing, have necessarily occasioned a further detention to Senor Quadra, who, with Mr. Broughton and such of our Spanish friends as could he spared from the brig, honored me with their company to partake of a parting dinner. The wind blew a gentle breeze from the north. The serenity of the sky and smoothness of the sea prolonged my pleasure on this occasion until near midnight, when we exchanged our mutual good wishes and bade our friends of the active farewell. Amongst all that valuable society, there was but one friend who we could reasonably hope and expect to see again, whilst the prospect of never again meeting Senor Quadra and our other friends about him was a painful consideration to the feelings of those perusers of this journal who have experienced moments like this. I must appeal. Their recollection will enable them to conceive the sensations which, inspired by the grateful recollection of pad kindnesses, occurred in thus bidding adieu to Senor Quadra, who was the mainspring of a society that had produced us so much happiness who had rendered us so many essential benefits and whose benevolence and disinterested conduct had impressed our minds with the highest esteem and veneration. On reaching the active, our friends took their leave. We saluted them with three cheers, which they cordially returned, and we each pursued our respective voyages with all sail set. Monday 21. Nothing worthy of notice occurred until the 21st when Joseph Murgatroyd, one of the carpenter's crew, was in the space of about a quarter of an hour from the time he had been last seen missing. He was last observed opening the gun room ports, and whilst so employed, had probably been induced to leak his own destruction by contriving to let himself down into the sea, since it was scarcely possible he could have met his fate there by accident. An experiment was afterwards made by much smaller men than himself, to force themselves out of the portholes, which was not accomplished without great difficulty and trouble. It was, however, pretty evident that he must have perished that way, as he was never seen to come out of the gun room. Add to this, that as he was a good swimmer, as the wind blew only a gentle breeze, with a smooth sea, and as everything was very quiet upon deck, it is natural to conclude that if he had fallen overboard, the accident must have been immediately known, and that he most likely would have been preserved. Wednesday 23rd. The weather continued dark and gloomy, with frequent showers, until noon of the 23rd, when the atmosphere became less loaded and more pleasant. The observed latitude at this time was 25 degree muffin 1, the longitude by Kendall's chronometer, 2 and 37 and 37. Our progress was so slow that on the 24th we had reached only the latitude of 24, 50. The true longitude 
deduced from subsequent observations and corrected back to our quitting the coast was at this time 236 degree 14 and Kendall's chronometer showed 236 degree and 53s Arnold's number 14 236 degree 27 no wonder 76 236 degree 31 drives Earnshaw's 236 degree 19 and Arnold's on board the Chatham 236 degree 8 from whence it appeared that their respective errors continued nearly in the same ratio as our observations had shown the day after we quitted Monterey. The wind, though favorable between the NE and NNW, was light and frequently funk into a calm, attended with a heavy rolling sea from between West and NW at Saturday 26. In consequence of my intention to determine the existence or non-existence of a cluster of islands, described in the Spanish charts as lying between the 19th and 21st degrees of north latitude and between the 221st and 225th degrees of east longitude, I had been induced to steer a very easterly course. But suspecting that the light winds we had experienced were occasioned by our vicinity to the continent, we steered a more westerly course during the two last days with the hope of meeting a fresher trade wind. In this, I was disappointed for instead of having a more favorable breeze, the wind veered round to the west and SW, and so continued until Saturday evening, when our latitude was 20 seconds 10 hours, the true longitude 236 seconds 23 hours. To this station, the variation had gradually decreased to eight degrees, and for some days past, we had regularly been affected by a current setting us to the south at the rate of seven or eight miles per day particularly during the preceding 24 hours, we had been set 12 miles further south than the log shoed. In the course of the day, some tropic birds were about the ship, and after a few hours, calm in the evening, a light breeze sprang up from the sea, which gradually veered round to the knee, yet the NW swell still continued to be very heavy. Monday 28th. The NE wind, proving to be a steady trade wind, soon increased to a fresh gale, attended with pleasant weather. On Monday morning, being nearly in the latitude assigned to the easternmost of the islands before mentioned, the Chatham was sent by signal to look out on the larboard beam. At noon, our observed latitude was 2412, true longitude, 231-39, and the variation of the compass, 5-31-1 easterly. Kendall's chronometer showed the longitude to be 230 degrees 22. Arnold's number 14, 234 degrees 59. Arnold's number 176, 235 degrees 1, and Earnshaw's 234 degrees 48. The northwesterly swell still continued to be very heavy. Thursday 31. On Thursday we passed through a large quantity of the Medusa Vililia, like those which in our way to the north the preceding spring we had found occupying a much larger space in the ocean. These extended only a few leagues in the direction we were steering and were by no means so numerous. The trade wind varying between the ENE and NNE increased to a fresh gale and brought with it squally and unsettled weather with some passing showers of heavy rain. Having nearly reached the situation assigned to the islands we were in quest of, though without any of the usual indications of the vicinity of land, I yet judged it expedient to reduce our sail at night to prevent the possibility of passing any land that might exist in the neighborhood. Our latitude at sunset, 19 54, longitude 227 meter 42. This and several following nights were passed in such a manner as that the point of view ahead in the evening and that astern the next morning should meet in the same horizon unless intercepted by land, though even very moderately elevated. Thus we continued to proceed in search of these islands at night, and in the daytime, spreading as wide as our signals could be plainly discerned. Sunday through. The weather being delightfully serene and pleasant, enabled us on the 3rd of February to make the following observations for the longitude. Longitudinal observations omitted. During this search, the trade wind having been moderate between the SE and NE attended with tolerably pleasant weather, afforded us during the daytime a constant, extensive and distinct view all around, but no indication of them, nor of the vicinity of land, was discovered. 
nor had I in any of my passages across this ocean, which have been many, ever passed over so vacant a space as since our departure from the coast of New Albion. No bird, fish, or other object occurred to attract our attention beside two tropic buds, one booby, about as many petrels, and three or four porpoises. These and our little consort accepted, the heavens and the ocean gave uninterrupted limits to our fight. The latter, however, caused us great inconvenience by means of a very heavy and irregular swell, chiefly from the NW, which gave the ship such a laboring, uneasy motion as to render the transacting of all sedentary business almost impossible. At the close of day, there was no appearance of these islands so far as could be seen ahead, and as we had now passed some distance to the westward, I concluded they could have no existence in the neighborhood of the spot assigned to them, and for that reason I relinquished any further search and made the best of our way towards Owihi. On this occasion it is but just to observe that the Spanish sea officers have no faith in the existence of these islands. The only authority which they are acquainted with for their insertion in the Spanish charts is their having been so found in a chart of the Pacific Ocean constructed many years ago by an old pilot who had frequently passed between South America and the Philippines and whose still and observation had acquired him much reputation and credit in his profession. But as the spot in which they were placed was totally out of his path, it was generally believed by the Spanish officers that he had laid them down from the authority of others. Tuesday 12th. The variation in the afternoon had been observed to be five degree eastwardly. The trade wind blew only a gentle breeze and so continued until the 8th when we had a line fresh gale, but were reduced to our topsails for the purpose of keeping company with the Chatham. The observed latitude on the 11th was 19 to gun 34 hours and the true longitude 207 to gun 20, the fresh. Gale continued from about the NE, the weather squally with thick mist and much rain. We, however, made a tolerable progress till two the next morning, when, not wishing with such uncertain weather to run our observation too close, we hauled to the wind under an easy sail to wait for daylight when we again made sail, and at nine in the forenoon saw the east end of Ohaihi, bearing by compass S. 60 E distant seven leagues. My intention was that Mr. Puget in the Chatham should examine the coast of this island from its east point southward round to Karakakua Bay, whilst we were employed on the purvey of its shores in the opposite direction. By these means, the whole coast of the island would be ascertained with all its bays, harbors, or roadsteads, and every other information that circumstances could admit of would thus be acquired. The discovery was brought to, for the purpose of communicating these directions to Mr. Puget, after which we separated and pursued our respective courses. The observed latitude at noon was 19 to 40. At this time, the east point of Ohaihi bore by compass S 30W at the distance of seven miles and was placed by our chronometers, according to Kendall's penutcarate, in the longitude of 205 to 40 or 1 to 2, by the Monterey rate, 206 and 49, Arnold's number 82, on board the Chatham, penutcarate, 205 and 45, per Monterey rate, 205 and 18, Arnold's number 14, per Monterey rate, 205 and 41 or 30, or number 176, by the same rate, 205 and 31, 30, Earnshaw's per Monterey rate, 205 and 13, 30, and my own last lunar observations brought forward by Earnshaw's watch, 205 and 19, 13. This point is placed by Captain Cook in 205 degrees, 6, which, being esteemed by me to be the true longitude, shows the errors of the several chronometers during this passage. Our course was now directed towards the northeast point of this island, which forms the east point of a very deep bay. Into this we steered as far as was prudent to avoid being embayed, as the wind blew a fresh gale directly on the shore, and though we were sufficiently near its southern parts to see the surf break with great violence, yet so dense was the haze in which the land was enveloped that it was impossible to distinguish any object on shore. A low projecting point was indistinctly seen 
where the breakers appeared to fall back from their northern direction. Beyond Ibis Point, they were not visible from the deck until we drew near to the northern side of the bay. Here we brought to, about four o'clock, within two miles of the northeast point, in the hope of seeing some of the natives, but being disappointed, we made sail off the shore and plied during the night. The next morning, with a fresh gale at ESE, we sailed along the knee side of Ohaihi, within two or three miles of its shores. These were firm and compact, terminating mostly in steep rocky cliffs, with a few small indented bays, rendered easily accessible to their canoes by the sandy beaches that bounded them. From the rugged rocky cliffs, many streams of water fell and discharged themselves into the ocean. The country in this point of view had a very dreary aspect, perfectly uncultivated and nearly destitute of habitations. Those which were observed were small and thinly scattered at great distances from each other. As we advanced to the westward, the population and cultivation seemed to increase and to keep pace with each other. About nine o'clock, a canoe was seen coming towards the ship from one of the small bays. We immediately brought to in the hope that others would follow her example, but we were again disappointed. On the arrival of our visitors, they gave us to understand that a general taboo had prevented the inhabitants coming off to us. They, however, had ventured to trespass on the interdiction at the hazard of suffering death, should their transgression be ever known to any of the priests or chiefs. The taboo bad now existed some days, and in the course of a day or two more would cease. These people further informed us that Tamama was then residing at Karakakua, and that hogs and the other refreshments of the island were prohibited from being disposed of to European or American visitors under penalty of death for any other commodities whatever than arms and ammunition. This is the baneful consequence arising from the injudicious conduct of unrestrained commercial adventurers who have thought proper to furnish these people, naturally a warlike and daring race, with a large assortment of arms and ammunition, not only rendering them by these means a formidable nation, but by thus absurdly and profusely outbidding each other, bringing the generality of other European commodities into contempt and few estimation. Our visitors, however, regardless of the taboo, disposed of their cargo, consisting of one hog, two or three fowls, some roots, and breadfruit, seemingly much to their satisfaction, for some iron, with which they returned to the shore. Towards noon, we arrived off a part of the northern side of Owyhee, where the coast is composed of a cluster of remarkably high, steep, rugged and romantic cliffs, discharging from their naked summits many rapid cataracts into the ocean. The rushing of these impetuous torrents down the black barren surface of the rocky cliffs contrasted with the enchanting, cultivated and populous country to the east and west and behind this dreary frontier for a considerable distance up the sides of the lofty mountains on approaching them in the offing present a very beautiful and picturesque appearance. Nearly in the center of these cliffs is a tolerably deep small bay, much resembling in appearance and in most other respects, the bay in the island of St. Helena, but unfortunately seemed too much exposed to the sea and the generally prevailing winds to be an eligible situation for shipping. Off the western extremity of these cliffs lie some rocky islets at a little distance from the land. Westward from these cliffs, the surf was observed to break with great violence near the shore, which was then within two miles of us. At this moment, we suddenly arrived in seven fathoms water, the west point of the island, lying S-70W, at the distance of nine miles. The trade wind blew a strong gale, attended by a very heavy, confused, irregular sea, probably occasioned by the violence of the wind and an uneven bottom. As this appearance extended all the way to the west end of the island, on finding ourselves in soundings of seven fathoms, we hauled a little off the shore and did not again reach the bottom. Though at the rate we were then going, we were not likely to have gained soundings in much deeper water. The western part of the land, 
from the situation falls in a gradual descent from the base of the mountains and forms an extensive plain towards the water side which seemed to be in a state of high cultivation and abounded with the habitations of the natives. We passed the west point at the distance of about a league, close on the verge of the agitated water. This I suspected to arise from a very sudden decrease in its depth, but could not ascertain the fact, as the wind blew with too much violence, and the agitation of the sea was too great, to venture on a more minute examination, either with the ship or the boats. And as the adjacent shores afford no shelter for vessels, there can be no necessity for approaching within a league of them. Having passed this point, situated by our corrected survey in latitude 20 degree 18 in, longitude 204 degree in, we hauled into Toei Bay and at seven o'clock anchored about seven miles to the south of the point above mentioned in 41 fathoms water, brown sandy bottom with small pieces of coral. Thursday 14th, the night proved very boisterous, attended with very heavy gusts and flurries of wind directly off the land. In one of these, about three in the morning, we drove from the bank, but as it was my design to acquire every information that could be obtained respecting this bay, the anchor was weighed and we turned up into it against a very strong S.E. gale. As the day advanced, it moderated and the weather became serene and pleasant. The adjacent shores, forming the northwestern part of the bay, seemed to be very fruitful, whilst the number of habitations indicated them to be well peopled, yet none of the natives ventured near us. As we considered the taboo to be at an end, I began to be apprehensive that the shyness of the inhabitants originated from some more serious cause. About 10 o'clock, however, a canoe was seen paddling towards the ship, we immediately brought to, and on her coming alongside, we were informed by those in her that they belonged to Kahomotu, who was then residing at a village on an estate of his, in the bottom of the bay, named Toe Ai. Off, which there was good anchorage, and excellent water easily to be procured. These people, without the least hesitation, said that the reason of our not having been visited before was that the whole of the island was under a very strict taboo that prohibited the inhabitants from using their canoes or quitting the shore by any other means, but that the rank and consequence of their master, Kahomotu, authorized him to dispense with the restrictions on the present occasion, as he entertained hopes that the vessel in sight was the same in which his favorite servant, Terahua, had embarked. He had therefore sent them to make the necessary inquiries and in case his expectation should be confirmed, a present of a hog and some vegetables was in the canoe for Terahua, whose gratitude for such a mark of remembrance was instantly testified by the tears that flowed on his receiving the message. This was accompanied by a pressing request that I would stand in and anchor off Kahomoto's village, where I should be supplied with every refreshment the island afforded as soon as the taboo was at an end which had now existed four days, but would entirely cease at sunrise the day after the next. I had not the least objection to accept this invitation, and a breeze favoring my design, we steered for the village of Toag. Mr. Whidbey, who was in the cutter founding for the best anchorage, soon made the signal for an eligible situation, where, about half past two, we anchored in 25 fathoms water on a bottom of fine brown sand and mud, the points of the bay bore by compass N, 36W, and S, 31W, the Morai, which is also conspicuous in pointing out this station, N, 67E, and the watering place at the distance of a mile and a quarter, being the nearest shore, S, 87E, on founding round the ship, about half a cable's length to the SW. Of us was found a very small patch of coral rocks where the water was only 10 fathoms in depth but increased suddenly to 20 fathoms all around it. On the opposite side, however, was clear good anchorage for near a mile where many vessels might ride without inconvenience from the bottom, though nevertheless exposed to the violence of the winds and sea between the limits above mentioned, comprehending 130 in the western quarter. 
Soon after the ship had anchored, our old acquaintance Kahomo too paid us a visit and brought with him half a dozen very fine hogs and a handsome supply of vegetables. Notwithstanding that I took an early opportunity to acquaint Kahomo too that arms and ammunition were hill tabooed, who seemed much to regret the continuance of these restrictions, yet it did not appear to influence his hospitality, as he assured me that if I would remain a few days at Toyaj, we should be supplied with every refreshment in his power to procure, and that the promise he had formerly made should now be punctually performed. After dinner I went with him on shore to take a view of the watering place. It is situated in a small sandy bay where over a space of 20 yards of rugged rocks and stones, a fine stream empties itself, whose water is easily to be procured by landing the casks on the sandy beach and having the water brought in smaller vessels to fill them, a service the natives will readily perform for a trivial reward. This made me regret the absence of the Chatham. As in the immediate neighborhood of the water, the country did not appear to be very populous, we might each have supplied our wants without being teased and pestered with a numerous throng of the natives, whom we should most likely meet with in the more inhabited parts of the island, and which on such occasions had frequently proved very inconvenient. Kahomotu strongly urged my remaining a few days at Toyai, where he would supply us with refreshments, and would afterwards accompany us to another place of his called Tiatatoa, lying between this bay and Karakakua. This he represented as a small bay, affording good anchorage. Water, according to his account, was a scarce commodity there, but all kinds of refreshments were in the greatest abundance and were perfectly at our command. To these solicitations, I in some measure consented by promising to stay the next day in the expectation of not only deriving some supplies for ourselves, but of procuring some provender for the cattle and sheep, which in consequence of the inferior quality of the hay obtained at Monterey, were almost starved. To this cause I attributed the unfortunate losses we had sustained in our passage, amounting to three rams, two ewes, a bull and a cow. These were serious misfortunes and in a great measure disappointed the hopes I had entertained from the importation of these valuable animals into the several islands of the Pacific Ocean. Still, however, I flattered myself with the expectation of succeeding in Ohaihi by leaving the remaining bull with the rest of the cows under the protection of Tamahma, who I expected would meet me at Karakakua to receive and ensure as far as possible the preservation of the animals I had on board. To Kahomo too, who had taken the greatest care of the goats I had presented him with on a former occasion and of their produce since my last visit. I gave a ram, two ewes, and a new lamb that had been born on our passage. On his being informed that Ad the rest were designed for Tamahma, he strenuously recommended their being landed at this place, it being highly necessary that they should have pasture as soon as possible, especially as Tamahma had very extensive possessions in the immediate neighborhood where he affirmed great care would be taken of them. I should gladly have subscribed to his judicious advice, but the shortness of our acquaintance did not authorize me to place implicit confidence in all the assertions of Kahaumotu, particularly in his declarations of being the most intimate and sincere friend of Tama Ama. For should these hereafter have proved to be false, it might possibly have caused the total destruction of the animals, or have been the occasion of commotions or other unhappy disputes. This determined me to deliver them myself into the hands of Tamahma, for whom they were originally intended. Friday 15th. During the day, a gentle refreshing breeze blew into the bay from the westward, but soon after sunset, a gale suddenly arose from the eastward, attended with very heavy gusts, and continued until daylight the next morning. When it fell calm, and the weather resumed a pleasant degree of serenity, attended as before with a gentle refreshing breeze from the westward. This morning, agreeably to his appointment, Kahomotu came on board for the purpose of accompanying me to his habitation on shore. His visit was rendered still more acceptable by his presenting me with 16 very fine hogs, 
a large assortment of vegetables, and a supply of green food for the cattle. Arms and ammunition now ceased to be fought after, and he seemed very highly pleased and fully recompensed on receiving about two yards of red cloth and a small piece of printed linen with a few beads and other trivial articles for his favorite ladies. Of these, he had no less than four in the character of wives, who, he said, were waiting on shore with much anxiety to see me, as the taboo, though at an end as it respected some particulars, was still in force as to the women embarking in canoes. Such of our female visitors as had been induced to favor us with their company had therefore been obliged to have recourse to swimming for that purpose. The name of the village Toyai was by us extended to the bay, which is the same that had been called by Captain King Toyayaha Bay, since the natives give no distinctive name to any part of the ocean that washes the chores of their islands, such bays, coves, etc., as are so distinguished, having been named by their European visitors from the contiguous villages or districts. Toaish is situated in a grove of cocoa nut trees, just behind a sandy beach. A reef of coral rocks, extending thence about three quarters of a mile into the sea, rendered it inaccessible to our boats in a direct line. But we landed very commodiously in a narrow channel between the reef and the shore near the Morai to the SE of the beach, from whence we had about two miles to walk to the habitation of Kahomotu. We could, I believe, have gone much further with the boats in that channel, but as the navigation was intricate and tiresome, I preferred the walk, and attended by the corporal and six marines, we proceeded along the beach, leaving the boats, properly manned and armed, in readiness to support us in case of any treacherous or hostile behavior. These precautions, however, appeared to have been entirely unnecessary, as nothing but the most civil, attentive, and friendly deportment was experienced from all classes of the people. The village consisted only of straggling houses of two classes. Those appropriated to the residence of the inhabitants were small, mean, miserable huts. But the others, allotted to the purposes of shading, building, and repairing their canoes, were excellent in their kind. In these occupations, several people were busily employed who seemed to execute their work with great neatness and ingenuity. In about the middle of the village is a reservoir of salt water, nearly in the center of a large enclosure made by walls of mud and stones. Between these walls and the reservoir, the whole space is occupied by shallow earthen pans of no regular size or shape, nor placed in any order or degree of elevation. The reservoir is separated by a bank or small portion of the sandy beach from the ocean and had no visible communication with it, but was apparently a stagnated standing pool covered with a muddy scum of a yellowish green color. This, the natives say, it always bears and without being replenished by them from the sea, constantly affords a sufficient quantity of excessively salt water for supplying the numerous pans the exposure of which to the influence of the sun soon causes evaporation and crystallization. The crystals are then carefully taken up, and if found dirty from the cracking or breaking of the pans, which frequently want repair, or by the falling of rain whilst making, they are washed clean in seawater and dried. This is their process in making salt which is always white in proportion to the care bestowed in gathering it. They have large quantities, equal in color and in quality to any made in Europe, but the crystals are much larger. The quantity of salt obtained might be supposed, from the appearance of this salt pond, to be produced rather from the saline quality of the surrounding earth in which it is contained than purely from the sea water. Yet its being not more than 30 yards from the seaside makes it probable that the oceanic water penetrates into it through the loose sandy beach that separates it from the sea and that the richness of the fluid may be produced from both those causes. Paying our respects to Kahamatu's wives and inspecting this salt pond, 
occupied most of our time and claimed the most of our attention. Having rendered our visit pleasant to the former, by distributing such articles as we knew they held in high estimation, we returned towards the boats, accompanied by the chief and his ladies, and attended by the natives, who conducted themselves in the most orderly and respectful manner. They brought us coconuts as we passed along, and seemed studious to afford us any little service or civility without being the least troublesome, and strictly conformed themselves to the orders of their chief, who directed that few only should advance near us, and that the crowd should be seated at a distance in whatever direction we should pass. On reaching the boats, I requested that Kahomotu would accompany use on board to dinner, but in consequence of the taboo. I had no idea of soliciting that favor from the ladies. They, however, entertained very different notions, particularly Kahomotu's favorite, Nama Hanna, who contended that although the taboo prohibited their embarking in canoes belonging to Ohaihi, it could not possibly extend to the boats of those who totally disregarded their laws and restrictions. This ingenious mode of reasoning seeming to meet Kahomotu's concurrence, we soon embarked, leaving Mr. Menzies, who had been of our party, on shore in pursuit of new vegetable productions. He returned in the evening after receiving much hospitable civility from the natives, Saturday 16, Sunday 17. Kuhaumalu went on shore with his lady in one of our boats. On its return, a message was brought from Tiana, desiring to be informed who we were, adding that if we were his friends, he would make all possible haste to visit us. But as it would be late on account of his distance before he should be able to arrive, in order that he might be admitted on board in the dark, he would carry in the bow of his canoe a large fire as a signal by which he might be known. He accordingly arrived about four o'clock the next morning, just as we were getting under sail. In his canoe were half a dozen line hogs. These, he desired, might be taken on board, and said he had many others on the road that would follow the ship to the southward. Kaho Motu, attended by his favorite wife, agreeably to a preconcerted signal with him of searing a gun on our departure, came on board to fulfill his engagement of conducting us to Taia Tatua, the wind proved very variable, not only in direction, but force. The weather sometimes was perfectly calm. At others, we had violent gusts from the land, so that it was not until the evening that we were abreast of the south point of this bay, forming the western extremity of Auhihi. The weather continued squally, with thunder, lightning, and rain. A little before it was dark, a brig and a sloop were seen in the offing. From the natives, we learned that these were the Chatham and the Jackal Trader, under the orders of Mr. Brown of the Butterworth. We immediately made towards them, and as they seemed to be under little sail, soon expected to join our consort. But, to our great astonishment, next morning, notwithstanding the night had been mostly calm, we found ourselves at least nine or ten leagues from the land, and had lost sight of both vessels. A fresh breeze from the N.A. during the morning carried us at the rate of three or four miles an hour directly toward the land, yet we did not appear to approach its shores, and at noon its nearest part, being about the south point of Toyaeg Bay, bore E by N, ten leagues distant. The observed latitude was 19 to 42 years. The northeast wind was soon afterwards succeeded by a calm. Monday, 18th. The morning of the 18th brought the two vessels again in sight, and towards noon the Chatham was sufficiently near us to receive a visit from Mr. Puget, from whom I learned that he had traced the shores on the S sea side of Oehai from its call to its south point, at the distance from one to three miles of the shore, without finding any place that presented a probability of anchorage, and if foundings were to be had, they must exist upon an open coast, exposed to the prevailing winds, where so violent a surf broke on the shores that any communication with the land by such means as we possessed would have been impossible. From the south point of the island, their examination was not attended with that minuteness which was necessary to determine the object I had in view. 
This, it seems, had been occasioned by baffling winds and a current setting the Chatham some distance from the land to the northward. That part which required the mod minute survey lies between the South Point and Karakakua, where some of the traders are said to have discovered a more eligible situation for the reception of shipping than Karakakua affords. On this report I placed little reliance, but as I expected to have a future opportunity of ascertaining the fact, it was of little importance on the present occasion. Mr. Puget informed me also that I should find Karakakua a more formidable place than I expected, as he had understood from those in the jackal who had visited it, that it was by no means a desirable flopping place for small vessels. Since Tamama had procured from the several traders a number of cannon with a proper assortment of ammunition, that these cannon were planted and in some measure protected by stone walls, thrown up by the natives along the beach in the bay before his houses, situated in the same place where the habitations of the priests were destroyed after the unfortunate death of Captain Cook. Calms and light baffling winds detained us in this inactive situation, which was rendered extremely unpleasant by a heavy, irregular swell and by oppressively hot, sultry weather. A circumstance now occurred that contributed to make me infinitely more dissatisfied with this irksome detention from the shore. The only bull that remained, and a cow that had brought forth a dead calf, were no longer able to stand on their legs, and it was evident that if a speedy opportunity did not offer itself for relieving them by sending them on shore, their lives could not possibly be preserved. The loss, particularly of the bull, would have been a cruel disappointment to my wishes, but as favorable circumstances often take place when least expected, so it was on this occasion. Tuesday 19th. In the afternoon of the 19th, we were visited by many canoes, though at the distance of eight or nine leagues from the land. In one of these was a chief named Kraimamahu, half-brother to Tama Ahma, and chief of the district of Ahido. To him, and to his friends, I made such presents as were considered by Kahomotu highly suitable to his rank, and which were accepted with marks of great approbation and content. This induced me to hope that by his good offices I should be enabled to get these poor animals conveyed to the shore. As his canoe was sufficiently large and roomy, I requested he would consent to their being put into it, but to my great surprise, a thousand evasions and excuses were immediately started. Anxious for the future advantages these people would derive by the propagation of these animals, I probably discovered much earnestness whilst endeavoring to prevail with Krimamahu to lend me his assistance in securing to himself and countrymen so important a benefit. This he certainly perceived, but possessing no desire to oblige, nor any patriotic zeal, he was only studious to turn my entreaties to his own particular advantage. After Kahoma too had anxiously interfered, but with the same success, I offered Krimamahu, well knowing that avarice is a predominant passion with many of these islanders, a moderate recompense only for allowing his canoe to perform this service. He instantly waived all his former objections, and the bull and cow were soon comfortably placed in his canoe, in which there were some vegetables that the bull ate, seemingly with much appetite. This gave me great pleasure, as I was now in hopes that he would soon recover by the help of proper nourishing food, which the shore abundantly supplied. Wednesday 20th. The next morning we had again increased our distance from Ohaihi, but towards noon, with a light breeze from the southwestward, we made all sail for the island. As we approached, we were met by several large and small canoes, laden with the several productions of the country, which were exchanged by the natives in the most honest and civil manner for our various articles of traffic. Amongst these, red and blue woolen cloths with printed linens seemed the commodities in the highest estimation. Beads and other trinkets were accepted as presents, but were considered as unworthy any return. Amongst our numerous visitors was Tamah Ma's eldest son and presumptive heir to the sovereignty of Ohaihi. He was a boy about nine years of age, possessing a shrewd and lively appearance. In return for the presents I had made him, he presented me on leaving the ship with three or four hogs and promised me a further supply in the morning. By this time, we had nearly reached Tayatatua. 
Mr. Whidbey was dispatched in the cutter to examine the anchorage, as in the event of its being found superior to that of Karakakua, I purposed giving Tayatatua the preference for the transacting of all our material business before we proceeded to the other place, where in case of any disagreement with the inhabitants, we might be much inconvenienced by the cannon of which they were said to be possessed. Thursday, 24th. A calm succeeded the rising of the sun. This continuing until 10 in the forenoon, we were again driven a considerable distance from the land, but a SW breeze then springing up enabled us to steer towards Tiatatua. About noon, I was honored with the presence of Tamahma, the king of Ohaihi. Whole approach had been announced some time before his arrival. Not only from Captain King's description, but also from my own memory, as far as it would serve me, I expected to have recognized my former AC acquaintance by the most savage countenance we had hitherto seen amongst these people. But I was agreeably surprised in finding that his riper years had softened that stern ferocity which his younger days had exhibited and had changed his general deportment to an address characteristic of an open, cheerful, and sensible mind, combined with great generosity and goodness of disposition. An alteration not unlike that I have before had occasion to notice in the character of Pomare at Otaheite. Tamahma came on board in a very large canoe, accompanied by John Young, an English seaman, who appeared to be not only a great favorite, but to possess no small degree of influence with this great chief. Terahua, who had been sent to deliver the bull and cow to the king, was also of the party, and informed me that the cow had died in her passage to the island, but that the bull arrived safe, and was lodged in a house where he ate and drank heartily. After the usual ceremonies and assurances of friendship had passed between Tamahma and myself, he said that his queen, with several of his friends and relations, were in the canoe alongside, and requested they might be admitted on board. This was instantly granted, and I was introduced to Her Majesty, who we had previously understood was the daughter of Kahomotu, by his favorite wife now on board, Namahana. The meeting of the daughter and her parents sufficiently indicated the relation and the affection that subsisted between them. She appeared to be about 16 and undoubtedly did credit to the choice and taste of Tama Ahma, being one of the finest women we had yet seen on any of the islands. It was pleasing to observe the kindness and fond attention with which on all occasions they seemed to regard each other. And though this mode of behavior in public would be considered as extravagant in the polished circles of society, yet to us, so far removed from the civilized world, the profusion of tenderness was very admissible and could not be regarded without a warmth of satisfaction at thus witnessing the happiness of our fellow creatures, though so far behind us in that state of civilization from which alone we imagine the essential comforts and happiness of life can be derived. The sole object of this visit was to invite and entreat our proceeding to Karakakua. To their solicitations I replied that our boat was examining Tayatatua and that on her return I should determine. With this answer they were perfectly satisfied but observed that I should not find it so convenient as Karakakua. I was much pleased with the decorum and general conduct of this royal party. Though it consisted of many yet not one solicited even the most inconsiderable article, nor did they appear to have any expectation of receiving presents. They seemed to be particularly cautious to avoid giving the lead cause for offense, but no one more so than the king himself, who was so scrupulous as to inquire when and where it was proper for him to be seated. The inhabitants who had assembled round the ships were by this time very numerous. On being denied their request to be admitted on board, which was observed towards all but the principal chiefs, they remained perfectly quiet in their canoes and in a most orderly manner carried on an honed and friendly intercourse. The demand, amounting to clamor, for arms and ammunition, which on our first arrival seemed at that time to be so formidable an obstacle to our procuring refreshments, appeared now to be entirely done away, whilst the cordial manner in which we had been received and treated, the profusion of good things we had purchased at an easy rate, 
and the value attached to our articles of traffic impressed me with a more favorable idea of the character of these people than that which had been recently given to the world. Being determined that nothing should be wanting on my part to preserve the harmony and good understanding that seemed to have taken place between us. And having learned from Young that our royal visitors did not entertain the most distant idea of accepting anything from me until they had first set the example, I considered this a good opportunity to manifest our friendly disposition towards them by presence suitable to their respective ranks and situations, in the hope that by such an early compliment I should confirm or perhaps heighten the favorable opinion of us that they already seemed to have imbibed. Accordingly, such articles were distributed as I knew were likely, and as they afterwards proved to be, highly acceptable to the whole party. Permission was now requested for the friends and relations who were alongside in their canoes to be suffered to visit the ship. I easily comprehended what was the real object of the request, which soon became evident by the behavior of these new visitors who, of both sexes and different ages, instantly found their way aft and nearly filled the cabin. Until Tamama desired that no more should be admitted into the ship and then demanded of me if it were my intention to make those now on board any presents. On his being answered in the affirmative, he undertook the distribution himself and was so economical as to give me several opportunities to make some addition to his dispensations, which were more bountifully bestowed on some of the men than on the generality of the women. The ladies, however, were no losers on this occasion. The deficiency of Tamama's attention, being other ways amply supplied, produced no small degree of mirth in which Tamama bore a very considerable part. This distribution being finished and the whole party made very happy, the king, in addition to what he had before received, was presented with a scarlet cloak that reached from his neck to the ground, adorned with tinsel lace, trimmed with various colored gartering tape, with blue ribbons to tie it down the front. The looking glasses being placed opposite to each other displayed at once the whole of his royal person. This filled him with rapture and so delighted him that the cabin could scarcely contain him. His ecstasy produced capering and he soon cleared the cabin of many of our visitors whose numbers had rendered it very hot and unpleasant. He himself soon followed and after strutting some little time upon deck he exposed himself in the most conspicuous places, seemingly with the greatest indifference, though in reality for the sole purpose of attracting the admiration and applause of his subjects. The acclamations that his appearance produced from the surrounding multitude were evidently gratifying to his vanity, yet his joy and satisfaction were incomplete until two in the afternoon, when Mr. Whitby returned and reported that although the anchorage at Tiatatua seemed convenient, yet it was infinitely more exposed than any part of the anchorage at Karakakua. I had by this time understood that the account of Tamama's cannon and fortification was entirely void of truth, and as there could be no hesitation, which of the two situations to prefer, from Mr. Whidbey representation, we steered immediately for Karakakua. Tamama soon became acquainted with my determination the high degree of satisfaction he expressed on this occasion was not easily to be described, as I could not recollect in any former instance ever to have noticed sensations like his in the countenance or behavior of any person. The breeze was too gentle, and the day was too far advanced to reach Karakakua before night, when the general happiness of our party received some small degree of cheek. Notwithstanding the present harmony and the prospect of its continuance, I considered it highly important not to relax in any of the precautions I had taken on former occasions, but to be most vigilantly on our guard and to watch with a jealous eye over the behavior of these ambitious chiefs. Had I permitted any of them to have slept on board, which they are very fond of doing, our caution would naturally have lessened by a continuance of their then docile behavior and had one been admitted to this indulgence. Many others could not, without giving great offense, have been refused. Their numbers might thus have increased beyond expectation, and by distributing themselves unobserved in different parts of the ship, a favorable opportunity might have been seized 
had they been so inclined, when we least expected danger, to carry any ambitious project into execution. Having uniformly adhered to the maxim that prevention is better than punishment, I determined in no instance whatever, so far as it was in our power, to suffer the least temptation to be laid in their way, either in and about the ship or in any of our transactions with them on shore. On this occasion, however, a difficulty arose by Kahomatu having remained on board three nights successively. After explaining that this would not have happened, had not the ship been unavoidably driven to a great distance from the land, the whole party appeared pretty well satisfied, and about dark retired to the shore in high spirits, and in extremely good humour, some of them having taken their grog and wine very cheerfully. Friday 22. By seven the next morning we were abreast of Karakakua Bay. From whence, and the adjacent shores, we were visited by a vast concourse of people, who brought in their canoes the greatest abundance of refreshments, and who seemed to be as eager to exchange them for our articles of traffic, as on the first discovery of these islands. But as we were well stored with such good things, I directed that no more should be purchased until the ship was properly secured. This was effected by noon, the best bower anchor lying to the SSW in 22 fathoms, and the small one, ENE, in 12 fathoms water, soft sandy bottom. The points of the bay lying S5W and N87W, distant from Kakua, the nearest shore, about the length of a cable and half. This village, as already stated, we found to be the residence of Tamar Ma. From whence, before the ship was well secured, eleven large canoes put off from the shore with great order and formed two equal sides of an obtuse triangle. The largest canoe being in the angular point was rowed by eighteen paddles on each side. In this was his Ohihin Majesty, dressed in a printed linen gown that Captain Cook had given to Teriobu, and the most elegant feathered cloak I had yet seen, composed principally of beautiful bright yellow feathers, and reaching from his shoulders to the ground on which it trailed. On his head he wore a very handsome helmet, and made altogether a very magnificent appearance. His canoe was advanced a little forward in the procession, to the actions of which the other ten strictly attended, keeping the most exact and regular time with their paddies, and inclining to the right or left agreeably to the directions of the king, who conducted the whole business with a degree of adroitness and uniformity that manifested a knowledge of such movements and manoeuvre far beyond what could reasonably have been expected. In this manner, he paraded round the vessels with a slow and solemn motion. This not only added a great dignity to the procession, but gave time to the crowd of canoes alongside to get out of the way. He now ordered the ten canoes to draw up in a line under our stern, whilst with the utmost exertions of his paddlers, he rowed up along the starboard side of the ship. And though the canoe was going at a very great rate, she was in an instant stopped with that part of the canoe where His Majesty was standing immediately opposite the gangway he instantly ascended the side of the ship, and taking hold of my hand, demanded if we were sincerely his friends. To this I answered in the affirmative. He then said that he understood we belonged to King George, and asked if he was likewise his friend. On receiving a satisfactory answer to this question, he declared that he was our firm good friend, and according to the custom of the country, in testimony of the sincerity of our declarations, we saluted by touching noses. He then presented me with four very handsome feathered helmets and ordered the ten large canoes that were under the stern to come on the starboard side. Each of these contained nine very large hogs, whilst a fleet of smaller canoes containing a profusion of vegetables were ordered by him to deliver their cargoes on the opposite side. This supply was more than we could possibly dispose of, some of the latter he was prevailed upon to reserve, but although our decks, as well as those of the Chatham, were already encumbered with their good things, he would not suffer one hog to be returned to the shore. The remaining livestock I had on board, consisting of five cows, two ewes and a ram, were sent on shore in some of his canoes. These were all in a healthy state, though in low condition, 
and as I flattered myself the bull would recover, I had little doubt of their succeeding to the utmost of my wishes. I cannot avoid mentioning the pleasure I received in the particular attention paid by Tamaama to the placing of these animals in the canoes. This business was principally done by himself, after which he gave the strictest injunctions to his people who had the charge of them to pay implicit obedience to the directions of our butcher who was sent to attend their landing. At the departure of these canoes, I was unacquainted with the extent of Tamamea's intended compliment. In addition to his magnificent present of provisions, other carnoes were now ordered alongside, from which a large quantity of cloth, mats, and other articles of their own manufacture were delivering into the ship. But we were so much incommoded that there was no possibility of taking care of these valuables, and on promising to receive them on a future day, the king permitted them to be returned to the shore, giving particular charge to one of his attendants, to whom they were entrusted, to be very careful of them as they belong to me and not to himself. This present, though not accompanied by the elegant entertainments that followed those made by Fenow and Paulahau to Captains Cook and Clark at the Friendly Islands, was, however, highly worthy of a generous and noble mind, especially when the manner is adverted to in which it was made as a token of the sincerity of the king's wishes and desire to establish upon a firm and permanent basis our mutual good understanding and harmony and possibly in some measure as a requital for the service I had rendered his country in the introduction of the sheep and cattle. On this score, however, I soon convinced him that I required no return as in so doing I only complied with the directions of my sovereign in his humane and friendly disposition towards them by adding as much as was in my power to their comfort and happiness. These transactions did not pass unobserved by Kahomatu, who strictly attended to every occurrence. He appeared to be much rejoiced at the introduction of the sheep and cattle on the island, yet he could not refrain from observing that he considered it a very unequal distribution to give all the large cattle to Tamamaa and none to himself, Tiana, or other principal chiefs. In reply to these observations, I pointed out that I had already done Tamaama an injustice by giving him Kahumotu, the sheep originally designed for the king. That, under this consideration, he ought to be perfectly contented, and as there was a probability of my returning, that I should endeavor to bring with me a supply of those, and very likely some other useful animals, by which I should have it in my power to oblige him and the rest of our friends in Ohihi. Kahuma, too, paid particular attention to this conversation and seemed to be tolerably well satisfied, which gave me hopes that I should be able to steer a middle course between these jealous chiefs. But whilst we were at dinner, another impediment occurred by the arrival of Tina. On his entering the cabin, I again recognized the identical Tama'ama I had known some years before by the savage austerity and gloom that was now diffused over the countenance of that chief. Tiana was nevertheless received by me with due civility and cordiality, which by the increased sullenness of the king's countenance seemed greatly to augment his dislike to the presence of our new visitor. Tiana presented me with a helmet and desired that I would order some hogs, which were in the canoes that had attended him, to be taken into the ship. These proved to be 15 of the finest animals of this description I had ever seen at any of these islands. But in consequence of the numbers already on board, I was under the necessity of declining them, which could only be done under a promise of receiving them, as soon as our stock on board should be exhausted. With this assurance, Tiana was perfectly contented, but it awakened the envious disposition of Kahomatu, who contended that he was not treated with the friendship I had professed towards him since twenty very fine hogs of his had been returned unconditionally. Whilst I was endeavoring to pacify him by stating that I had no other intention than to accept his kind and friendly present the instant the animals could be received on board, the king who since Tiana's appearance had sat in the most sullen silence and had not uttered a single word, replied with some warmth that I had no occasion for hogs 
or other productions of Ohaihi, from Kahoma to Tiana or any other chief, as he had many more to supply our wants when those which he had presented were exhausted. Under these circumstances of rivalship, it became no easy matter to ascertain and pursue a line of conduct which should be equally agreeable and accommodating to the bountiful dispositions of these contending chiefs. I was, however, fully determined on the measures to be pursued to pay my principal court to Tamahma as the king of the whole island and to treat the other chiefs with a due degree of respect and attention. And though, at first, this sort of conduct might have shown some dissatisfaction, yet I entertained no doubt that it would soon wear away. After this discussion on the subject of pigs and poultry was brought to a conclusion, the king had a short, though serious, conversation with Tiana. The subject matter we did not rightly comprehend, but we understood it to respect his coming from the northwest part of the island without the king's knowledge or permission. On this being settled, some jokes passed between them when the latter gradually resumed his usual cheerfulness and harmony seemed to be again re-established on all sides. Tamama, understanding that I intended to erect the tents and observatory on shore, gave me the strongest assurance that no injury nor offence should take place, provided we would subscribe to such regulations as he should point out. Tending to the preservation of that harmony which so happily existed at the present moment, in consequence of the convenience with which we could lie near to that part of the shore where the tents and observatories of the Resolution and Discovery were erected in the year 1779, on their unfortunate visit to this island, I preferred that station to any other part of the bay for the services we had now to perform. Here, those whose business required their residence on shore would be fully protected by the ship against any surprise or attack from the natives of the country. But this situation we could not immediately occupy, as it was part of the consecrated ground of the Marae, which it was unlawful for us to enter during the continuance of the periodical taboo that was to commence this evening at sunset and to end at sunrise of the 24th, during which interval there could be no communication between the shore and the ship. But as soon as the interdiction should cease, the king promised to return on board after issuing his orders and injunctions that our party should be properly received and sufficiently guarded. Saturday 23rd. The whole of the next day we remained in the most perfect silence. Not a canoe was seen afloat, excepting a few that went out of the bay to take fish. This degree of quiet was a very agreeable change and a great relief to us, having the preceding day been almost stunned by the clamour and intolerable noise of near 3,000 people of both sexes in their canoes or swimming about the vessels. Much to their credit, however, it was in this circumstance only that their company was unpleasant, for they conducted themselves with great honesty and in every other respect behaved with the greatest civility and good humour. On our passage from the coast of America, we had reason to believe that the main mast was materially defective. A fish was here put on that reached from the main deck to the upper part of the cheek, and such other repairs were undertaken as the rigging, sails, etc. required. Sunday 24th. Agreeably to his promise, Tamar Ma, attended by Young, repaired on board immediately after sunrise on the 24th. He informed me that all the necessary directions respecting our tents, etc., were left with persons properly authorized to take charge of them, and that they might be sent on shore whenever I pleased. This was instantly done under the care of Mr. Whidby, and soon after breakfast, accompanied by the King, Mr. Puget, and some of the officers, I went on shore with a guard of six Marines to be left for the protection of our party there. I was made very happy by finding that the presence of such a guard had not been in the least necessary, as the person appointed by Tama Ma, under the immediate directions of Young, who had accompanied Mr. Whidby, had conducted himself with the greatest propriety and had acted in every respect so very conformably to Mr. Whidby's instructions that a guard on shore seemed almost an unnecessary precaution. In point of dignity, however, 
if not of security, I considered such formalities as indispensable, but being well aware of the avidity with which muskets and ammunition were here sought after, I did not lead them into any temptation by sending on shore any spare small arms or the field pieces, left such a valuable booty might stimulate them to a breach of that integrity, which at present seemed to regulate all their actions. Yet, as I did not think it prudent to place unlimited confidence in the sincerity of their professions, the field pieces were mounted on the quarter deck in readiness for action, either in that situation or to be transported to the shore at a moment's notice. The guns were all shotted, plenty of ammunition was at hand, and a small ancher and hawser laid out for a spring on the cable. Four sentinels were always at their posts, with a certain number of small arms kept constantly loaded, and every man in the ship was at all times ready to fly to quarters. These precautions did not pass unregarded by Tamahma, who, in the confidence of our friendship, instead of being displeased, or apprehending any danger from the occasion, highly applauded the measures that were taken, as they would effectually prevent the ill-disposed part of his people from planning or attempting any enterprise to our prejudice. I learned from him that he had issued the strictest injunctions to prevent any offence or cause of complaint arising from any improper conduct or behaviour in his subjects and that he entertained no doubt of their being punctually attended to and obeyed. The king observed, there were persons in the neighborhood who were servants and vassals belonging, not only to the chiefs of the other islands who were his inveterate enemies, but also to many belonging to Ohaihi, who were not better inclined, and conceiving it to be very likely that some of these might think proper to make depredations on our property or to insult our persons he had taken due precaution to prevent any such mischievous design. Fearing left, I might be impelled to seek such redress as would prove fatal to his person or his government, or probably to both. Although he and his people might be perfectly unconcerned in the offense committed. This conversation was urged by Tamahma in the coolest manner, though in the most forcible language, and concluded by hoping that I would cause such measures to be pursued for the regulation of our conduct towards them, as would avoid all possible chance of any misunderstanding. To this end, he made the following requests, that I would give the most positive orders that none of our people, on any account whatsoever, should be suffered to enter their morais, or consecrated places, or be permitted to infringe on their rights or sacred privileges that no person should be allowed to stray about the country, and that I would scrupulously adhere to my practice of admitting none but the principal chiefs into the vessels, and that in the daytime he should be frequently on board. This, he said, would deter the lawless from any improper conduct, whilst in their canoes about the vessels for the purpose of trading, that when any of our people wish to travel into the country, they should first apply to him, and he would appoint a proper person to be their guide, and a number of others in whom he could confide, to protect them, carry their baggage, and render them every service of which they might stand in need, that, under these regulations, as many of the officers and people as were inclined to make excursions, might extend their travels over the whole island, provided they committed no act contrary to the advice of their guides, and he would himself be accountable for their safety and also for their receiving every attention of friendly hospitality. That if any of the natives were daring enough to commit any acts of fraud or were guilty of other irregularities, the offenders should be delivered over to him, by which means a more public example would be made and they would receive a severer punishment than he conceived. It was likely I should cause to be inflicted. Regulations so well concerted and dictated by so much good sense and found policy, could not fail to meet my hearty concurrence and to ensure my utmost exertions to have them duly obeyed. These were all, Tama Ama said, which on his part he had to propose. But he begged that I would make such additions to them as circumstances might hereafter teach to be necessary. Convinced of the advantage, as well as the necessity, of preserving peace with these people, 
not only on the score of humanity, but as it respected our own present and future welfare, it became indispensably requisite that I should leave no object unattended to that was likely to cooperate with the judicious measures the king had concerted. Notwithstanding that the spot on which our tents and observatories were situated became consecrated from its vicinity to, or rather from forming a part of, the Morai, yet it was very much confined and afforded but little room for our people to act in their defense should any sudden change take place and the natives be hostilely inclined. In the event of any misunderstanding, I was by no means certain that the sanctity of the place would render sacred the persons of our party residing within its precincts. And should they be unfortunately cut off, the loss of our instruments and chronometers would certainly follow. Many important objects of our voyage would necessarily be defeated, and consequences of a more serious nature might ensue. These important considerations led me seriously to reflect in what instances the precautions of Tamahma could be strengthened. Little apprehension existed with me, except from the insatiable desire these people possessed for arms, particularly muskets and pistols. These were, apparently, the only temptations to a breach of the subsisting cordiality and friendship, to prevent, therefore, any of these from being thrown in their way by the carelessness of those who might occasionally be permitted to amuse themselves on shore. I gave directions that no one should take on these occasions any arms, excepting a small pair of pocket pistols, which were to be kept entirely out of sight and from the knowledge of the Indians until the moment when self-preservation or any other absolute necessity should call them into action. This restriction was suggested by my own experience in several instances at different islands in these seas, where I have seen even considerate officers, as well as midshipmen, when on shore with a gun, either fatigued by the heat of the climate or disappointed by the want of game, entrust their fouling pieces to an attendant native who would watch for a good opportunity to make off with it, or by holding fear arms carelessly in a crowd of the natives, have them wrenched from their hands and instantly conveyed out of sight. Amongst a much more docile race than those of the Sandwich Islands, the most unpleasant consequences have followed these misadventures. Not only all supplies of refreshments have been stopped, but the blood of innocent natives has been shed on being fired upon for the thief by the companions of the person robbed but amongst these clever, designing, resolute people, worse results were to be expected, especially if any of the dissatisfied and turbulent chiefs should chance to be concerned. This was by no means unlikely to take place, and should they once succeed in any trifling attempt, they might, when wholly unexpected by us, in order to delay or prevent punishment, pursue their object to a fatal and serious end. For the preservation, therefore, of our present happy intercourse, I deemed it expedient and consequently directed that the whole of these regulations should be most rigidly observed. And though they cause some dissatisfaction to inconsiderate individuals, yet for the faithful discharge of His Majesty's service entrusted to my execution, and for the security and happiness of his subjects under my command, I demanded and enforced a strict obedience to these orders as well as those formally issued respecting our traffic with the Indians, which were carried into execution on our first arrival. This morning on shore I met with two seamen, one an Irishman who had deserted from an American trader about three months since, named John Smith. The other, whose name was Isaac Davis, had been unfortunately captured by these islanders in the schooner Fair American, as was noticed on our former visit to Attawai but as the information I then received now seemed to differ materially from the truth, and as the circumstances of this transaction, together with the treatment which this poor fellow and young have since received, reflect not less credit on themselves for their good sense and propriety of conduct than on Tama'ama for his humanity and justice, I shall proceed to state, in the abstract, the report made to me both by Young and Davis and as I have not any doubt of the veracity of either, 
their information will serve in a great degree to illustrate the different characters of some of the ruling people of these islands and prove how requisite it is that every precaution should be taken by visitors to this country from the civilized world. For although I had every reason to be satisfied of Tamama's abhorrence of violence and injustice, yet it did not appear that his authority was always equal to restraining the ambitious desires that governed the conduct of many of the subordinate chiefs. John Young was boatswain of an American snow called the Eleanor, mounting 10 guns, navigated by 10 Americans and 45 Chinese or other inhabitants of that country, and commanded by Mr. Metcalf on a commercial voyage to the coast of Northwest America in the fur trade, in which pursuit Mr. Metcalf had likewise embarked his son, a youth of about 18 years of age, in a small schooner called the Fair American of about 26 tons burthen and navigated with five men, one of whom was Davis the mate. These two vessels had sailed from China and in the year 1789, the Fair American was detained by the Spaniards at Nootka, but the Eleanor came on in the autumn of that year to the Sandwich Islands and remained principally about Owhaihi during the winter. Young stated that in February 1790, they proceeded to Maori, where a boat belonging to the snow, with one man in her, was stolen by the natives from the stern of the vessel. And on a reward being offered for the boat and the man, Mr. Metcalf was informed that the former was broken to pieces and that the latter had been killed. The bones of the man were then demanded which, with the stem and stern post of the boat, were carried on board the snow in about three days. The natives in the meantime had continued to trade with the crew, and after delivering up the remains of the man and parts of the boat, they supposed the anger of those on board was entirely appeased and demanded of Mr. Metcalf the reward he had offered. This, Mr. Metcalf replied, they should soon have, and immediately ordered all the guns to be loaded with musket balls and nails, and having tabooed one feet of the ship in order to get all the canoes on the starboard side next the shore, the ports were hauled up and the guns fired amongst the canoes. The guns between decks, being nearly upon a level with the canoes, did great execution, as did the small arms from the quarter deck and other parts of the ship. On this occasion, Young represented that upwards of an hundred were killed and a great many were wounded. Having thus taken such revenge as he considered equivalent to the injury received, Mr. Metcalf quitted Moe and returned with his vessel to Ohaihi, where to all appearance they were on very good terms with the chiefs and the inhabitants of that island. On the 17th of Inarch, Young had permission to be on shore until the next day when the snow stood close in and fired a gun as a signal for him to return on board. But to his very great astonishment, he found the canoes all tabooed and hauled up on the shore and was informed by Tamama that if he attempted to take a canoe by himself, he would be put to death, but that he should have a canoe the next day. Having no other resource, Young was obliged to submit. And in the evening, he was informed that the schooner Fair American had been captured by Tama Mutu to the southward of Toei Ike Bay and that Mr. Metcalf's son and the four men composing the crew had been barbarously murdered. The snow remained two days off Karakakua, siring guns and standing in shore as a signal for Young. But after the news was confirmed of the schooner having been captured, the king would not permit him to leave the island, but behaved to him in the kindest manner, telling him that he should not be hurt and that he should be at liberty to depart in the next ship that arrived but that he would on no account allow a canoe to go off to the snow, left his people should be killed. Tama Ma, who had been on the strictest terms of friendship with Mr. Metcalf and his people, took Young immediately to his house, where he was treated with every kindness and attention. The king, being excessively concerned and very angry at the late inhuman business, collected a very considerable force and as if he intended to chastise those who should be found the perpetrators of this barbarous transaction, he fat out 
accompanied by Young, on the 22nd of the same month, in order to inquire into the circumstances that could have caused so great a breach of hospitality. The schooner was found in the situation already described, destitute of almost everything that was movable. Tama Ama demanded that the vessel should instantly be delivered up to him, that he might restore her to the proprietor, Mr. Metcalf, should he ever again visit Ohahi. This was complied with by Tama Amutu, who received from the king a very sharp rebuke for the great impropriety of his late conduct in the capture of the schooner and his unpardonable barbarity in murdering the commander and the people, in excuse for which he alleged he had been struck and other ways ill-treated by the father of the unfortunate young man. Here they found Isaac Davis, the mate, still alive, but in a most deplorable condition. Tamama ordered that he should immediately be taken to his residence and gave particular injunctions that he should receive every assistance in their power to bestow. From Davis I learned that he had been treated by Tama Ahma and his attendants with a degree of humanity, kindness and careful attention that he could not have believed these people were capable of showing. The following is his account of the melancholy fate of the younger Metcalf and his people on the capture of the schooner by Tama Mutu which I have every reason to believe is a true and fair statement of that unjustifiable transaction. The schooner, being close in with the land and nearly or entirely becalmed, she was visited by Tama Mutu, a very powerful chief, who was attended by a great number of the inhabitants. Many of these, as well as their chief, made considerable presents to the young commander, and others sold their hogs and vegetables for little or nothing and in order to ingratiate themselves further in the good opinion of Mr. Metcalf, and to gain his permission for their entering his vessel, they told him that the snow was but a little way to the westward, and that he would see his father before night. Davis, who was at the helm, represented the impropriety of this measure to Mr. Metcalf, and said that he thought the behavior of the natives had a very suspicious appearance, but all he could urge was to no effect. The young commander, perfectly satisfied of their friendly intentions, replied that they would do them no harm and allowed as many as thought proper to come on board his vessel. In a few minutes he was seized by Tamamutu, thrown overboard and was no more seen. Davis, having a pistol at hand, snapped it at the chief on his seizing his commander, but it unfortunately missed fire. He was then thrown overboard himself and most inhumanly treated whilst in the water. Dai women stripped him there of his clothes, and the men endeavoured to murder him with their paddles, being other ways all totally unarmed. But Davis, being a good swimmer and a very strong athletic man, escaped from one canoe to another before his pursuers, in order to preserve his life, which he appeared to be incapable of prolonging but for a few moments. At length, exhausted by fatigue and the loss of blood, which had been very considerable from the wounds he had received, he was hauled into a large double canoe. And as they had no weapon or instrument with which they could put him to death, he was held with his throat across the raster that unites the two canoes, whilst the inhuman wretches jumped upon his neck and shoulders with the intention of thus depriving him of life, but still without effect, till, being tired their cruelties, eased to persecute him. After a short respite, he recovered a little, and looking up to the most active of the party, said, Mighty, mighty, signifying good, the man instantly replied, Aroha, meaning that he pitied him and instantly saluted him by touching noses, gave him some cloth, and assisted him to wipe and bind up his wounds. After this, he had no other injury offered to him. On his being taken on shore, he was kindly treated by Harapi, brother to Kahomo too, who nursed him and expressed great concern for his deplorable condition. But Tamahmutu, notwithstanding the state he was in, took him in triumph through the village and made a jest of him. Davis further stated that Tamahmutu took everything out of the schooner that he possibly could before the arrival of the king and young, that he was rejoiced to see the latter and thought he had come from the snow to fetch the schooner. But when they met, and he had heard the snow was gone, 
and that young had been informed of the particulars of the late cruel transaction. They were both sitting in the greatest affliction. When the king came to them, caught them in his arms and comforted them, and said that no one should hurt them whilst he could protect them. The king then gave directions that he should be properly taken care of, and told him he was very sorry for what had happened, but that he, Davis, should live with and be protected by him. After this, the king reprimanded Tamamutu in such terms that Davis saw tears in the eyes of the latter. Tamama then took possession of the schooner for the right owner. Although there can be no possible excuse offered in vindication of the unjustifiable conduct of this turbulent and ambitious chief, yet it appears to have been almost as inexcusable on the part of the elder Metcalf that he should have thrown such a temptation in his way. The vessel in question had been a pleasure boat and was lengthened at China. Her gunwale was not a foot higher than that of the double canoes of this country and being navigated and protected by five persons only under the command of an inexperienced young man, she became not less a desirable acquisition to Tamamutu than a prize of easy attainment. To risk, therefore, a vessel so circumstanced amongst a set of Indians whose daring and ambitious character was so well known in every corner of the civilized world must ever be regarded as highly imprudent and inconsiderate. John Young, who was about 44 years of age, born at Liverpool, and Isaac Davis, then 36 years old, born at Millsword, have from this period resided entirely with Tamaya Ma, are in his most perfect confidence, attend him in all his excursions of business or pleasure, or expeditions of war or enterprise, and are in the habit of daily experiencing from him the greatest respect and the highest degree of esteem and regard. Near the Bay of Waiati, the king has given them three very fine estates, and Kahomo too, who is the firm friend of Tamahma, not only from connection, but a sincere regard, and who, from his achievements in war and advice in council, is considered as the second chief in the island, has likewise shown them, on all occasions, the greatest marks of friendship and respect, and has presented each with a very fine estate near the east point of the island. Kavahiro and Komanoa, who are considered the next chiefs in power and authority to the two former, have also treated them both in the most friendly manner, but neither of them could speak of Tiana in the same favorable terms. This chief eyes them with great jealousy and has made some attempts on their lives particularly on the return of Captain Colnett from St. Blas. On this occasion, Captain Colnett, understanding that there were two white men on the island, very humanly desired by letter, that they would repair on board his vessel and that he would afford them all the protection and service in his power, Young and Davis, being extremely averse to their present way of life, concerted a plan for escaping to Captain Colnett's vessel, a measure very contrary to the wishes and inclinations of Tamah Ma, and the chiefs of the island, left revenge for the capture of the schooner should follow their departure, to prevent which they were always very narrowly watched and strongly guarded whenever any vessel was in sight. In reply to Captain Colnett's letter, Young wrote to him and stated how he and Davis came to be on the island, what had happened with respect to the schooner and the means that were used to prevent their escaping. This letter was sent off by one of their attendants who, meeting Tiana, showed him the letter. This Tiana immediately took to the king, and, in consequence of his voyage to China, and having lived so long in the society of Englishmen, persuaded the king that he could read its contents. He pretended that Young and Davis had desired Captain Colnett to get the king into his possession, and to keep him until the schooner and they were delivered up to him, and that he then should kill the king and many more of the islanders. To prevent this calamity, he earnestly advised the king to kill Young and Davis, after which he said, no one would know anything about them but themselves. Captain Colnett, concluding the two men were prevented by the natives from getting off to him, very kindly wrote them another letter and laid that if that they were so circumstanced, he begged they would send for anything they wanted and if he had it, it should be sent on shore to them. To this very kind letter, 
Young wrote an answer and told the man who undertook to carry it on board that the captain would make him a handsome present for so doing. The next day the man returned and said he was afraid to deliver the letter as the king had given orders that every man should be punished with death who should carry anything from either Young or Davis to Captain Colnett. This disappointment determined them, if possible, to effect their escape. They had in their possession two muskets with some powder and shot. They loaded their pieces and sat out. But before they had got near to the waterside opposite to the vessel, they were followed by a great number of the inhabitants, who, being fearful of their guns, did not molest them. Some of the natives, however, endeavoured to prevent their reaching a point that was nearly surrounded by water from whence being near to the ship, they were in hopes of effecting their purpose. In accomplishing this, Young was obliged to strike one man with the butt of his piece, for they did not like to fire, and unfortunately broke its stock. They had not long been here before the king arrived in his canoe, attended by many others. Tamama very dispassionately advised them to return from whence they had come, and said, that he would do anything they could wish to render their lives more comfortable, but that he could not consent they should leave the island, assuring them that his people would rebel and put him to death the instant they took their departure. Tiana, who was present, seemed to be of a different opinion and offered to take Young and Davis on board Captain Colnett's vessel in his own canoe. But the king, well knowing that Tiana only wanted to accomplish their destruction, immediately interposed and in the kindest and most persuasive manner requested they would on no account accept Tiana's offer but that they would return in his canoe with him. The confidence they reposed in Tamama that they should be subject to no inconvenience in consequence of their attempt to escape and the earnestness with which he solicited them to go back with him at length had the desired effect and they both embarked on board his canoe. Davis was in the fore part and Young in the after part of the canoe when they were boarded by many others and Tamaama, observing some violence was likely to be offered to Davis, went forward to rescue him and to prevent any accident took Davis's musket away from him. In the meantime many of the natives fell upon Young who received several wounds before the king could return to his assistance who was obliged to strike several of them with his paddle before they would desist. After this project was defeated, Young and Davis were never suffered to be both afloat at the same time until our arrival, and they were given to understand that the escape of the one would be fatal to the other. This seemed to be a very political measure, as the interest they had in each other's happiness and welfare, and the sincere friendship and regard that subsisted between them, could not escape the observation of Tama Ama, who would readily suggest the expediency of such an interdiction. Thus have Young and Davis since remained, observing that fidelity towards each other, which the true principles of honor dictate under such circumstances. Young and Davis had now been resident in Oahe nearly three years, which had afforded to each of them frequent opportunities of noticing the characters of the principal chiefs and leading people on the island. I derived from them such information respecting the conduct of certain chiefs as may be considered important, at least to those whose pursuits may lead them into these seas. Tiana, they represented as possessing the most turbulent and ambitious disposition with great activity of mind and a thorough contempt of danger. Had his power been sufficient or had his plots and designs been countenanced and adopted by Tamama, they must have proved fatal to many of the small trading vessels that have visited these islands. Ever since Tiana had been settled on Ohaihi with the arms and ammunition he had brought from China, his mind had constantly been directed to the seizing of every small vessel that had arrived amongst them, whilst the plans he had repeatedly concerted for such enterprises had been seconded by his brother Nomataha and Tamahmutu and as uniformly opposed and overruled by Tamahma, Kahosmotu, Kremamahu, and Kavahero. The chief, Komono, was of the King's Pacific Party, had uniformly rejected the counsels of Tiana, and was adverse to his ambitious projects, 
excepting in one instance, that of the capture of the sloop Princess Royal. In justification, however, of his conduct on this occasion, he says the reason that induced him to concur in that enterprise was that the Spaniards had taken the Princess Royal from the English, and therefore he thought there could be no harm in taking her from the Spaniards. Nomataha and Tamahmutu are artful, designing and restless characters, and have dispositions to act on all occasions of hazard or unlawful attempt in conjunction with Tiana. One single instance may serve to show with what art their projects are designed and with what success they are likely to be attended. About two months before the capture of the fair American, whilst Mr. Metcalf was lying with his snow in Karakakua Bay, it was proposed to Tamama by these chiefs to seize the snow, to put as many of her crew to death as they thought necessary, but to reserve a sufficient number to navigate her and to instruct them in the management of such vessels. By this acquisition, so great an advantage would be gained over the rest of the islands, as would make the conquest of them all very easy. For under the power that Tama'ama would then have, they must inevitably be reduced to subjection. The mode proposed by Tiana for the accomplishment of this project was that whilst the crew were engaged aloft in furling the sails after they had been loosed to dry, which, in consequence of the then rainy season, was a daily practice on board the vessel, these chiefs, with others on whom they could depend, being assembled on board for this express purpose, should murder all those who remained upon deck and put as many of the others to death as they considered necessary on their coming down out of the rigging. Tiana reduced the success of this exploit nearly to a certainty, as he had been two or three times on board. The vessel whilst her sails were furling and saw with what ease his plan could be carried into effect. Notwithstanding Tamama revolted at the idea of this barbarous scheme and with great abhorrence rejected the proposals of Tiana, he very fortunately still remained in the neighborhood. For when the projectors, instead of subscribing to the orders of their king and abandoning their cruel design, repaired on board the vessel, Tamahama, on becoming acquainted that they were so assembled, went in person immediately on board and ordered them out of the vessel, adding threats that if they did not instantly comply, he would inform Mr. Metcalf of the danger that awaited him. They denied having visited the ship with any hostile intention, and Mr. Metcalf left the island without having the least knowledge of the conspiracy that had been formed for his destruction, and which had been the case also with the Princess Royal and several other vessels against which their plots had been equally well concerted. But by the timely interference of Tamar Ma, their barbarous projects had been defeated and the lives of many civilized people preserved. On this subject, I had questioned both Tamahma and Kahomotu, who confirmed the information given by Young and Davis. And in addition to it, they stated to me that in council, Tiana was always for war and coercive measures by which conduct he had not only incurred their disapprobation, but that Tamahma had obliged him to quit his former residence in the neighborhood of Karakakua and to retire to the northwest part of the island. Voyage to the North Pacific Ocean and Round the World by Captain George Vancouver. Book the Third, Chapter Six, 1793, February, Monday, 25. No. Having now opened a friendly communication with the chiefs and adopted measures for establishing and preserving the good understanding that had taken place between the inhabitants and ourselves, one thing only appeared necessary to make our situation perfectly comfortable. This was to discover some means of recruiting our supply of water, which Karakakua does not naturally furnish. On visiting the well from which the resolution and discovery had obtained theirs, I found that it contained but a small quantity, and this so excessively brackish that I was fearful of its bad effects on the health of our people. And as there was no better within our reach, I applied to Tama Ahma for his assistance to relieve our wants the vast consumption of water by the cattle on our passage hither, 
made the quantity we now required very considerable, and he was for some time at a loss to devise the best means for procuring a sufficiency. At length he proposed that a certain number of his canoes, each taking one, two or three puncheons, according to their size, should be sent to different places on this side of the island, and there be filled with water brought by the natives in calabashes to the casks at the seaside, from the little wells in their plantations. This plan being determined upon, a dozen puncheons by way of experiment were put into the canoes, the destination of some of which was Tuesday 26th. At that distance, that they were not expected to return in three days. Six of the cocks, however, were brought back full of most excellent water the following morning, for which service those employed seemed amply rewarded by receiving a piece of iron about six inches long and two inches in breadth, being the price fixed by the king for filling each cask, who also directed that the people of the neighborhood should bring down water for sale. This was furnished in tolerable abundance and they acted in this, as in other articles of traffic, with the greatest honesty and propriety of conduct. The king spent the day in visiting the two vessels, though he passed most of his time on board the Discovery, where his observation was constantly awake, and few of our most common operations escaped his notice. All his inquiries were pertinent, directed to useful objects, and calculated to obtain information that would hereafter answer some good purpose. Wednesday, 27th. On missing his early visit the next morning, I received a message from him that an axe and some small articles belonging to the Chatham had been stolen by the women who had been permitted to sleep on board and who bad escape to the shore undetected. Our first knowledge of the theft was by this message from Tama Ahmar, who informed me that the offender a young woman was in custody, and that the instant the stolen goods were recovered, they should be returned to the place from whence they had been taken. This was done about breakfast time, after which he spent the remainder of the day with me and gave me the unwelcome intelligence that the bull for whose recovery I was so very solicitous was dead. On this mortifying occasion, I much regretted that I had not followed the advice of Kahomo too from whose connection with the king I most probably might have relied with perfect security on his offers of taking charge of the cattle at Toyai. Two of the young cows, however, appeared to be in calf. This encouraged me to hope that his loss would be repaired by one of them bringing forth a male. The finest of the two ewes, I was now informed, was killed by a dog the day after the cattle were landed, whose life was instantly forfeited for the transgression. Our plan for procuring water answered very well. The casks were taken the greatest care of and were punctually and regularly returned, so that by this evening we had acquired eight tons of excellent water. Thursday 28th. On Thursday afternoon, Kearney Cuberry, the unfortunate widow of the late Terriabu, favoured me with a visit. After lamenting the death of her husband and witnessing nearly the extirpation of his whole race, she had survived to this time in a state of captivity. Under these melancholy circumstances, she had met in Tama Ahma not only a humane and generous conqueror, but a friend and a protector. During the conflict at the revolution, he was under the necessity of using some violence to shelter her from the revenge of his nearest relations and the fury of the mob, who loudly demanded her immediate execution and the lives of all her husband's adherents. Although on my visit to these islands in the year 1779, she was then advanced in life, yet I perfectly recollected the features of her countenance, the high degree of sensibility and vivacity it then possessed, now too plainly bespoke the sorrow and dejection she had since experienced. In a very feeble, saltering voice, she said that we had been formerly acquainted, that she had come with Tamama to pay me a visit and see the ship presenting me at the same time with a small feathered cap, which was all she had now in her power to bellow. My name was perfectly familiar to her, but my person was so altered that it was some time before she was quite reconciled to the change that 14 years had produced. 
Curiosity induced her to visit most parts of the ship, and whilst she was so engaged, a slight degree of cheerfulness seemed to obtrude, and for a moment appeared to suspend the weighty afflictions that her declining years were scarcely able to sustain. Satisfied with the surrounding objects, and gratified in her inquiries after many of the officers and some of the people of the resolution and discovery, I presented her with an assortment of valuables, suitable to her former distinguished situation, and obtained from Tamaa Ma'a a most solemn promise in her presence that the articles I had given her should not be taken from her by himself or any other person. Friday 1st. Kahao Motu, who with a part of his family had been our constant visitors in the clay time and whose good offices had been uniformly exerted to the utmost of his ability in our service, took a very friendly leave on Friday morning for the purpose of collecting such things as would be most acceptable to us after quitting Karakakua, it being my intention to visit Toyai previously to my departure from this island. On this occasion, I presented him with some useful articles that were highly acceptable to him, particularly a suit of sails made of old canvas for his largest canoe, and a cloak of scarlet cloth made after the fashion of that I had given to Tamama, but not quite so gaudily decorated. Mr. Menzies, who had departed on Monday in pursuit of botanical researches, accompanied by one of the midshipmen of the Discovery, on an excursion into the country, returned to the ship this morning. He had been attended by a guide and eight people appointed for that purpose by Tama Ahma. From these people he had received the greatest attention and civility, and through all the inhabited parts of the country they had passed, had been treated with the utmost respect and hospitality. Saturday 2. Most of our material business being by this time accomplished, our wood and water completely replenished. And finding that on application to the chiefs a sufficient quantity of refreshments were instantly supplied, I annulled the order prohibiting a general barter and gave permission for the purchasing of curiosities. Sunday 3rd. Accompanied by Tamahma and some of the officers, I visited the three villages in this bay, and first of all the fatal spot where Captain Cook so unexpectedly and so unfortunately for the world yielded up his valuable life. This melancholy and ever to be deplored event, the natives are at much pains exactly to represent, to produce reasons for its taking place, and to show that it fulfilled the prophecies of the priests who had foretold this sad catastrophe. But as these are matters that require further examination, I shall defer them to future consideration. At this place, as well as at the other villages, the inhabitants, who were very numerous, behaved with the utmost civility and decorum. It may not, however, be unimportant to observe that we repaired on shore with both boats well armed, our men dressed, as was the usual practice on a Sunday, in their best attire, and with a guard of marines. Possibly our appearance had some influence on their general behaviour, though for my own part I entertained not the least suspicion that such protection was at all necessary. The vanity of Tamar Ma was, however, highly gratified by the parade, and he much regretted that he had not an English dress to wear upon this occasion. For this, he bad substituted a garment I had given him that had not before been exposed to public view which much attracted the notice and applause of the surrounding multitude. Tiana, with several other chiefs, were also present. The latter had every appearance of a cheerful and happy disposition, but the countenance of the ambitious Tiana could not conceal the envy he felt in not being treated with the same degree of respect that was shown to his sovereign. His jealousy became conspicuously evident in our walk through the village by his asking in a surly tone of voice why I gave that man so many things and himself so few. This I endeavoured to explain, though possibly not entirely to his satisfaction. Nothing worthy of notice occurred during our perambulation on shore, which being ended, we returned on board to dinner. Notwithstanding we had completely finished the principal business of refitting the vessels, yet as I considered the meridian of this place to have been accurately and unalterably fixed by Captain Cook and Captain King for the better regulation of our chronometers, 
I much wished for the further observations of a day or two at the observatory, and having promised to give the king an entertainment with fireworks, that exhibition was fixed for Monday evening, and that he might contribute to the pleasures of the day, he proposed to have a sham battle on shore in the afternoon between such of his best warriors as could be assembled on so short a notice. Monday 4. As soon as dinner was over on Monday, we were summoned to this review. And as Tamama considered all ceremonies and formalities on my part as adding to his consequence, he requested that I would be attended on shore by a guard. We found the warriors assembled towards the north corner of the beach, without the limits of the hallowed ground. The party consisted of about 150 men armed with spears. These were divided into three parties nearly in equal numbers. Two were placed at a little distance from each other. That on our right was to represent the armies of Titeri and Tayo. That on the left, the army of Tamahma. Their spears on this occasion were blunt pointed sticks about the length of their barbed ones, whilst on each wing we were to suppose a body of troops placed to annoy the enemy with stones from their slings. The combatants now advanced towards each other, seemingly without any principal leader, making speeches as they approached, which appeared to end in vaunts and threats from both parties, when the battle began by throwing their sham spears at each other. These were parried in most instances with great dexterity, but such as were thrown with effect produced contusions and wounds, which, though fortunately of no dangerous tendency, were yet very considerable. And it was admirable to observe the great good humor and evenness of temper that was preserved by those who were thus injured. This battle was a mere skirmish, neither party being supported nor advancing in any order but such as the fancy of the individuals directed. Some would advance even from the rear to the front where they would throw their spears and instantly retreat into the midst of their associates or would remain picking up the spears that had fallen without effect. These they would sometimes hurl again at the foe or hastily retreat with two or three in their possession. Those, however, who valued themselves on military achievements marched up towards the front of the adverse party and in a vaunting manner bid defiance to the whole of their adversaries. In their left hand they held their spear, with which in a contemptuous manner they parried some of those of their opponents, whilst with their right they caught, others in the act of flying immediately at them, and instantly returned them with great dexterity. In this exercise no one seemed to excel his Ohaiheen majesty, who entered the lists for a short time and defended himself with the greatest dexterity much to our surprise and admiration in one instance particularly against six spears that were hurled at him nearly at the same instant three he caught as they were flying with one hand two he broke by parrying them with his spear in the other and the sixth by a trifling inclination of his body passed harmless this part of the combat was intended to represent the king as having been suddenly discovered by the enemy in a situation where he was least expected to be found, and the shower of darts that were instantly directed to that quarter were intended to show that he was in the most imminent danger. Until advancing a few paces, with the whole body of his army more closely connected, and throwing their spears with their utmost exertion, he caused the enemy to fall back in some little confusion, and he himself rejoined our party without having received the least injury, the consequences attendant on the first man being killed or being so wounded as to fall on the disputed ground between the contending armies were next exhibited. This event causes the loss of many lives and much blood in the conflict that takes place in order to rescue the unfortunate individual who, if carried off by the adverse party dead or alive, becomes an immediate sacrifice at the moray on this occasion, the wounded man was supposed to be one of Titteri's soldiers, and until this happened, no advantage appeared on either side. But now the dispute became very serious, was well supported on all sides, and victory still seemed to hold a level scale, until at length the supposed armies of Tayo and Titteri fell back, whilst that of Tamar Ma carried off in triumph 
several supposed dead bodies dragging the poor fellows who already had been much trampled upon by the heels some distance through a light loose sand and who notwithstanding that their eyes ears mouth and nostrils were by this means filled were no sooner permitted to use their legs than they ran into the sea washed themselves and appeared as happy and as cheerful as if nothing had happened in this riot-like engagement for it could not possibly be considered anything better the principal chiefs were considered to bear no part and on its being thus concluded each party sat quietly down on the ground and a parley or some other thought of conversation took place the chiefs were now supposed to have arrived at the theater of war which had hitherto been carried on by the common people only of both parties a very usual mode of proceeding i understood among these islanders they now on both sides came forward guarded by a number of men armed with spears of great length called palaloos these weapons are never relinquished but by death or captivity the former is the most common they are not barbed but reduced to a small point and though not very sharp yet are capable of giving deep and mortal wounds by the force and manner with which they are used. The missive spears are all barbed about six inches from the point and are generally from seven to eight feet long. The warriors who were armed with the Palaloos now advanced with a considerable degree of order and a scene of very different exploits commenced. Presenting in comparison to what before had been exhibited a wonderful degree of improved knowledge in military evolutions. This body of men, composing several ranks, formed in close and regular order, constituted a firm and compact phalanx, which in actual service, I was informed, was not easily to be broken, having reached the spot in contest. They fat down on the ground about 30 yards asunder and pointed their palaloos at each other. After a short interval of silence, a conversation commenced, and Tayo was supposed to state his opinion respecting peace and war. The argument seemed to be urged and supported with equal energy on both sides. When peace under certain stipulations was proposed, the Palaloos were inclined towards the ground, and when war was announced, their points were raised to a certain degree of elevation. Both parties put on the appearance of being much upon their guard and to watch each other with a jealous eye whilst this negotiation was going forward which however not terminating amicably their respective claims remained to be decided by the fate of a battle nearly at the same instant of time they all arose and in close columns met each other by flow advances this movement they conducted with much order and regularity frequently shifting their ground and guarding with great circumspection against the various advantages of their opponents, whilst the inferior bands were supposed to be engaged on each wing with spears and slings. The success of the contest, however, seemed to depend entirely on those with the Palaloos, who firmly disputed every inch of the ground by parrying each other's lunges with the greatest dexterity, until some to the left of Titari's centre fell. This greatly encouraged Tamayama's party, who, rushing forward with shouts and great impetuosity, broke the ranks of their opponents, and victory was declared for the arms of Oihi by the supposed death of several of the enemy. These at length retreated, and on being more closely pressed, the war was decided by the supposed death of Titere and Tayo and those who had the honor of personating these chiefs were, like those before, dragged in triumph by the heels over no small extent of loose sandy beach to be presented to the victorious Tamamaa, and for the supposed purpose of being sacrificed at his morai. These poor fellows, like those before mentioned, bore their treatment with the greatest good humor. The first exhibition appeared to be extremely rude, disorderly, and ineffectual, though much dexterity was certainly shown. But from the manner in which the Palaloos were managed, it would seem that they are capable of sustaining a very heavy assault. These military exploits finished towards sunset, and as soon as it was dark, we entertained the king, 
and a large concourse of his people with a display of fireworks. Tama Ma and some of the chiefs recollected to have seen a few indifferent ones that were fired by Captain Cook on his being visited by Teriobu, but ours being in higher preservation, of greater variety and in a larger quantity, were viewed by the several chiefs, who were the only persons admitted within our tabooed precincts with the greatest mixture of fear, surprise, and admiration. And by the repeated bursts of acclamation from the numerous body of the inhabitants assembled on the occasion, it was hard to determine which of these passions most generally preponderated. Tuesday 5th. The following morning, Kavahero, the chief of Kaurua, who was of our party the preceding evening, informed me that on his return home, the inhabitants of that village at first considered what they beheld as a diversion only. But from the time it lasted, and the continual clamor that they had heard, they had become very much alarmed and suspected that some misunderstanding had taken place between us and Tamahma, and that we were destroying him with all his people and houses on this side of the country. The same opinion had prevailed with most of the women who were on board the vessels and who were not easily persuaded to believe other ways. These intimations afforded me an opportunity which I did not suffer to escape, to impress on their minds the very great superiority we possessed, should we ever be obliged to act towards them as enemies. The sky and water rockets, balloons, hand grenades, and etc. I represented to be like guns fired without shot when designed for entertainment, but like them capable of being rendered formidable and destructive weapons when occasion might require. Of this they seemed to entertain no doubt and were anxious beyond me sure to be provided with a few for their protection against Tayo and Titiri. On this subject the king was so excessively pressing that I was induced to indulge him by complying with his request. I gave to the charge of young who with his comrade Davis had so conducted themselves as to be entitled to our confidence. A dozen sky rockets and half that number of effective hand grenades for the sole purpose of Tamama's protection and with the strictest injunctions that they should never be used but with this design. I likewise exhorted them on no pretense to attend Tamama or assist him in any ambitious schemes for the conquest of the neighboring islands but to support him to the utmost of their power, not only in the defense of his island against foreign invasion, but in maintaining his authority against domestic insurrection. I had embraced every opportunity and had met with no little difficulty to convince Tamama and the chiefs who had been our constant visitors that a peaceable mode of life was infinitely to be preferred and more conducive to their real happiness than the continued state of warfare that had so long disgraced their islands without any other motive that could be urged as an excuse for despoiling each other's lands or destroying their fellow creatures than a wild and inordinate ambition to possess themselves of each other's territories, which experience had shown them they were incapable of retaining after conquest. These and similar arguments I had repeatedly made use of for the desirable purpose of bringing about a general pacification with the contending sovereigns of these islands, and had at length succeeded so far as to induce the king and most of the chiefs to give the matter their serious consideration. One obstacle, however, seemed to be insurmountable. The want of confidence in all the ruling parties. Such a negotiation could only take place by personal conference and were a chief to be lent from hence to Maui with full powers to enter upon so desirable a business. It was alleged the people there would have no good opinion of his intentions and considering him as a spy would instantly put him to death. I endeavored to do away this objection by offering to take any chief so empowered on board the ship and to tow his canoe to Moi, where I would protect him and remain until the negotiation was at an end. This was not considered as a sufficient protection as the ambassador would be safe no longer than I should remain on the spot. The business, however, did not rest here for being on shore the day before Kahomotu's departure, I was solicited to attend a council of the chiefs at Tamama's house. 
Here much was said on the subject of the peace I had so earnestly recommended. The king and several of the chiefs seemed to be well convinced of the benefits with which a peace would be attended. On this part of the discourse little was said by Kakomotu or Tiana, but that they were convinced that little confidence could be placed in Titere. They were, however, of opinion that the best method of ensuring success would be that I should take a chief of Ohaihi to Mowi, and having shown to Titiri and Tayo the advantages of making peace, and convinced their minds of the propriety of so doing, and of the inclination of Tamaama to accomplish this happy object, that I should return with Tayo to Ohihi, where they would immediately enter heartily into the business with him, and leave all disputed points to be adjusted by me as the mutual friend of both parties. There was doubtless a great deal of solid sense in this mode of arguing, and probably there was no other mode so likely to have been attended with success. But I was so much pressed for time that it was impossible for me to have made the experiment on my stating that the want of time put it totally out of my power to comply with this arrangement, which I should otherwise have cheerfully acceded to, some conversation that I did not understand passed in a low voice between the king and Kahomatu. After which the former requested, as I seemed so desirous of effecting a peace between the two islands, that I would use my endeavours when I went to Maui to bring this matter about, and that on my return next autumn to these islands, I should visit Maui first. And if I then found the business unaccomplished, should bring Tayo under my protection to Ohaihi, where everything should be adjusted and settled in the manner before proposed. To this I gave no positive answer, wishing first to know on what terms Tamahma would agree to peace. To this it was replied that Moe, Morotoi, and the neighboring islands should be ceded to his sovereignty of Ohaihi in right of his last conquest, and that Titiri and Tayo should remain in the quiet possession of Wohu, Atawai, and the rest of the small islands to leeward. This exorbitant demand I was confident would never be listened to, and I therefore declined having anything more to do in the business until terms should be offered that might incline the opposite party to be desirous of an accommodation. After much conversation respecting the magnitude, population, and fertility of Ohaihi, which was stated to be equal if not superior to all the islands collectively taken. The right which Titeri held in the sovereignty of Maui and its neighboring islands was next discussed, as the possession of these territories appeared to have been in the family of Titeri for many ages. I stated that it was not likely he should easily relinquish his pretensions, and though he might be tempted to do so on certain conditions, at the moment yet after he had re-established his power and recruited his strength in men and canoes, there could not be a doubt, but he would endeavor to reassume the dominions of his forefathers, and then the same devastation and warfare would be again revived. These and other arguments to the same effect induced the king and his counselors to listen to the conditions I proposed. They were founded on the spirit of their original laws and the ancient custom of governing Ohaihi and Mowi, with the islands in their immediate vicinity, at which time, according to their own account, they lived in great harmony and friendship with each other. My first proposition was that Ohaihi should remain a separate and distinct government of itself under the authority of Tamah Maya and his heirs, that Titeri and Tayo should remain in the sovereignty of the other islands, as distinct or foreign dominions, and that the king of Ohaihi should surrender all claim or pretensions to those territories, experience having already demonstrated his inability of retaining conquered countries without endangering his authority and disturbing his peace at home. After due consideration, it was agreed that I should, on my arrival at Maui, use my endeavors to establish a permanent peace on my own principles, and by a letter to Young from thence, informed Tamama with the progress of my negotiation, which they promised to conclude and ratify if a chief, properly authorized, brought the letter from Maui. I avoided noticing this business whilst it was pending, 
in the order of my narrative, under the idea that new objections would arise from after considerations and additional consultations on the subject. All matters, however, now seemed finally adjusted, and it may not be uninteresting to state the circumstances that first gave rise to this disposition towards peace, as I do not claim the merit of the thought having originated with myself. The king and several of the chiefs solicited my assistance in the conquest. They meditated of all the islands to leeward. They entertained great hopes of my concurrence from the friendship I had uniformly manifested, and from the utter abhorrence I had as uniformly expressed of the cruel and horrid murder of our countrymen at Wahoo, belonging to the Diondalus. This vessel they considered as belonging to me, and for the purpose of exciting my revenge and inducing my compliance with their wishes, they alleged that this lamentable outrage was committed in the presence and by the positive order of Titire's brother. This assertion, however, seemed to be intended for no other purpose than to aggravate the crime of their neighbors and to increase our misfortune. And they were not less disappointed than surprised that, notwithstanding the forcible reasons they had urged, I peremptorily refused them any assistance. Instead of encouraging hostilities between them, I pointed out the many important advantages that would result from a friendly intercourse with each other and recommended that a permanent peace should be established with the inhabitants of all the islands. Still, they endeavored to prevail upon me to listen to their solicitations and disregarding the specific measures I had recommended thought to influence my conduct by representing that Mr. Ingraham, commanding the American Brig Hope, on some misunderstanding with Taitiri and Taiyo, had fired several shot at them as they went from his vessel to the shore, and that in consequence of this treatment, those chiefs had given directions to the inhabitants of all the islands under their authority to kill every white man they should meet with, whether English, American, or of any other nation. What impression this intelligence might have made at any other time, I cannot say. But on this occasion, it did not, in the lead, tend to affect my determination, founded on the cause of humanity and many weighty political considerations. Tuesday 6. A general periodical taboo was to take place this evening, and as most of the chiefs our friends had disposed of such matters as they had brought for our service, they took their leave, knowing our departure was nigh, and returned to their respective places of abode. Well satisfied with their visit, and entreating us to return again soon to Ohaihi. The taboo demanded the removal of our tents, observatory, etc. These, of course, were duly received on board, and I acquainted Tamahma that it was my intention to fail on Wednesday night, or the following morning. The king earnestly requested that we should not depart until Friday, as he should then be able to accompany us some distance along the island to the northward. But as the season was fast advancing, I entered into no engagement, but left our stay to the event of circumstances. Tamahma, conceiving this might be his last visit, presented me with a handsome cloak formed of red and yellow feathers, with a small collection of other native curiosities, and at the same time delivered into my charge the superb cloak that he had worn on his formal visit at our arrival. This cloak was very neatly made of yellow feathers. After he had displayed its beauty, and had shown me the two holes made in different parts of it. By the enemy's spears the first day he wore it, in his last battle for the sovereignty of this island, he very carefully folded it up and desired that on my arrival in England, I would present it in his name to his majesty, King George. And as it had never been worn by any person but himself, he strictly enjoined me not to permit any person whatever to throw it over their shoulders saying that it was the most valuable thing in the island of Ohaihi, and for that reason he had sent it to so great a monarch and so good a friend as he considered the King of England. This donation, I am well persuaded, was dictated by his own grateful heart, without having received the least hint or advice from any person whatever, and was the effect of principles highly honorable to more civilized minds. The cloak I received and gave him the most positive assurance of acting agreeably with his directions. Although Tamahma considered himself to be amply rewarded by the different articles I had from time to time presented him with, yet the very essential services he had rendered us, his steady friendship, and the attachment he had shown to our welfare, 
demanded, I thought, some additional testimony of our general approbation. For this purpose, I selected a number of useful as well as ornamental articles. Amongst the latter were two cloaks, similar to those I had before presented him, and a quantity of plain and coloured gartering tape. This was held in great estimation, especially when two or three sorts were sewn together to form that part of their dress called the maro, about three yards long and six inches broad. The useful matters consisted of a variety of culinary utensils and implements of husbandry, with some smiths and carpenters tools. With this acquisition he was greatly delighted and expressed much surprise at the liberality of the present. He then in the most affectionate manner took his leave, not only of myself and all the officers, but of every person he saw on deck, and requesting that I would remain until Friday morning, which however I did not think advisable to promise. He left the ship with considerable reluctance. Amongst those who had accompanied the king on this visit were two chiefs, one named Krimaku, the other Quoti, but more commonly called Kukini, which in their language means quickness. To the care of these chiefs, Mr. Whidbey and the observatory had been entrusted with an additional guard of some natives of the order of the priesthood, each of whom strove to surpass the other in acts of service and civility. The situation that the two chiefs filled and the superiority they possessed afforded them more frequent opportunities than the rest of manifesting their friendly intentions in a uniform steadiness deserving the highest commendation. As an acknowledgement for their services and fidelity, I requested that Tamahma would point out to me such articles as would be most worthy of their acceptance. These were presented to them, and they were highly gratified by this compliment to their integrity. There were none of the chiefs who seemed to feel so much regret on our departure as these two young men. They had been constantly with Mr. Whidbey in the Marquis, and had acquired such a taste for our mode of living that their utmost endeavours were exerted to imitate all our ways, and they seemed so perfectly happy and pleased with our society that they were scarcely ever absent unless when sent for by the king. Their attachment was by no means of a childish nature or arising only from novelty. It was the effect of reflection and the consciousness of their own comparative inferiority. This directed their minds to the acquirement of useful instruction from those whom they acknowledged to be so infinitely their superiors. Their conversation had always for its object important information, not frivolous inquiry, and their questions were of a nature that would not have discredited much more enlightened observers, their vivacity and sensibility of countenance, their modest behavior, evenness of temper, quick conception, and the pains they took to become acquainted with our language and to be instructed in reading and writing, bespoke them to have not only a genius to acquire, but abilities to profit by instruction. It appeared to us very singular that these two young men who were nearly allied to the most inveterate enemies of Tama Ahma, should have been selected by him from the numerous train of favorites attending on his person to be his most intimate and confidential friends. Krimaku, who was about 24 years of age, was son to a chief of the first consequence in Mowi and one of Titeri's principal warriors. In his early infancy, he was taken under the care of Tama Ma, brought up by him, and had for some years past possessed the confidence and been the constant companion of the king, for whose interest and prosperity he entertained the greatest regard, and in return he was inverted by his prince with an authority almost equal to his own. Quote, though not possessing at this time power and authority equal to that of Krimaku, yet seemed to divide with him the affection and esteem of the king. He was about the age of 18 and notwithstanding that he was inferior in point of figure and addressed to Krimaku, whose person and deportment excelled in a great degree any of the islanders we had seen, yet he had a very engaging manner and a pleasing mode of conducting himself. In his intellectual endowments, he seemed to possess a great superiority over Krimaku. This youth was the reputed son of Tere Obu by Namahana, the favorite wife of Kahomotu, 
but report whispered that he was a much nearer relation than that of cousin to Tamahma. Wednesday 6. All our external business being completely finished, little else remained to be done but to bend the sails and get the vessels ready for sea. This service was performed the next day, when all our friends who continued or resided in the neighborhood were in sacred retirement. This taboo was not observed by the lower orders of the people with the same degree of strictness as that mentioned in the preceding chapter. Many of the men were busily employed in their traffic alongside, but no woman was permitted to be afloat. On this occasion, I think it important to state that ever since permission had been granted for a general traffic with the islanders, I had attentively watched its effect and could not have had a better opportunity to be convinced how absolutely requisite it is that a prohibition on a general trade between the crews and the natives should take place on board all European or American vessels until the more important business of procuring the necessary supplies of refreshments, wood and water be accomplished. Whilst the prohibition was in force on board the Discovery, all the essential articles were brought to market and purchased by us as fast as they could conveniently be received and any number of hogs or quantity of vegetables might have been procured during that period. But no sooner were these reductions discontinued and our people at liberty to indulge themselves in the purchase of what at the moment they esteemed to be curiosities, than almost all our essential supplies ceased to be brought from the shore and the few articles of that description which did appear alongside were increased in price four or five hundred percent. Even at that rate, I endeavored to purchase our daily consumption of water, but could not succeed. The depreciation in the value of our own commodities was also the consequence of the permission for a general trade, from the extravagant prices given by the crew in outbidding each other for insignificant articles, which were no sooner possessed than they were neglected, and often in a few days were thrown overboard. Thursday 7th. The weather became cloudy with some rain in the afternoon and the wind was unsteady, blowing in squalls very hard from the northern quarter. This continued all night and in the morning of Thursday brought a very heavy swell into the bay that obliged us, much to the satisfaction of Tamama and our friends on shore, to remain stationary. Soon after Sue's they all stocked round us with their usual affability and friendship. The king, however, was not according to his general practice, amongst the earliest. A delay had been occasioned by his waiting to come off in great state in one of his largest canoes that we had rigged for him with a full suit of canvas sails, sloop fashion, to which I had added a Union Jack and a pendant. But these, not having been placed according to his directions, required alteration, and that they might be quite in proper order he cruised for some time about the bay before he came alongside. On his arrival, we found him highly delighted with his man of war. But he observed that she would make a much better appearance with a few swivels properly mounted. I agreed with him in this opinion. But the words, taboo King George, were sufficient to prevent a syllable more being urged on that subject. Tama'ama, knowing my intention of visiting Kahomotu in my way to Maui, informed me that he had sent directions to the persons on his estates at Toyai to supply us with a full stock of hogs and vegetables and anything else the country afforded, and that he might be certain that his orders would be duly executed. He requested that Young and Davis might attend us thither, as it was impossible for him to absent himself from Karakakua until certain ceremonies had taken place, in consequence of his having celebrated the festival of the new year in this district and of his having transgressed the law by living in such social intercourse with us who had eaten and drank in the company of women. On the evening of our departure, Tama Ahma was to resign himself to the strict obedience of a taboo that was then to commence. On this occasion, all his people who had been in commercial intercourse with us were to lay before him the whole of the treasure they had acquired and to render to him the customary tribute the presence that the king himself had received would also be exposed to public view. 
when certain priests would perform prayers, exhortations, and other functions of their office. These ceremonies frequently continue without stopping, near half a day, and are sometimes repeated ten days successively. Friday 8. On the morning of the 8th, the weather being pleasant, with a gentle breeze from the land, we sailed from Karakaku and stood along shore to the northward. About four miles from our last station, we passed a small creek where we saw the captured schooner laid up and a house built over it to protect her from the sun. About this time, Tama Ma, with his queen and most of his attendants, had overtaken us. I took this opportunity of resuming this unfortunate subject and understood from Tama Ma that it was his intention to return the schooner to Mr. Metcalf, her owner. This Tama Ma promised to do, either to Mr. Metcalf himself or to the commander of any vessel authorized by Mr. Metcalf to receive her. Young bore witness to the king's sincerity and said that this had been his constant language from the moment he became acquainted with the melancholy cattle of her detention. From young we learned that the schooner was now of little value, having nearly fallen to pieces for want of the necessary repairs. The royal party remained on board until about 10 in the forenoon, when, after taking an affectionate leave of us all and expressing the greatest concern at the shortness of our visit, they returned to Karakakua. With a favorable breeze from the southwest, we continued our route to the northward within about two miles of the land. Some rocks and breakers were seen lying about halfway from the shore, off the west point of the island, and extending two or three miles from thence towards Toyai. To the north of these, the bottom is free from rocks, where vessels may anchor, but the situation does not afford any fresh water, and it is besides objectionable on account of its being exposed to the north winds, which, with those that blow from the north westward, are the most violent and dangerous known in this country. Towards the evening, we were pretty far advanced in the bay, where, with a moderate breeze from the land, we plied during the night. Saturday 9th, our friend Kahomotu, agreeably to his promise, visited us the next morning and presented me with 20 fine hogs and a large assortment of vegetables. To these he was pleased to add a very handsome feathered cloak. The servants of the king were very alert in obeying their master's orders and brought 80 very fine hogs for the discovery and half that number equally good for the Chatham with large supplies of vegetables for both. They behaved with the utmost decorum and inquired if any more of these or any other articles would be wanted, adding that if so, they should be immediately provided. This abundant supply was however far beyond what we could possibly require, one third, being fully sufficient for all our purposes. The remainder was therefore directed to be returned to the shore. During the forenoon, we received a visit from Tiana, who brought as a present to me about half a dozen small ill-fed hogs, for which we had neither room nor occasion. He was not, however, dismissed without a farewell present, and such a one, as in my opinion he ought to have been extremely well contented with, since on no one of his visits, which had been very frequent, excepting on the first, had he offered us any refreshments. Yet he had received from me presents nearly equal to those I had made to other chiefs, who had been instrumental in supplying our wants, and anxious on all occasions to render us service. Although Tiana could assume no merit, either for his supplies or services bestowed upon us, yet such was his envious pride that instead of being thankful for what he had not deserved, he could not refrain from expressions of dissatisfaction that he had not been shown the same attention and respect and complimented with articles of similar value to those that had been offered to Tam Ahma. In short, his conversation was in so haughty a stile and so unlike the general conduct of all the other chiefs of Auhaihi that I was induced to request that he would return the scarlet cloak, axes, and a variety of other useful articles I had just before given him. Observing that as these things were in his opinion so inadequate to his claims, they could not possibly be worthy his acceptance. With this request, however, Tiana did not think proper to comply, but departed, 
affecting to be perfectly satisfied and contented, though his countenance proclaimed those designing, ambitious, and, I believe I may with justice add, treacherous principles that apparently govern his turbulent and aspiring disposition. Kohoma too, who was present, expressed the highest disapprobation of Tiana's conduct, saying that if anyone could be dissatisfied, he had cause to complain that such valuable presents had been bestowed on a man who had appeared totally indifferent to our welfare and who had never even endeavored to render us any service. This observation was extremely well timed and was immediately followed by the most grateful acknowledgments for the valuable articles himself and family had received. These, he said, had far exceeded the utmost limits of his expectations. I was not less pleased with the gratitude of Kahomo too than with the assurance of his being so well contented with the selection of things I had presented him, as they were on our part tributes very justly due to his steady, uniform and friendly attention. Mm. Amongst other points of information that I collected at Ohaihi, I learned that Tama Ma, having obtained some intimation of our intended visit, had been excessively impatient for our arrival, that he might obtain an opportunity of displaying his real and true character which he understood had been most unjustly traduced by some of the traders who had visited this island since he had acquired its government. Instructions had been given to several of the masters of the trading vessels by their owners, directing them to be excessively cautious of and vigilantly on their guard against the treacherous, villainous and designing arts of Tama Ahma. These unnecessary admonitions had been explained to him and being conscious of his own innocence, his concern was excessive, and he impatiently looked forward to an opportunity of rescuing his character from such imputations by exhibiting his real disposition to his more candid visitors. If what I have here had occasion to state, respecting the conduct and liberal sentiments of this chief, be not sufficient to wipe away the aspersions that have detracted from his good name, I doubt not of having yet a further opportunity of producing such facts as will effectually accomplish that purpose. Tiana was not ignorant of our prepossession for Tama Ahma's virtues and goodness of heart. This prompted his envy to let no occasion escape for saying something to his prejudice and dishonor, so long as anyone would listen to this favorite topic of his conversation. And it is by no means unlikely that when he had successfully implicated the king by his artful contrivances in his crimes and misdemeanors, he entertained the ambitious hopes to undermine our good opinion by the continual repetition of his calumnies and to engage us to assist him in the destruction of Tamama and the assumption of the government. But on finding that his wishes for royalty and power were not to be gratified by our means, he experienced a disappointment that he had neither prudence to conceal nor fortitude to support. As we had now no further business at Ohaihe, we made the best of our way out of the bay, but calms and light baffling winds rendered our situation nearly stationary. This afforded some of the natives an opportunity of shewing their dexterity in catching a small kind of bonetto, not only an amusing, but a profitable employment. A small canoe is paddled as quick as possible by three or four people, whilst another is in the stern with a fishing rod, a very fine line, and a neat small hook. This hook passing swiftly through the water is taken by the bonetto for a small fish. And to increase the deception, the angler is constantly throwing water about his hook with his hand in order that it may be the less distinctly seen so that almost the instant he throws it into the sea, it is taken by the bonetto. This mode of fishing was conducted with so much dexterity that we saw great numbers taken, but did not observe one that had been hooked to escape. We were not only entertained with the sport, but it furnished an explanation of the general and rigid taboo all over the island at the time we arrived on the coast. It now appeared to have been in consequence of the season, having commenced for the taking of these fish, which are exceedingly good to eat when fresh, and being caught in abundance, make a very considerable part of the food of the inhabitants when preserved and salted. In the evening, Kahoma too, with all the natives, took their leave after assuring us of a continuance of their friendship and expressing the highest satisfaction and happiness at our visit. Our two countrymen, Young and Davis,
bid us also farewell with a degree of reluctance that did credit to their feelings. It may not be improper to state in general terms that I became perfectly convinced that the cause of these two men being left on shore at Owyhee was not desertion nor their own choice, nor did it arise from their having been dismissed by the commanders of vessels under whom they had served for improper conduct and unruly behavior, but from a series of events impossible to foresee or provide against. Their behavior on the island had been meritorious in the highest sense of the word, supporting by their character, for they possessed nothing else, such a degree of consequence that whilst it ensured them the respect, it engaged the affections and regard of the natives and of no one more than of the king himself who did not sail to listen to their counsel and advice and I'm well persuaded we had been much indebted for our very friendly and hospitable reception, as also for the orderly and civil behavior we experienced from the generality of the inhabitants by their attention to the instructions and example of these our countrymen, that they might be encouraged to continue in the exercise of those virtuous principles which they had taught, I gave them a written testimonial of their good conduct, and in the most serious manner enjoined them to persevere in the path that their own good understanding had pointed out and at all times to be useful and assisting to the subjects of every civilized power who might resort to Ao Hai He. From the king and the principal chiefs I obtained a promise of the continuance of their protection not only to their persons but to their property also particularly a large assortment of useful and necessary articles that I had given them as well for their own comfort and for the support of the consequence they had hitherto maintained as for the purpose of introducing such things into use amongst the inhabitants. I appointed to meet the king and his friends with Young and Davis on my return to the islands from the coast of America in the bay between the east and northeast points of Ohihi, where I had been given to understand there was a commodious bay or port that afforded secure and good anchorage. The following astronomical observations made at Karakakua will conclude the narrative of our transactions during our stay at Ohaihi. This island we quitted about eight in the evening and directed our course close hauled towards the east end of Maui. Astronomical observations omitted. Voyage to the North Pacific Ocean and Round the World by Captain George Vancouver, Book the Third, Chapter 7, 1793. March. Sunday, 10. By daylight in the morning of the 10th of March, we were well in with the eastern shores of Maui, extending from S80W to N16E, the nearest moor bore by compass N62W, about a league distant. I was not certain whether the northernmost land thus seen formed the eastern extremity of Mowi or not. From the direction of the coast it so appeared, but its distance to windward of us was so great that it would have required some time to have ascertained the fact, and as we could not accomplish the examination of both sides of the island on this occasion, I availed myself of the prevailing favorable breeze and bore away along the coast about two miles from the shore. This took a direction S, 72 W, distance 16, one two miles from hence to the south point of the island, which is according to our observations situated in latitude 20 degra 34, longitude 203 degra 36 r. Notwithstanding that the appearance of Moe at a distance has been very accurately represented by Captain King, yet, as we had an opportunity of being better acquainted with this part of the island than those on board the resolution or discovery on that voyage, it may be useful to remark that the part we were abreast of at daylight in the morning, though terminating very abruptly in the ocean, and though its surface was very uneven, had yet a verdant and fertile appearance, and was seemingly in an advanced state of cultivation. From the number of villages and distinct houses, we were led to consider it as tolerably well inhabited. This pleasant scene was shortly changed on our advancing a few miles to the westward the face of the country became totally different. The shores and sides of the hills 
had no indications of being inhabited and were almost destitute of vegetable productions. They appeared to be a rude mass of naked barren rocks broken into many deep gullies that extended from the mountains to the waterside. Beside these were many small circular hills that appeared to be composed either of sand or stones and had acquired a very smooth surface of a light brown color. Perpendicular veins separated the different strata and descended down the mountains. These, so far as our glasses enabled us to distinguish, betokened this part of the island to have undergone some violent effects from volcanic eruptions. We passed the south point before mentioned at the distance of about half a mile. It is formed by rugged, craggy rocks, and the sea breaks at a little distance to the northwest of it. On approaching these breakers, we gained soundings and suddenly decreased the depth of water from 25 to 10 fathoms rocky bottom. But on hauling offshore, we almost instantly reached no bottom with 80 fathoms of line. Whilst in this situation, we were visited by a few of the poor natives from a small sandy cove where they had some miserable habitations. The poverty of these people was apparent by their bringing only a few small packages of salt to dispose of and by their canoes being very small and out of repair. Two miles to the northwest of this point, we were greatly inconvenienced by light baffling winds and calm weather, whilst without or to the eastward of us, the trade wind blew strong. We continued to make a flow progress and passed between Morikini and Tahorowa. In the afternoon, we were visited by a chief in the only decent canoe we had yet seen at Mowi. From him, I learned that he was sent by Titiri to inquire who we were and if we had friendly intentions towards the island. On his first question being answered, he seemed instantly to become suspicious of the motives of our visit in consequence of the late murders at Woahu. The reports that had been propagated respecting this unfortunate melancholy business made me desirous of seeing Titere and Tayo in order to obtain from them the real circumstances of this sad affair. This I communicated to the chief and told him further that if the offenders should prove to have been natives, those who were concerned should be given up to justice, but that neither Titere nor Tayo should receive the least injury if I found that they were innocent and as a pledge of my pacific disposition towards Tita Ray. I returned by the chief such a present as I knew would be worthy his acceptance and would be most likely to ensure his confidence in my sincerity. I was not deficient in due acknowledgments to the messenger in order to secure the faithful discharge of his embassy. He informed me that the best anchorage was near the northwest part of the island called Rasina and that if I would proceed thither, Titiri would not hesitate under this and my other assurances of friendship to pay us a visit. These I repeated again, and after telling him that I purposed to anchor near the spot he had pointed out, the chief departed, apparently much gratified with the execution of his commission. Monday 11th. Towards sunset we passed to the southwest of Morakini, and meeting there a light breeze from the end we worked up into a large bay on the southwest side of Moi, lying before the low isthmus that unites the two large lofty bodies of land which compose the island. Here, about midnight, we anchored in 39 fathoms water, muddy bottom, and at daylight on Monday morning found we had taken a station towards the eastern side of the bay, Morokini and the S. E, point of Tahoroa in a line, bearing by compass S, 11 E, the south point of Moi S. 39E, the nearest shore E, by N, two miles, and the westernmost part of Moi in sight N. 56W. The appearance of this side of Moi was scarcely less forbidding than that of its southern parts, which we had passed the preceding day. The shores, however, were not so steep and rocky, and were mostly composed of a sandy beach. The land did not rise so very abruptly from the sea towards the mountains, nor was its surface so much broken with hills and deep chasms. Yet the soil had little appearance of fertility and no cultivation was to be seen. A few habitations were promiscuously scattered near the waterside and the inhabitants who came off to us 
like those seen the day before, had little to dispose of. The weather was cloudy, and the wind at the station we had taken was very unpleasant, in consequence of the trade wind from the N.E., reaching us at intervals in furious squalls over the low land of the isthmus. A strong current setting to the S.E. at the same time obliged us to remain at anchor and wait for a more favorable opportunity to proceed. About noon, we had the company of a chief named Tomoho Moho, who said he was younger brother to Titiri, and that he had come by his orders to conduct us to the best anchorage at Rahena, where Titiri himself would shortly meet us. Tomohomoho produced a certificate from Mr. Brown of the Butterworth, recommending him as a very useful, friendly, and honest man. His canoe was a very fine one. This he requested might be towed astern of the ship, which he recommended should get under sail, that we might arrive before dark at Rahaina. But in the event of any delay, directions had been given for fires to be made in such situations, as would enable him to place the ship with security. As the wind and weather were more settled, these requests were complied with, and thus, provided with a pilot, the Chatham and ourselves stood across the bay under double reefed topsails until we had shut in the isthmus, when, the high land intercepting the current of the trade wind, the galley was succeeded by light baffling airs. With these and the assistance of the lights on the shores, we arrived at our destination about half past eight in the evening, when we anchored in 25 fathoms water on a bottom of sand, stones, and coral. Tuesday 12th. The next morning we discovered our situation to be in the place pointed out in our former visit to these islands by Mr. Broughton, who then mentioned another anchoring place in Mowi, a little to the southward of a remarkable round hill on a sandy beach projecting its rocky base into the sea. Its top, having the appearance of a crater, acquired for it the name of Volcano Hill. It lies N26W, about a league from the south point of Moe, directly opposite to the barren and uninhabited islet of Morokini, which lies something more than two miles from the shore of that bay. Here Mr. Broughton had sound regular foundings from 25 to 15 and 7 fathoms within half a mile of the beach, sandy bottom. The beach, about half a mile long, appeared very convenient for landing upon, but I was given to understand by our pilot and others of the natives that good water was not to be procured even in small quantities within a considerable distance and that its neighborhood was very barren and thinly inhabited. In this roadstead, we were pretty well protected by the surrounding land, excepting towards the SSW, in which direction the wind seldom, if ever, blows violently. The volcano hill bore by compass S54E, Morokini S46E, Tahovroa S355E, 2S7E, Ranai S54W, 2N78W, the westernmost part of Moratoi in sight, N66W, and of two low projecting points of land from the shore of Mowi, forming the points of the roadstead, the northernmost bore, N. 26W, distant four miles and a half, the southernmost, S64E, distant live miles, and the nearest shore, NE by E, half a league distant. The village of Rahaina is of some extent towards the northwest part of the roadstead. It seemed to be pleasantly situated on a space of low, or rather gently elevated land, in the midst of a grove of breadfruit, coconut, and other trees. To the eastward, the country seemed nearly barren and uncultivated, and the shores were bounded by a reef, on which the surf seemed to break with so much force as to preclude any landing with our boats. In the village, the houses seemed to be numerous, and to he well inhabited. A few of the natives visited the ships. These brought but little with them, and most of them were in very small, miserable canoes. These circumstances strongly indicated their poverty and proved what had been frequently asserted at Ohaihi, that Maui and its neighboring islands were reduced to great indigence by the wars in which for many years they had been engaged. Our native pilot seemed very proud of the confidence we had reposed on his skill in conducting the ship to this anchorage and that the situation he had chosen in the night now met our approbation. 
From the moment of his coming on board, he had pleaded the cause of Titeri and Tayo with all his eloquence and gave a positive contradiction to the reports in circulation of the murders having been premeditated by them at Wahoo and committed by their express orders for the sole purpose of revenging a difference that had happened between them and Mr. Ingraham. These reports, he said, he was well aware prevailed at Ohaihi, but he denied them in the most positive terms and asserted that the conduct of the people at Wahoo, instead of being sanctioned by their chief, had incurred his highest displeasure, and that Titiri, on being informed of the event, sent immediate orders that the offenders should be put to death, and that in consequence of these orders, three men, who were principally concerned, had been executed. This led me to inquire of Tomahomaho if three people only had been implicated in that barbarous transaction. To this he replied that there were three or four more considered as equally guilty, but that these had found means to escape and had slid to the mountains, where they had eluded their pursuers for such a length of time that any further search had been discontinued and the offense had blown over and was nearly forgotten. I had understood at Ohaihi that three of the principal offenders concerned in the murder had been put to death by the orders of Titiri, and if we revert to the circumstances attending our visit in last March, several months subsequent to the dispute with Mr. Ingraham, it is more than probable that had any such sanguinary directions, as have been already mentioned, been issued by Titiri, they must have been equally in force at the time we were there as on the arrival of the Daedalus not long after our departure. And though I must confess that our reception at Wahoo did not impress me with the most exalted opinion of their friendly and hospitable intentions, yet they did not appear to use any means for carrying such orders into effect. Although they had frequent opportunities in the course of our walks through the plantations where they could easily have interrupted our retreat. But, admitting that the people of Wahoo were under such injunctions as some have pretended and that we were indebted for our preservation to the small force that attended us or because that day was tabu puri or a day of rest and prayer yet these arguments would be insufficient on many accounts for they could not be reconciled with the friendly trusty and honorable conduct pursued by the chiefs and people on our visit to Atawai, particularly on the evening of our departure. Such behavior towards us could not possibly have been observed by a people who were under orders from their king to kill every white man who might come within their power. These circumstances duly considered render it more than probable that Titeri and Tayo were innocent of the contrivance and not concerned in the perpetration of the murders at Wawahu. The different mercantile people who had visited these islands since that unfortunate period had taught the natives to apprehend the horror and detestation with which we regard unprovoked assassination. They had apprised them of the difference between our ships and the trading vessels that had touched here for refreshments, that we acted not from the orders of any private individual but under the special authority of our sovereign who had given me power to take cognizance of all such circumstances and to requite the barbarity of the natives with the severest punishment. No hint whatever of this nature had ever escaped my lips since the moment I had to deplore the melancholy transaction. I was nevertheless fully determined in my own mind not to omit making every inquiry, nor to suffer the crime to pass unnoticed, and at the same time to pursue such measures as might appear most likely to prevent in future such unpardonable and savage proceedings. To the minds of the natives, it now appeared a matter of great national concern. And in that point of view, it was considered of such importance as to demand from me the most particular investigation and the most serious attention. Being thus fortunately possessed of so much essential information from Tomohomoho, I considered myself to be fully provided to meet Titiri on this distressful subject especially as I had heard with great satisfaction from Tomohomoho that the unfortunate commander of the Daedalus and his party had been guilty of no offense whatever to provoke the untimely fate they had so unjustly met. 
I now came to a determination of insisting with Titeri that the remaining offenders should be brought to justice. Not by any measures of force in our power, but by their own means. That, on their conviction, the cause of their punishment should be clearly and satisfactorily made known to the islanders, with assurances that no distance of time would in future secure any from detection, or prevent the punishment which such crimes demand. A pusillanimous conduct on an occasion of this nature could not sail to sink the character of Europeans into the lowest contempt, and atrocities would become more frequent, either to satisfy the passions of the avaricious or licentious, or the revenge of any individual who might think proper to take umbrage if not indulged in every whim that his fancy might dictate, to the disgrace of human nature and the destruction of the adventurers engaged in the commerce of the North Pacific Ocean. In undertaking to negotiate a peace on a firm and broad basis between Ohaihi and all the contiguous islands, my views were directed to the advantage as well as to the general happiness of the inhabitants on all the islands. The new impressions my mind had received tended to convince me of the important necessity for such a measure, were it only to recover the people of Moi from the deplorable condition to which they had been reduced by an eleven years' war. And, uh, notwithstanding that they had not fought a single battle during the last two years, yet the detriment sustained by the contending parties was almost equally great to guard their respective dominions, Tamaama on the western parts of Oihi and Titiri on the eastern side of Maui, had each assembled a large body of men. By these means, not only those parts were greatly impoverished and exhausted of supplies for the maintenance of those forces, but the inhabitants being drawn from their homes in the different districts of the country, the land was necessarily neglected and the produce of the foil was lost for want of people to carry on its cultivation. The war and the vast supplies that the half-famished trading vessels had recently drawn from some of these islands had left a very scanty portion for the remaining inhabitants of Maui and the other islands under the authority of Titere and Tayo. And this information was communicated to me by several respectable chiefs at Ohaihe and was now fully confirmed by Tomohomoho, particularly as to Maui and Moratoi. He stated these as having been the principal feats of Tama Maya's wars, and that Ranai and Tohoroa, which had formerly been considered as fruitful and populous islands, were nearly overrun with weeds and exhausted of their inhabitants. Nor had Ohaihi escaped the devastation consequent on her foreign and intestine disputes, which had been numerous and severe. Every hour produced some new intelligence to convince me of the necessity of bringing if it were possible, to an immediate conclusion, the ambitious pretensions of these sovereigns. Being now decidedly of opinion that a continuation of such commotions would soon desolate these islands and render them incapable of affording those abundant and excellent supplies we had constantly derived and without which the English traders would be ill-qualified to maintain the commerce of Northwest America. Whereas, if peace could be happily established, and the inhabitants be prevailed upon to be satisfied and to live in harmony and good fellowship with each other, they would readily return to their habitations and to their former employments of cultivating the land and the other peaceful arts. These occupations would be immediately resumed with great energy and the ability of procuring European commodities for the purpose of imitating our manners and fashions by the produce of their own labor and ingenuity would stimulate them to an industry and exertion that would be attended with so abundant an increase of productions as would render the supplies of these islands almost inexhaustible, especially as the breed of black cattle, sheep and goats already introduced when established under such happy circumstances would soon greatly increase. These ideas I communicated to Tomohomoho, who listened to them with the greatest attention and expressed much pleasure in looking forward to so happy an event, and assured me that Titiri and Tayo would gladly accede to the measures I had to propose, but that Kahomotu and Tiana were not to be trusted. In the forenoon we were visited by a young man, a citizen of the American States, 
who said that he had deserted about three months before from the same American vessel that Smith, whom we found at Ohaihi, had left in consequence of the ill treatment received from his commander, that he was now in the service of Titieri and his principal business was to visit such ships as might arrive at the island and to order them such supplies of wood, water and refreshments as they might have occasion for without their commanders having the trouble of bartering with the natives and that on the departure of such vessels some small acknowledgement to Titiri the king only was expected that in virtue of his appointment he had done us the favour of issuing his directions to this effect. We afterwards found however that his authority as purveyor had been unjustly assumed and that his orders were issued to no purpose. He likewise stated that he was directed by Tita Ray to acquaint me that he was on his way towards the ship but that his age and infirmities prevented him from traveling otherwise than very slowly. This message made me entertain some suspicion that the king had doubts of my sincerity and I therefore desired that Tomohomoho would either go himself or send some trusty person to dispel any groundless apprehension that Titeri might be under. To this request he instantly replied with a smile that Titeri, conscious of his own, in a sense with respect to the offense committed at Wahoo, would have no thought of objection to trust himself in our power. And that he, Tomohomoho, had received positive directions to remain with us until the arrival of the king to prevent any improper behavior of the natives. All this was corroborated by a chief named Namahana, who, with his wife, were far the handsomest couple we had seen on these islands. He was next in consequence to Titiri, and possessed at that time in Mowi almost the sovereign power over its inhabitants. Of these but few visited us, who brought nothing to dispose of accepting such articles as our people deemed curiosities. They conducted themselves with great propriety, and the little traffic that was entered into was carried on with the greatest honesty. Wens. 13. Med on Wednesday afternoon we were honored with the presence of Titiri, who I was given to understand was considered as the king of all the islands to leeward of Ohaihi and that from him Tayo derived his authority. There seemed, however, nothing in his character or appearance to denote so high a station, nor was his arrival attended by any accumulation in the number of the natives on the shores or in the canoes about the vessels. He came boldly alongside, but entered the ship with a fort of partial confidence, accompanied by several chiefs who constantly attended him. His age, I supposed, mud have exceeded sixty. He was greatly debilitated and emaciated, and from the color of his skin, I judged his feebleness to have been brought on by an excessive use of the Ava. His faltering voice bespoke the decline of life, and his countenance, though sorrowed by his years and irregularities, still preserved marks of his having been, in his juvenile days, a man of pleasing and cheerful manners, with a considerable degree of sensibility, which the iron hand of time had not yet entirely obliterated. Amongst the articles I presented to Titiri on this occasion was a cloak similar to those I had given to Mahma. This highly delighted him, and he was also well pleased with the other presents he received. In proportion to their rank and the situations they held, his whole suite were complimented and all seemed well satisfied with their visit. After a short conversation respecting the stay I purposed to make at Mowi, and islands to leeward with other miscellaneous matters. I introduced the subject of a peace with Ohaihi and was attended to with great earnestness, not only by the king, but by the whole of his attendants, who seemed unanimously desirous for the accomplishment of so beneficial an object and a measure so important to their future happiness and tranquility. They appeared to be perfectly convinced of my good intentions as a mediator but the same want of confidence prevailed here as at Auhaihi. They all agreed that no faith could be reposed in the integrity of the Auhaihin chiefs, and that if peace was again restored, the several chiefs who had been assembled in Mowi for their general protection would retire to their respective islands, and Mowi and its dependencies would be again left open to the invasion of Tamama, whose unconquerably ambitious spirit, they said, 
would not allow him to neglect so favorable an opportunity. I endeavored to combat these prejudices by every argument I could make use of and assured them that I firmly believed the Tamahma. And the people of Ohaihi were as desirous of peace as they could possibly be, that the king was sincere and that I was convinced he would mod religiously abide by such conditions as might be mutually approved. Our deliberations, however, drawing to no conclusion, it was agreed to adjourn the subject until the arrival of Tayo from Morotoy, who was expected in the course of the following day. The royal party appearing to be perfectly satisfied of our friendly intentions, I demanded of Titiri what offence had been committed by the late Mr. Hergest and Mr. Gooch to occasion their having been put to death. To this question they all replied, that neither of those gentlemen, nor any other person belonging to the Daedalus, had, to their knowledge, been guilty of any offence whatever. I then requested to know what was the reason of their having been murdered without any provocation on their part, and who was the chief that gave orders for that purpose, or that was by any other means the cause of their losing their lives. This question was also answered by the solemn declaration of the whole party, that there was no chief present on that melancholy occasion, nor was any chief in the least degree concerned, but that the murder was committed by a lawless set of ill-minded men, and that the instant Titire had become acquainted with the transaction, he had ordered all those who had been principally concerned to be put to death and in consequence of his directions, three of the offenders had suffered that punishment. I then desired to know if three people only had been concerned. The king then replied that many were present at the time, but that only three or four more were concerned in the murder, who would likewise have suffered death had they not found means to escape to the mountains where they had secreted themselves for some time but that he understood they had returned and were now living on or near an estate belonging to Tomohomoho. These protestations, corresponding with the evidence before related, induced me to give credit to the asserted innocence of the chiefs and the guilt of the persons criminated by them. As punishment ought to fall on those alone, I demanded that three or four who were known to have been principals in the horrid act should be fought and punished according to the heinousness of their crime, not by us, but by themselves, without the least interference on our part, and that the punishment of the murderers might be made as public and impressive as possible, I recommended that it should take place alongside of the ship in the presence of the natives, and that the spectators, as well as all the absent inhabitants of the several islands under the jurisdiction of Titiri or the inferior chiefs, should be made thoroughly acquainted that the criminals had been punished for having been guilty of murder or for aiding and assisting therein, and for that crime only, and that in future neither chiefs nor private individuals who might commit such acts of barbarity should be excused or escape similar punishment, be the distance of time ever so great, so long as the offending parties had life or the English continued to visit these islands. These propositions met not the smallest opposition, but on the contrary, much to the credit and honor of the whole party, were readily and cheerfully agreed to in every particular. This being the case, I desired that a chief might be appointed to attend us for the purpose of carrying these resolutions into effect and causing justice to be properly executed. After a short consultation, Titeri nominated Tomohomoho and invested him with due authority, not only for this function, but for the supplying of our wants, as far as the country might be able to afford. Being desirous that a more minute survey of this side of Moi should be made in the boats, I acquainted Titiri with my wishes, and in order that thefts or other improper behavior might not be experienced from the different islanders they might meet, I requested that a chief should be appointed to attend the expedition Titiri replied that the orders he had issued were sufficient to answer every purpose, but that if I was particularly desirous of the attendance of a chief, 
Tomohomoho should undertake the charge. Matters being thus arranged, Mr. Whidbey received my directions to proceed on this service in our cutter, accompanied by that of the Chatham, which took place accordingly early the next morning. Thursday 14th. In the forenoon of Thursday, we were again favoured with the company of Titiri and his party. Whilst our boats were engaged in the survey, Mr. Menzies wished to make an excursion into the country, and on his desire being made known to the king, together with mine, that a chief might be appointed to accompany him who should be answerable for the behaviour of the natives, Tomowa, the chief of the district, with a young chief called Tiawani, were accordingly nominated for his guides and protectors. This young chief was one of the king's sons. He appeared to be about 15 years of age, was well made, and had a pleasing, sensible, and open countenance. If the American sailor's information could be depended upon, this young prince was invested with very considerable power and authority. Thus guarded, Mr. Menzies, with two or three of the gentlemen and the American sailor, sat out, relying with confidence upon the declaration of the king, for experiencing every civility and attention they could possibly require. Titiri, considering himself under an obligation to make some return for the handsome present he had received, brought me four small lean hogs with a few vegetables, accompanying them with many apologies, stating that his poverty prevented him from making such acknowledgments as his inclination directed or his situation demanded. The present reduced condition of the island and consequently of his wealth had been wholly occasioned, he laid, by the ravage of Tamama's forces, who, not content with the vast quantity of provisions consumed during their stay in these islands, nor with loading their canoes with the productions of the soil, had laid waste the lords on all sides, broken the fences of the plantations, thrown down the banks of the little canals made for watering the crops, which were torn up by the roots, and that all the hogs, dogs, and fowls that could not be carried away were killed or dispersed over the country. Such was the deplorable account he related of the distressed situation of Muwi and the neighboring islands. This had hitherto so humbled and broken the spirit of the people that little exertion had been made to restore these islands to their accustomed fertility by cultivation. And they were at that time under the necessity of collecting provisions from Wahoo and Atawai for the maintenance of their numerous army on the eastern parts of the island. I expressed my concern for the calamitous state of his dominions and took that opportunity of again pointing out the beneficial consequences that would result from a peace with Tamama and that nothing short of this could remove or repair those serious disasters of which he so justly complained. And as I considered that the present he had brought me, though in itself small, might possibly have put him to inconvenience, I desired it might be returned but at the same time, I assured the king that his inability to afford me a greater quantity of refreshments would not in the least degree influence my conduct in promoting the welfare of himself and his people or induce me to withhold such articles as would be of real utility to him. In the afternoon, we were visited by Tayo, who presented me with a feathered cloak. And in return, amongst other valuables, I presented him with one of fearlet cloth which in a very short time he gave to his eldest brother and sovereign, Titere. On my asking the reason for so hasty a disposal of it, he replied that the old king was only taking care of it for Tayo, but I afterwards understood that it was a fort of care that would free Tayo from any further trouble in the possession. The day was too far advanced to enter at large on the interesting negotiation I had fat on foot. I briefly pointed out to Tayo the outline of the business, and was happy to find that the idea of a peace with Ohaihi seemed to afford him more pleasure and satisfaction than had been expressed by any other chief to whom this proposal had been communicated. After a short conversation, he observed that we had formerly been very great friends when I was at Atawai with Captain Cook and Captain Clerk, that he still retained a very great regard for me and hoped we should both remain in the same sentiments towards each other. That, as a proof of the sincerity of his friendship, he had still in his possession a lock of my hair, which I had given him at that period 
when at the same time I refused a similar pledge to Enemo and several other chiefs who were present on that occasion. This story, corresponding exactly with what I'd heard from Tiana and Enemo the preceding year, induced me to ask where the lock of hair was. To this Tayo replied that it was on shore, with some other valuable testimonies of friendship that constantly attended him in his travels or campaigns, and that he would bring it with him in the morning. The circumstance of the hair having before been frequently mentioned to me had made me endeavour to recall the person of this former friend to my remembrance, and on recollection I suspected that Tayo must have been a young chief at that time, about 18 years of age, who had made me several presents and who had given me many other instances of his friendly attention. But, to my great surprise, on his entering the cabin, I beheld him far advanced in years, seemingly about fifty, and though evidently a much younger man than Titere, yet nearly reduced to the same state of debility. If he were in reality the person I had considered him to have been, I must have been much mistaken with respect to his age on our former acquaintance, or the intemperature of that pernicious intoxicating plant, the Ava, which he took in great quantities, assisted by the toils of long and fatiguing wars, had combined to bring upon him a premature old age. Notwithstanding these appearances of the decline of life, his countenance was animated with great quickness and sensibility, and his behavior was affable and courteous. His inquiries were of the most sagacious nature, respecting matters of useful information. The shrewdness of his understanding, his thirst to acquire and wish to communicate, useful, interesting, or entertaining knowledge, sufficiently indicated a very active mind, and did not fail to impress us with a very favorable opinion of his general character. Tayo and his party remained on board until near dark when they took their leave for the night, carrying with them such presents as were suitable to their several ranks and situations. The bottom of the Chatham having been examined by diving, it was discovered that some of the copper had been torn off when they accidentally got on shore, failing out of Nootka. On this representation from Mr. Puget, I deemed it expedient that no time should be lost in replacing the copper and having the bottom thoroughly examined, left some more important damage might have been sustained. For this specific purpose, I gave orders that the instant her supplies of wood and water were completed, the should proceed to Nyotka, and I directed Mr. Puget, on his departure from hence, to examine the north side of Morotoy, as it was my design, in visiting the other islands belonging to this group, to pass along its southern side. Friday, 15th. The next morning my old friend Tayo was amongst the earliest of our visitors and brought with him the look of hair. It was tied carefully round at the bottom, where it was neatly decorated with some red feathers and appeared to have been well preserved and held in some degree of estimation. The color corresponding with that of my own tended to prove its identity. The preservation of this memorial exhibited a striking instance of similarity in the human mind by showing the same pledge of friendship that exists in the civilized and polished states of the world to be held equally in estimation by the untaught inhabitants of these distant regions. These customs must certainly arise from principles innate and common to the species since at the time that Tayo solicited and received that token of my regard it was not possible that he should have acquired the idea from any European or other civilized person. This was one amongst innumerable instances that occurred in our acquaintance with the uncultivated world, which served to show the analogy of the several passions and affections that, under every color, clime, or in every stage of civilization, govern the human heart. On this occasion, I could not help feeling some internal humiliation at the superiority which the steadiness of Tayo's friendship had gained over me by preserving the lock of my hair by retaining, after an absence of 14 or 15 years, a perfect recollection of my name and by recounting the various incidents and the several acts of reciprocal kindness and friendship that had taken place in our former acquaintance. All these he seemed to remember with the greatest pleasure but all these had been long obliterated from my memory. I trust 
that my wish to pay some tribute to Tayo's unshaken friendship will be my excuse for the insertion of this otherwise unimportant subject. In the forenoon, the king with Tayo, Namahana, and such other chiefs as were necessary to the occasion being assembled in the cabin, the negotiation for peace was again resumed and the subject was discussed with much warmth amongst themselves. All their arguments tended to prove that peace was an object of their most earnest desire, but that they doubted the possibility of obtaining its blessings, because they could place no confidence in the fidelity of Tama Ma'a. This prejudice I endeavored to do away by all my former arguments, and in addition, I pointed out that peace was an object as important and as much desired in Ohie as in Mowi and its dependencies, that this could not be disputed, as the king and chiefs of Ohihi would not have solicited my interference and good offices to accomplish this happy undertaking had they not been instigated by these weighty reasons. Tayo, however, was decidedly of opinion that peace could not be obtained unless I would return to Ohihi being convinced that Tamahma would place no reliance on any message that should be sent from them by any of their chiefs. I told them it was impossible for me to accede to their willies in this respect, but that I would adopt other measures which would in effect answer the same purpose, provided they were in earnest, and would faithfully abide by the stipulations I had made with Tamahma and the chiefs of Ohaihi. These I had communicated to them and in addition had commended that they should by all means forget, if possible, but certainly forgive, all past enmities and the occasions of them, all injuries and insults, and discourage by every effort in their power all animosities, disputes and wrangling between the subjects of Titire and those of Tamarma, and as great intemperance in the support of the question which of these kings was the greatest and most powerful monarch was a grievance much complained of on both sides and had given rise to much ill blood and contention amongst the people of the different governments. It became a matter of infinite consequence that such conversations should be immediately prohibited. When these preparatory measures had undergone due consideration and had been adjusted by both parties, an intercourse of confidence and friendship, I allege it, would naturally take place between the present contending powers and such measures would then be agreed upon as would seem to be best calculated to secure a permanent good understanding and most beneficial to their respective interests. After repeating to them the happy consequences that would result from so wife, humane and political a measure in the same manner as I had represented them to Tamaama, both Tayo and Namahana, but particularly Tayo, with respectful formality, questioned me as to the sincerity of my views in thus strongly recommending these peaceful overtures. They desired to know the reason why the advice I gave was so directly opposite to that of the several commanders and people of the trading vessels who for some time past had been their constant visitors who had uniformly recommended a continuance of the war with Ohihi, had pointed out the numerous advantages they would obtain and had supplied them with arms and ammunition for the express purpose of carrying that advice into execution. To these interrogatories I had no mode of replying, but by producing facts that were completely within their own knowledge and observation. I stated that such advice did not come from friends, but from persons interested, not in their happiness and welfare, but in their own aggrandizement, who, having brought with them to these countries a large assortment of arms and ammunition as articles of trade, would be great losers by such ventures, were the inhabitants of the different islands to remain in peace and unanimity with each other, that under the happy circumstances proposed, these engines of destruction would soon fall into low estimation, that therefore it was not surprising if animosity, revenge and war were recommended in order to enhance the value of these commodities and by that means secure a larger supply of refreshments, that my pursuit was of a very different character, they must have been well convinced by the nature of the articles they had received either as presents from me or in exchange for the several productions of their country, 
which were such as were ornamental to their persons or really instrumental to their welfare. That one of my most favorite objects was to render them such services on all occasions as my situation could afford. Of this they would be convinced should they think proper to adopt the pacific measures I had proposed, in which case I would communicate their consent by writing to the Englishman residing at Ohaihi with Tama Ama. On the receipt of this, I alleged, a council of the chiefs would be immediately assembled, and in the presence of a chief to be appointed by Titiri and entrusted with the charge of this important commission, Tamahma and the chiefs of Ohihi would solemnly agree to and faithfully abide by the peace on the terms already mentioned. And that further, to secure the performance of the promises made to me at Ohihi, I would threaten to withdraw the friendship and goodwill I entertained towards that island in case the king and the chiefs should refuse to ratify their engagement. Having thus explained to Titiri and his friends my wishes and motives for the advancement of their happiness and welfare, I left them at full liberty either to embrace the blessings and advantages of peace or to continue in their present calamitous state of warfare and hostility. After a short consultation with each other, they unanimously declared for peace. Without any solicitation on my part, Tayo requested that, on my return to these islands, I would take him to Ohaihi, where, under my protection, he would, in person, treat with Tama Ahma'a, in order that a lasting peace might be concluded and an amicable intercourse established between Ohaihi and all the islands, and he desired that these, his intentions, might be made known to Tama Ahma'a. This was accordingly done in my letter to Ohihi on this subject, which was to be entrusted to a sensible and careful chief, who, empowered with sufficient authority, was immediately to proceed to Ohihi in order to negotiate this desirable business with Tamahama. The execution of this embassy was allotted to a chief named Martier, a man whole first appearance and deportment were likely to make unfavorable impressions, but whose real character, I understood, was that of a shrewd, sensible fellow. And though his countenance was ferocious, yet he was remarkable for the mildness and evenness of his disposition. In all our conferences, he was a principal speaker, and from the great attention paid by Titeri and Tayo to what he said. It was evident that his abilities were in great estimation. This favorite object being so far attained, I embraced the opportunity of a full assembly to advert again to the inhuman murder at Wahoo. On this occasion I was stopped rather hastily by Titiri, who observed that that business was already settled, that they had full confidence in my assertions, and that I ought not to doubt them. Having considered a general restoration of tranquility to these islands and the punishment of the criminals at Wahoo to be matters of the first importance to the safety and interests of the commercial adventurers in this ocean, they had for some time past occupied much of my attention. The prospect of the one being happily accomplished and of the other being executed with justice afforded my mind no small degree of satisfaction. And as, by the survey on which our boats were employed, I should obtain a perfect knowledge of the shores of this island, the principal objects that had induced my visit hither seemed to promise a successful termination. As neither hogs nor other refreshments could be procured, I was anxious to quit this station. Titiri and his counsellors were made acquainted that I intended so to do on the return of the boats, which were expected the next morning, when, agreeably to their earnest request, I purposed to pay them a visit on shore whilst the ship was preparing for her departure. They expressed much concern at the shortness of our stay and some surprise that we should so suddenly take our leave. This, I explained, was occasioned by the necessity I was under to visit other distant countries and not from any disinclination or want of friendship for them as they had supposed. With this reason, they became perfectly satisfied but hoped, as I could pay them only one visit on shore, that it might be deferred until Sunday morning, because the next day was Tabu Puri, and it would be impossible for them to receive us as they could wish. 
They eagerly entreated me to remain until that time when they would repair to the ship and accompany me on shore. The same of our fireworks had reached Mowi, and they added to this request an earnest desire that their curiosity might be gratified in this respect. Tayo, in particular, was very pressing in his solicitations, and as it was our first visit to these chiefs, whose friendship and good opinion I much wished to cultivate, I was induced to comply with their wishes, especially as I was now satisfied that I had sufficient time for the business I had to transact this season at the other islands, and to join the Chatham at Nootka, long before they would be ready to proceed with us to the northward. The chiefs, having succeeded in their wishes, the whole party seemed excessively happy, and returned to the shore for the purpose of attending their religious ceremonies. Saturday the 16th. In the evening, Mr. Menzies with his party returned from the mountains, having received the greatest civility and attention from such of the natives as they had met with during their excursion. And the next morning, Mr. Whitby arrived on board after completing the examination of the shores on this side of Mowi. The Chatham's cutter was sent on board and Mr. Puget, agreeably to my directions, failed for Nootka, passing between the west end of Mowi and the east part of Morotoy. Mr. Whitby resumed his survey round the west point of Mowi, which service he performed and returned in the evening. Before I close the narrative of our proceedings on this station, I shall state the result of the information obtained in Mr. Whitby's excursion. During the first day, the boats did not advance more than seven miles along the shore in a direction N60E to a place called by the natives Patoa and reached even that with much labor and difficulty, not only in consequence of the violence of the wind, which had nearly driven them from the land, but because, in their endeavors to approach the shores, the Chatham's cutter shipped some heavy seas and was in imminent danger of being lost. Patoa is represented by Mr. Whidbey as a roadstead affording good anchorage, its depth of water from 10 to 20 fathoms, sandy bottom, the former within half a mile, the latter about a mile of the shore, where there is an excellent run of fresh water, though the place is inconvenient for filling casks expeditiously as the water takes its course amongst some rugged rocks over which large casks could not be rolled. This difficulty, however, might easily be surmounted by allowing the casks to remain on the beach, where the natives, for a very small reward, would soon fill them. The soundings from the ship were regular all the way to Patoa, a station easily found by attending to the following description. The large bay already noticed, lying before the isthmus before mentioned, has its western side formed by high rocky precipices that rise perpendicularly from the sea. To the westward of these precipices, the coast is chiefly composed of sandy beaches, and the mountains, at some distance from the shore, form two remarkable valleys, separated from each other by a high rugged mountain, seemingly detached from the rest, and approaching nearer to the beach than those to the right and left of it. The anchorage at Patoa is abreast of the easternmost of these valleys, which appeared to be fruitful and well cultivated. The boats remained at this station until the next morning, when they proceeded along shore to the eastward and found the same foundings until they were abreast of the rocky precipices. Here they gained no ground. But close to the shore, the bottom, which is rocky, was reached with 20 fathoms of line. These precipices extend about a league from Patoa in the line of the shore, then trend more northerly, and at the distance of about four miles join the low land of the isthmus. Before this lies a reef, or rather detached patches of rocks, at the distance of near a quarter of a mile from the shore, without which the foundings are regular and good. The western side of the large bay is formed by these precipices or cliffs, its opposite shore, about four miles distant, takes a north direction from the volcano hill. The depth of the bay is there somewhat increased. The foundings on the eastern side are regular, but very rocky. Nearly in the middle of its western side is a village, 
called by the natives Macaray. Of this there is, anchorage in seven fathoms water, a little more than a quarter of a mile from the shore, the bottom sand and broken coral. This situation is landlocked in every direction, excepting between Tahorowa and Ranai, where to the southwestward it is exposed about two points of the compass, but not liable, I believe, to much wind from that quarter. The neighboring shores afford good landing, and in moderate weather, the communication is easily effected. But the neglected and impoverished state of the surrounding country offers no inducements to strangers under its present circumstances to make choice of it as a stopping or resting place, though it is probably one of the best sheltered and mod convenient anchorages which these islands possess. In all likelihood, good water might with little labor be procured at a small distance to the southward of the village from the upper part of a stream that was found rushing through the loose sand composing the beach, though just below high water mark it was somewhat brackish. The inhabitants, who are generally nice in this particular, procure their water from this run at low tide. The examination of this bay being the limits of Mr. Whitby's excursion to the eastward, he returned to the ship, from whence he continued his researches round the western point of Rahina Roadstead, and found the shores bounded by a reef, which admits of only one landing place for boats, and that a very indifferent one at the eastern part of the village. From the ship to the shore, the soundings were regular, decreasing to five fathoms close to the reef, extending in general about a fourth of a mile from the beach, and not exceeding that distance from the west point of the roadstead, where on the north side of that point, the reef terminates. This point, with the west extremity of Maui, which is bold and free from rocks or other impediments, forms an excellent little bay. Its outer points lie from each other, N, 14W, and S, 14E, about a league asunder. The northern point is formed by a round hill close to the water side, much resembling Volcano Hill, but not quite so large. This bay Mr. Whidbey esteemed the most eligible anchoring place he had seen in Mowi. The foundings, in the line of the two points, from 10 to 14 fathoms, soft, sandy bottom regularly decreased to five fathoms close to the beach, which is protected from the ocean and the prevailing winds by its north point, locking in with the eastern part of the island of Morotoi. It is free from rocks, shoals, or other obstacles, and affords pleasant landing and good anchorage where vessels may lie nearly landlocked in every direction, excepting that between Ranai and Moratoi in the western quarter. This space, however, embraces but a small extent, from whence little danger can be apprehended. The day being too far spent prevented Mr. Whidbey from landing, but we were informed by Tomahomoho that the shores of that bay afforded abundance of very excellent water. This advantage gives the bay a great preference to any other station in Moi, especially as its ingress and egress may be effected with much ease by approaching it from the northward, as the regular trade wind may be depended upon, which without interruption or sudden gusts, blows past the bay and enables vessels to chase in it what station they please. By these means, a very accurate knowledge of the shores on this side of Moi was acquired. These appeared to be more likely to afford anchorage and shelter than those of the other islands. But, as I have already had occasion to observe, under the present impoverished state of this and the neighboring islands, Mowi is certainly not the most desirable rendezvous for vessels employed in the commercial pursuits of this hemisphere. It is likewise necessary to add that notwithstanding the advantages of Patoa and Makeri, there is great reason to suspect that the bottom at those places, as well as on all this side of Mowi, is nowhere good holding ground. That of the roadstead of Rahaina, I am convinced, is nothing more than a very slight covering of sand over a bed of hard coral. And the same remark seems to extend to the edge of the bank, where, in 40 fathoms water, the bottom is much softer, but the declivity of the bank is such that with a strong wind from the shore, vessels would not be able to retain their anchorage. By Mr. Whidbey's examination of the southwest part of Maui, the soundings generally indicated the same deceitful bottom. 
This can only be discovered by anchoring upon it, as the lead only brings up the sand and small stones, which cover a bed of solid rock beneath, that the anchor cannot penetrate. Of this we had proof on two different days in the squalls of wind that came across the isthmus, which drove the vessels in whatever direction the wind chanced to blow, though they were riding with a very sufficient scope of cable. As we were not moored, I at first attributed this circumstance to the anchor being sole, but on heaving it up, this was not found to be the case, whilst the peak of the anchor, with the under part of the flock, were found much chased by their having been dragged along the hard ground. Another inconvenience attending these two places is the violent gusts, or rather gales of wind, that I believe constantly blow when the trade wind blows fresh at sea, and particularly when it is most from the northern quarter. At these times it is most violent and rushes with such fury over the isthmus as to prevent all communication with the shore. And if my conjecture respecting the bottom be right, vessels would have great difficulty to maintain their stations. Sunday 17th. The king, Tayo, and the rest of the chiefs returned according to their promise to the ship on Sunday morning. And in the forenoon, accompanied by Titiri and some of our officers in two armed boats with a guard of marines, I paid my compliments on shore, where the landing was but indifferent. We were received by the natives with the greatest civility and friendship. At the first view, they appeared very numerous, being collected on a small space of ground. But when they were a little distributed, their number, including the children, did not exceed six or seven hundred. The king conducted us through the crowd, who made way for us and behaved in a very orderly manner. We soon arrived at his residence. This consisted of two small shabby huts, situated in a pleasant grove of spreading trees, where we were served with cocoa nuts and other refreshments. I requested that Titere and Tayo would accompany us in a walk through the plantations. This they begged leave to decline and pleaded their age and infirmities as an excuse. They, however, directed that Namahana, Tomohomoho, and Martier should attend us, who would equally prevent the obtrusion of the curious and render us every service. Attended by our guard and these chiefs, we visited the cultivated parts of the plain of Rahena. These occupied no very great extent. The part bordering on the seashore was pleasantly laid out in plantations of taro, potatoes, sugar cane, the cloth plant, etc. Tolerably well shaded by spreading trees, chiefly of the breadfruit. But in point of size, or in the luxuriance of its productions, it bore no proportion to the plains of Otaheite and of the Society Islands. Through these grounds, little canals were cut in various directions that supplied the several plantations with water, the whole originating from a continual spring of excellent water, sufficiently above the level to inundate every part. The taro was growing among the water, but in a very bad state of culture and in very small quantities. To the ravage and destruction of Tama Maya's awars, the wretched appearance of their crops was to be ascribed. Of this they grievously complained and were continually pointing out the damages they had sustained. The despoiled aspect of the country was an incontrovertible evidence of this melancholy truth. Most of the different tenements in the lands formerly cultivated were now lying waste, their fences partly or entirely broken down and their little canals utterly destroyed. Nor was a hog or a fowl anywhere to be seen. By far, the larger portion of the plain was in this ruinous state, and the small part that was in a flourishing condition bore the evident marks of very recent labor. Having extended our walk as far as our inclinations led us, and having satisfied our curiosity, we returned to the royal habitation, where we found Titiri and Tayo at dinner on raw pickled fish and poi taro. That is, a mess made of the taro root, not unlike a hasty pudding. Sensible that we were not likely to relish such food, they had provided two very fine baked hogs, which were immediately let before us. But the cook, having neglected to provide any vegetables, which was a more important article to us, 
we declined the repast, and the chiefs, having finished their meal, returned with us on board. As this was likely to he, the last visit of Titiri and Tayo, I presented them with a large assortment of useful tools, implements, and household utensils, with cloth, linen, some beads, and other articles of ornament. To Titere, I gave also some goats, and these being the first foreign animals imported into Moi, were regarded as a most valuable present. The inferior chiefs and attendants were not neglected on this occasion. And I had the satisfaction to find that my liberality had exceeded their most sanguine expectations. By this time, they had become well acquainted with the noble and generous conduct of Tamama and our reception and treatment at Ohaihi. This they would have been happy to have imitated had they not been prevented by the general distress of their country, but they promised to assist us on our return to the very utmost of their power and ability. In the evening, we had a display of fireworks from the after part of the ship. To the great terror and admiration of our visitors and their attendants on board, and of the natives of all descriptions assembled in their canoes about the ship, comprehending most probably all the inhabitants. The exhibition being concluded, I expected to have taken leave of my Moi friends, but the night being very dark and a heavy surf breaking on the shore, the king and Tayo were not much inclined to leave us, fying they should be liable to great danger in passing the reef in the dark. This circumstance induced me, though contrary to my established rule, to indulge them and the major part of their retinue with my cabin. The night was more appropriated to conversation than to sleep. I retired to rest, but was frequently awakened and found that their discourse was principally on the occurrences that had taken place since our arrival and on the destructive powers of our fireworks when used in war. Monday 18th. The next morning, Titiri departed in a very sudden manner and without my knowledge. I became apprehensive that some accidental offence had been given him, but Tayo assured me of the contrary, and that such was his common practice of retiring. I had indeed before noticed an abruptness in his leaving the ship, but on the present occasion I thought he would have shown more respect. Tayo, Martier, and some of the other chiefs remained with us until we failed. This we were prevented doing till near noon, when, with a light breeze from the westward, we put to sea, and they took an affectionate leave of us. Thus we quitted Maui, little benefited by the refreshments it had afforded. For although I did not choose to accept the inadequate returns of the chiefs, yet every article of this fort that was brought alongside for sale was purchased, and the whole did not amount to two days' subsistence. The mean result of our observations made between the 12th and 17th showed the latitude of the ship's station at Rahina Roadstead to be 20 degree 50 E, the longitude 203 degree 19. All further nautical information relative to this anchorage and its immediate neighborhood will most probably be better obtained from the charts of the islands than from any written description. Voyage to the North Pacific Ocean and Round the World by Captain George Vancouver. Book the Third, Chapter 8, 1793, March, Monday 18th. Light baffling winds attended us after leaving Rahina Roadstead until the evening when we reached the channel between Moi and Moratoi, where we met the regular trade wind blowing a pleasant gale. With this, we stood to windward and anchored for the night off the NW part of Moi in 19 fathoms water, soft sandy bottom. Its shores extended by compass from N51E to S4E. Its nearest part bore E by S two miles from us. And the east point of Moratoi, N15W, distant eight miles. Tuesday 10, early the next morning, with a pleasant breeze from the NE, we stood over towards the east point of Moratoi until we were within a league of the shore which was bounded by a reef extending about half a league from it. Thus we sailed along to the westward and saw several shallow breaks forming passages for boats, but not affording any shelter for shipping against the prevailing winds. 
about half a league south of the east point of Morotoi, which is situated in latitude 249, longitude 216, lies a small barren rocky islet called by the natives Moduanete, and from that point the shores of the island lie S. 53W. In this direction the land rises rather abruptly from the sea towards the lofty mountains in the center of the east part of Morotoi. And though the acclivity was great, yet the face of the country, diversified by eminences and valleys, bore a verdant and fertile appearance. It seemed to be well inhabited in a high state of cultivation and presented not only a rich, but a romantic prospect. To the westward of these cliffs, the shores terminated in the former direction by a low point of land called by the natives Crinoa, and from thence they stretch N. 85 W, eight leagues to the west point of the island. From Crinoa, the country assumes a dreary aspect. The mountains, forming the eastern part of the island, gradually descend to the westward, and like those of Moe, terminate on a low isthmus, which appears to divide the island into two peninsulas. These, however, bear no proportion to each other. The easternmost, which is far the largest, is composed of very high land, but the westernmost does not rife to any elevation beyond that of a mean height. The country from Crinoa rises from the sea by an ascent, uninterrupted with chasms, hills, or valleys. This uniform surface on advancing to the westward exhibited a gradual decrease in the population. It discovered an uncultivated barren foil and a tract of land that gave residence only to a few of the lower orders of the islanders, who resort to the shores for the purpose of taking fish with which they abound. Those so employed are obliged to fetch their fresh water from a great distance, none but what is brackish being attainable on the western parts of Morotoi. This information I had before gained from several chiefs at Maui, and was now confirmed in it by Tomohomoho, who was accompanying us to Wohu, and who also acquainted me that along the shores of this south side, which are chiefly composed of a sandy beach, anchorage would be found on a clear sandy bottom. But as there were no projecting points for shelter, I did not think a further examination worth the time it would employ, and therefore proceeded to the bay at the west end of the island, for the purpose of seeing if, contrary to my former observations, it was commodious for the refitting of vessels, as it had been reported. We passed within about half a league of the west point of the island, situated in latitude 24 degrees 630, longitude 202 degrees 43 days, with regular soundings from 17 to 23 fathoms, sandy bottom. The NW point of the island lies from the west point N25E at the distance of three leagues. Between these two points, a commodious bay had been stated to exist whereas we found the whole intermediate space nearly a straight shore, composed alternately of rugged rocks and sandy beaches. The day being too far advanced for standing over to Wohu, we stood to windward and anchored for the night in 19 fathoms water, sandy and bad holding ground. As the ship would not ride with less than a whole cable, although the trade wind blew, but a moderate breeze. In working up, the soundings were pretty regular from 17 to 60 fathoms, fine sandy bottom, and where we anchored within about a mile of the breakers, the west point of the island bore by compass south, distant four miles, and the northwest point N, 26E, about the same distance. Our situation here was as close into shore as vessels can lie with safety, this side of the island being entirely open and exposed to the north and northwest winds, which blow frequently with great violence and to a heavy sea that is almost constantly rolling from that quarter on the shores, and which at that time broke with so much fury that it would have been dangerous to land even in canoes. The country had the same dreary and barren appearance as that noticed on the south side, and I was informed it was equally destitute of water. Wednesday 20th. With a light easterly breeze about six o'clock on Wednesday morning, we directed our course so as to sail along the north side of Wauahu. Tomohomoho objected to this mode of approach, saying that the murderers resided near Waitit Bay, which would be the best station for us to take. 
for that if we went to the other side, he should have a great distance to go in search of them, by which means the offenders might get intelligence of our errand, escape into the mountains, and Titiri would be accused of breaking his promise. There appeared so much good sense in this precaution, and so much earnestness in Tomohomoho to execute the business entrusted to him, that I did not hesitate to yield to his wishes and postpone the examination of the north side of the island till our next visit. And we proceeded to Whiteheat, where we anchored about three o'clock in ten fathoms water, occupying nearly our former station. We were visited by a few of the natives in small single canoes who brought little or nothing to dispose of. One double canoe only made its appearance. In this came James Coleman, one of the three men we found last year left by Mr. Kendrick at Attawai. This man had quitted Mr. Kendrick's employ and had entered into the service of Titere. Why had rationed him at this island in order to regulate the trade and to assist such vessels as might touch at Woahu for refreshments. This corresponded with what I had heard in support of Titere's character in contradiction to the report that had been circulated of his having issued orders for putting to death all the white men who resided in, or who might visit, his dominions. Coleman was accompanied by a chief named Tenevi and a lad called Tohu Bu Ato. The latter had made a voyage to China in some of the trading vessels and had picked up a few English words that rendered his conversation very intelligible. These informed me that they were sent by Tritubury Titeri's eldest son and governor of Woahu in his absence, to inquire who we were and to offer such supplies as the island afforded, though at present they could not boast of any abundance. They apologized for Tri Tuburi's not coming himself, as he was ill and not able, without much pain, to walk or fit upright. Coleman introduced the melancholy subject of our countrymen's unhappy fate and dated the circumstances attending it much in the same way as we had heard them at Mowi. But, for our more particular information, he referred us to Tohu Buarto, who, he said, was present and would relate the whole of that transaction. Tohu Buarto dated that he had received much civility from Mr. Hergist and the rest of the gentlemen on his visiting the Daedalus at Waimea Bay on the opposite side of this island that when Mr. Hergist and Mr. Gooch were going on shore, he accompanied them in the boat to assist as an interpreter, that when they arrived at the beach, he advised Mr. Hergist by no means to land, telling him that there was no chief present and that it was a part of the island where a great many very bad people resided, that no attention was paid to his advice, that they went on shore and after taking some measures without any opposition, for procuring a supply of water, that Mr. Hergest left some directions with his people, and then, still contrary to the advice of this young man, went with Mr. Gooch from the seaside up to the habitations of the natives, who behaved to them in a friendly manner. At this time, Tohubu Arto had left them in order to wash himself in the fresh water, a prevailing custom on landing after being some time at sea and whilst the gentlemen were absent, a dispute arose at the watering place between the natives and the people of the Didalus, from which an affray ensued and the Portuguese seaman was killed. That no harm or molestation had been offered or was intended towards those gentlemen who were treated civilly by the people of the village until the news of this unfortunate transaction arrived. When, to prevent revenge taking place, it was thought necessary to put to death the chiefs whom they then had in their power and that, in pursuance of this horrid resolution, Mr. Gooch was instantly killed by being stabbed through the heart with a pahua, that the first blow only wounded Mr. Hergist, who, in endeavouring to make his way towards the boat, was knocked down by a large stone hitting him on the side of his head, and was then murdered in a most barbarous manner. The man who stabbed Mr. Gooch, the one who first wounded Mr. Hergist, and another who had been principally concerned at the watering place had been, he said, apprehended by Titiri's orders and been put to death. To assure us of his having been present and having interfered to save Mr. Hergist, he pointed out the fear of a wound in his left arm, 
which he said he had received on that occasion, and further added that the man who knocked down and murdered Mr. Hergest, with two or three others materially concerned, was still living, and resided not far from our then anchorage. The former of these he had pointed out a few days before to Coleman. I inquired of Coleman if he had ever heard this young man tell this melancholy story before, who instantly replied that he had, and precisely as it was then related, which corresponded with the account he had received from other natives, and that he believed it to be a very true statement. After Tohubuato had finished his account, he was questioned by Tomohomoho about the residence of the offenders, who desired that he would accompany him and Tenevi for the purpose of apprehending the delinquents and bringing them to justice. At first, Tohubuato declined engaging, fearing the friends and relations of the offenders would murder him. But on being assured of protection by Tomohomoho, he consented, and the whole party made the best of their way to the shore. I entrusted to Coleman a present of red cloth and some other things, as a pledge of my goodwill and friendly disposition towards Tri Tuburi, as also an axe and other articles, to Tomohomoho, which he requested to be the bearer of for the same purpose. Thursday, 21. The next forenoon, Coleman with Tomahomaho and Tenevi came on board. As no one appeared like a prisoner in the canoe, I inquired of Coleman if the murderers were in custody. He said he believed they were, but did not positively know, as the business after landing the preceding evening had been conducted by the chiefs with the most profound secrecy, that he had seen nothing of the party during the whole of the night, nor till they were about to put off from the beach, when he jumped into the stern of the canoe. The two chiefs decided I would attend them into the cabin, where, after shutting all the doors, they informed me that the man who had murdered Mr. Hergest, with two others who had been equally active and guilty, were in the fore part of the canoe, and that no time should be lost in securing them, lest anything should transpire, and they should again make their escape. Orders were immediately given for their being admitted into the ship and they soon were brought into the cabin. The chiefs now pointed out the principal offender, whose appearance corresponded with the description given by Tohubuato. One half of his body, from his forehead to his feet, was made jet black by punctuating. The other two men were marked after the same manner, but not with the same regularity. These appearances alone would not have been sufficient to have identified their persons, as we had seen many of Titeri's subjects disfigured after the same barbarous fashion, which I understood had been adopted in the late wars for the purpose of increasing the ferocity of their appearance and striking their enemies with terror. Tohu Buato was not present as a witness against the accused persons. This I very much regretted, but as there was great probability that Coleman's evidence would confirm what the chiefs had asserted, he was called in. After steadfastly surveying their persons, he pointed out the same man whom the chiefs had accused as the murderer of Mr. Hergest, but said that he had no knowledge of the other two. Notwithstanding Coleman's corroborative evidence, I much wished for further proof before I sanctioned their punishment, and having heard that Mr. Dobson, one of the midshipmen who came out in the Daedalus, had spoken of one of the natives who, when alongside on that occasion, had been remarked for his insolence and improper behaviour, and who, the instant the boat with Mr. Hergest put off from the ship, had paddled hastily to the shore where he landed, became very active in the affray, and was, in the unanimous opinion of the crew, suspected to have been the principal, if not the sole cause, of the calamity that followed. I, having therefore called upon Mr. Dobson, and allied him if he had any recollection of the prisoners. He, without the least hesitation, pointed out the same man who stood accused as the person who had acted the part above described, and was ready to make oath to his identity. These proofs, though not positive, were yet so circumstantial as to leave little doubt of this man's guilt, but, as the evidence of Tohubuato, would be still an additional confirmation I desired Denevi would repair to the shore and bring him on board, that the criminals might be fairly tried, 
and that we might have the fullest satisfaction of their guilt, which the nature of the case would afford. During this interval, I ordered the prisoners into confinement until further testimonies should be produced to criminate or acquit them. Tomohomoho disliked much the delay of punishment and requested that the prisoners might be immediately executed. But I persisted in the exercise of my own feelings and judgment. On questioning him concerning a fourth man who had been implicated in the murder, he acknowledged that there was a fourth who had been very materially concerned, but said that all he could learn about him was that he had been seen in the neighborhood some months before, and as he had not lately made his appearance, it was by no means certain whether he was then on the island or had gone to some of the others. Under all circumstances, there appeared little probability of this man being taken, especially when the news of the three others being in custody should be spread abroad. This determined me not to insist upon any further search on the conviction that it would be neither prudent nor proper to adopt any measures of force to effect an object that want of time might oblige me to abandon and leave unaccomplished. In the afternoon, Tenevi returned without Tohubu Arto. At this I was not less concerned than surprised and could not but consider his absenting himself as an indication of some misconduct. The two chiefs assured me I need be under no such apprehensions as they were certain it was only the fear of revenge from the relations and friends of the delinquents that prevented his attendance. Despairing of his evidence, we had only one further appeal. This was to know from Triteburi, the chief of the island, if he believed these were the identical people guilty of the offence. And as his indisposition prevented him from coming on board, I desired Terahua, who could not be at all interested in any event that might take place, and who had conducted himself with great fidelity during 12 months he had been on board to accompany Coleman and make this inquiry of Tritubori. This they accordingly performed and returned in the evening. Terahua declared that Tritubori had positively pronounced that all three of the prisoners were guilty of the murder with which they were accused. This Coleman confirmed and added that the chief desired they might be immediately punished with death. To this declaration, Coleman made oath in the most solemn manner in the presence of myself and all the officers of the ship who had attended the investigation in the morning and who, having maturely considered the business, were unanimously of opinion with me that justice demanded exemplary punishment in order to stop, or at least to check, such barbarous and unprovoked outrages in future. It was clearly established in the course of the examination by the testimonies of all the natives who were questioned that neither those two unfortunate gentlemen nor the people in the boats had given the least cause for umbrage. This certainly aggravated the crime. After much inquiry, it did not appear that any other witnesses could be procured. And though we could have wished to have had more satisfactory proof of the criminality of the persons in custody. Yet as they had been apprehended by their own people, accused and convicted by their own neighbors, and condemned by their own chief, it was, after the most serious deliberation and reflection, deemed sufficient to authorize the execution of the three prisoners. But as the day was too far spent, it was deferred until the next morning, contrary to the wishes of the chiefs who were very desirous of its immediately taking place. When they returned to the shore, I desired they would use their endeavors to find out and bring on board every person that might be able to prove the innocence of the persons in custody. This injunction was treated with indifference because they were perfectly convinced no such persons could be found. And as I wished that as many of the natives as could be collected should witness the awful punishment that the prisoners had brought upon themselves by their barbarity, I desired also that they would make it publicly known that the execution would probably take place the next forenoon. Friday, 20 Sega. On Friday morning, a few of the natives were about the ship, but not so many as on the former days. After breakfast, Coleman, with Tomahomaho and Tenevi, came on board. The two latter demanded the immediate execution of the prisoners. This, however, was not complied with, as it was deemed right that they should again be accused by their own chiefs, in the presence of all the witnesses, 
of the crime with which they stood charged in order, if possible, to draw from them a confession of their guilt and to renew the opportunity which before had been given them of producing some evidence in proof of their innocence. Nothing, however, could be extorted from any of them but that they were totally ignorant of any such circumstance having ever happened on the island. This very assertion amounted almost to self-conviction, as it is not easy to believe, that the execution of their comrades by Titere's orders for the same offence with which they had been charged had not come to their knowledge or that it could have escaped their recollection. Neither myself nor my officers discovered any reason from the result of this further examination to retract or alter our former opinion of their guilt, or of delivering them over to their own people, to be dealt with according to the directions of their chief. Before they went from the ship, they were placed in irons on the quarter deck, where, in the presence of all the ship's company, I recapitulated the crime which they had committed, the evidence that had been adduced against them, and the condemnation of their chiefs, and stated the punishment that was now to be inflicted. All this was likewise made known to the Indian spectators who were present. That the ceremony might be made as solemn and as awful as possible, a guard of seamen and marines were drawn up on that side of the ship opposite to the shore, where, alongside of the ship, a canoe was stationed for the execution. The rest of the crew were in readiness at the great guns, lest any disturbance or commotion should arise. One ceremony, however, remained yet to be performed. One of these unfortunate men had long hair. This, it was necessary, should be cut from his head before he was executed for the purpose of being presented as a customary tribute on such occasions to the king of the island. I was shocked at the want of feeling exhibited by the two chiefs at this awful moment, who, in the rudest manner, not only cut off the hair, but, in the presence of the poor suffering wretch, without the least compassion for his situation, disputed and strove for the honor of presenting the prezi to the king. The odious contest being at length settled, the criminals were taken one by one into a double canoe, where they were lashed hand and foot, and put to death by Tenevi, their own chief, who blew out their brains with a pistol. And so dexterously was the melancholy office performed that life sled with the report of the peace and muscular motion seemed almost instantly to cease. If steadiness and firmness, totally devoid of the least agitation, can be considered in the performance of such a duty as a proof of conscious rectitude, or that the forfeiture of these three men's lives was considered as no more than what the strict principles of retributive justice demanded, it should seem that Tenevay's mind had been completely made up, not only as their judge, but their executioner and that he was perfectly convinced his conduct was unimpeachable in executing an office that justice demanded. The whole of Tenevi's deportment on this sad occasion afforded us additional cause to believe that the persons executed were wholly guilty of the murder and that the chiefs had not punished the innocent to screen themselves. This public example, made so long after the crime was committed, we had reason to hope would convince the islanders that no intervention of time would, in future, prevent justice taking its regular course, and that anyone who should dare to commit such barbarities would, sooner or later, suffer punishment. The dead bodies were taken to the shore, attended by most of the natives who were present at the execution, and who, on this occasion, observed some small degree of solemnity by paddling slowly towards the island when they had gained about half the distance between the ship and the shore, they stopped, and some lamentations were heard that continued, I believe, until they were landed. I had proposed that the dead bodies should each be hung upon a tree near the shore to deter others from committing the like offenses. But Tomahomoho informed me that such spectacles would be considered as very improper, contrary to their religious rites, and would greatly offend the whole of the priesthood, that such an exposure was totally unnecessary, as all the inhabitants would become fully acquainted with every circumstance attendant on their trial and execution, and the crime for which they had justly suffered, 
and that he verily believed their fate would have the good effect of restraining the ill-disposed in future. I inquired of him why so few of the natives had attended on this awful occasion. He replied, it was in consequence of the message I had sent on shore to require it. This had created suspicions arising, he said, from the former conduct of Europeans on disputes or misunderstandings taking place between the chiefs and the commanders. Some of these, under the pretext of re-established friendship, would prevail on many of the inhabitants to come off to their ships where they would, as usual, enter into trade with the natives until great numbers were assembled. The commanders then ordered them to be fired upon, which continued without mercy as long as any of the canoes were within shot. Tomahomaho stated that two or three instances of this barbarous nature had taken place, as well by the English as the American traders, and which was the reason why my invitation had been distrusted. The two chiefs solicited my visiting Tritubori, saying, if he had not been so ill, he would have been with us during the late unpleasant business, and that he was very desirous of seeing me, that he might be better convinced of my friendship and good inclinations towards him. I should certainly have complied with this request had there been any object whatever to attain. Although I did not entertain any apprehension for the safety of myself or any person belonging to the ship, whilst under the protection of the chief, yet I did not consider it prudent, whilst the execution of the criminals was so fresh in the minds of the people, to throw temptations of revenge in the way of the daring and ill-disposed part of the society by placing myself and others in their power on shore. Should my confidence on making the trial prove ill-grounded, I should stand self-accused in having so unnecessarily opened the channel for a fresh effusion of blood. Their civil invitations were, for these reasons, declined seemingly much to their mortification. I was not, however, at a loss to relieve them of the disappointment, provided their intentions were as pure as their professions. As the only object the two chiefs had in view was stated to be an interview between me and Tritobori, whole in disposition and the want of a proper conveyance, prevented him coming on board. I proposed, as the day was remarkably fine and pleasant, to make a commodious platform on a double canoe, on which he might, with great ease, come alongside. And then, if he found himself inclined to come on board, he should be hoisted in by means of a chair, or I would converse with him on the platform and render him any medical or other assistance. With this proposal, they appeared to be as well satisfied as if I had visited him on shore. And Coleman, with Tenevi, immediately departed to communicate this plan to the chief, to whom also, the better to ensure his confidence, I again sent a present of red cloth and other articles. These had the desired effect, and the messengers soon returned, accompanying Tri to Bori, who, without the least hesitation, desired he might be hoisted into the ship, which he entered and was placed on the quarter deck with the most implicit confidence. Tri to Bori appeared to be about 33 years of age, his countenance was fallen and reduced. His emaciated frame was in a most debilitated condition, and he was so totally deprived of the use of his legs that he was under the necessity of being carried about like an infant. To these infirmities was added a considerable degree of fever, probably increased by the hurry and fatigue of his visit. The usual compliments and mutual exchange of friendly assurances having passed, I requested the favor of his company below. To this with much pleasure he assented, but no sooner were his intentions known to the natives in the canoes about the ship than a general alarm took place, and he was earnestly recommended not to quit the deck. From a suspicion, as I imagined, amongst the crowd, that the works of death were not yet finally accomplished. Tritubori, however, disregarded all remonstrances and ordered the people who were carrying him in the chair and who, in consequence of the alarm, had stopped to proceed to the cabin where he found a comfortable resting place and appeared to be perfectly at home. He then informed me 
that he had not been ill above 16 or 18 days. And as Mr. Menzies had now inquired into the nature of his disorder and had prepared him some medicines, I gave him hopes that his health would soon be reinstated. Notwithstanding his indisposition, his conversation was cheerful and pleasing, and I had the happiness of hearing him confirm every part of the evidence that had been given against the three unfortunate wretches who had suffered in the morning. He spoke of them all as being equally guilty and of having always borne extremely bad characters and said there were many others of the same description at Wahoo but hoped the example of the morning would be the means of frightening them into a more discreet mode of behavior. The proposed peace with Ohihi was next adverted to. He highly applauded the measure and said, if such a business could be effected, it would be of the utmost importance to them, as the chiefs and people would then return to their habitations. By this means, the country would be better governed, the lands better cultivated, and by the production of a greater abundance from the soil, they would be enabled to procure a more ample supply of European commodities. The same want of confidence, however, that the contending parties entertained was evident in the opinions of this chief. And although the negotiation at Maui had put on a favorable appearance, I began to fear this unfortunate prevailing sentiment would be fatal to the establishment of a general and permanent peace. He likewise took an opportunity to apologize and to express his concern that the reduced state of the country precluded his making me any suitable return for the obligations I had conferred upon him. In reply, I made him a similar answer to that given his father at Maui, adding that on a future visit he might probably have more to spare and I less to beslow. The same of our fireworks still attended us, and Tritaburi was very solicitous to be indulged with a fight of their effect. Considering that the present moment afforded no ill-timed opportunity to impress the minds of these people more deeply with our superiority, his curiosity was gratified in the evening by the display of a small assortment from the after part of the ship. These were beheld by the surrounding natives with more than the usual mixture of the passions already described, for on the present occasion they were regarded with a degree of awful surprise that I had not before observed. This exhibition being finished, Tritubori was conveyed into his canoe in the same manner as he had entered the ship, before his departure, I complimented him with some additional articles, and with these, as well as his reception and entertainment, he seemed highly delighted. Sunday 24th. With a pleasant breeze from the westward on Sunday morning, we plied to the windward along the south side of Wahoo until the afternoon, when we anchored abreast of the westernmost opening, or lagoon, mentioned in our former visit to this island called by the natives Opuro A, and which had since been reported to us by the natives as capable of admitting vessels by warping into it. About half a mile from the reef that binds these shores, we found the soundings irregular from five to fifteen fathoms rocky bottom, but where the ship rode the bottom was tolerably even and composed of sand and coral. The depth of water, about half a league from the reef, was twenty-five fathoms. The evening was two sail approaching to investigate the truth of the report given by the natives. This was deferred until daylight the next morning, when Mr. Whidbey, with two armed boats accompanied by Tomohomoho, was dispatched for that purpose. The part of the island opposite to us was low, or rather only moderately elevated, forming a level country between the mountains that compose the east and west ends of the island. This tract of land was of some extent but did not seem to be populous, nor to possess any great degree of natural fertility, although we were told that, at a little distance from the sea, the soil is rich, and all the necessaries of life are abundantly produced. Whilst we remained in this situation, a few only of the natives paid us their respects. Their canoes were small and indifferent, and their visit was that of curiosity only, as they were furnished with little for barter. Mr. Whidbey returned in the forenoon. He found the opening in the reef, about 400 yards wide, to be occupied by a sandy bar about 200 yards across, on which there was not more than nine or ten feet water. But on each side of it, the water suddenly increased in depth to five, 
and soon to ten fathoms. These soundings were regular on each side of the bar. On the inside, the bottom is a stiff mud or clay. This, with the same soundings, continued to the entrance of a small harbour about half a mile within the bar, formed by two low sandy points about the same distance as under. From each of these sandy points extended a shallow flat near a cable's length on either side, contracting the width of the deep water channel to not more than the fourth of a mile. In this is ten fathoms water, but the entrance is again further contracted by a sunken rock stretching nearly into mid-channel from the northern shore with which it is connected. On this was found only two feet water, although the depth is ten fathoms within a few yards of it. From the entrance, this little harbour, about a quarter of a mile wide, took a northwesterly direction for about a mile, the depth from ten to fifteen fathoms, muddy bottom. It then seemed to spread out and to terminate in two bays, about a mile further to the northward, forming a very snug and convenient little port. Unfortunately, the bar without renders it fit only for the reception of very small craft. Mr. Whidbey, under this impression, lost no time in any further examination, but returned to the ship. And as I was now very anxious to proceed on our voyage, no delay for matters of little importance could be admitted. Mr. Whidbey observed that the soil in the neighborhood of the harbor appeared of a loose, sandy nature, the country low for some distance, and from the number of houses within the harbor, it should seem to be very populous. But the very few inhabitants who made their appearance was an indication of the contrary. At the time the bar was founded, it was low water, and Mr. Whidbey, being unacquainted with the rise and fall, was not able to say what depth there might be on the bar at high tide. The other opening to the eastward, called by the natives Hononuno, Tomohomoho represented as being much more shallow and a smaller place. This induced me to pass it without examination. But to show how liable we are to be mistaken in such inquiries amongst the natives, I was afterwards informed by Mr. Brown of the Butterworth that although it is smaller and of less depth of water, yet it admits of a passage from sea five fathoms deep between the reefs and opens beyond them into a small but commodious basin with regular foundings from seven to three fathoms, clear and good bottom, where a few vessels may ride with the greatest safety, but the only means of getting in or out is by warping. About noon, with a light breeze from the SSW, we weighed and flood to windward. And in the afternoon, our very attentive and useful friend, Tomohomoho, having executed all his commissions and rendered us every service and assistance in his power, bade us farewell. On this occasion, I presented him with such an assortment of articles as afforded him the highest satisfaction. Of these he was richly deserving, from the uniformity and integrity of conduct that he had supported from the first to the last moment of his being with us. We found the western side of Wohu lie in a direction from its SW point N. 25W, six leagues to the west point of the island, which forms also the SW point of Waimea Bay. The SW side of the island is principally composed of steep, craggy mountains, some descending abruptly into the sea, others terminating at a small distance from it, whence a low border of land extends to the seashore, formed by sandy beaches, chiefly bounded by rocks, over which the surf breaks with great violence. From these shores we were visited by some of the natives, in the most wretched canoes I had ever yet seen amongst the South Sea Islanders. They corresponded, however, with the appearance of the country, which from the commencement of the highland to the westward of Oporoa was composed of one barren rocky waste, nearly destitute of verdure, cultivation or inhabitants, with little variation all the way to the west point of the island. Not far from the SW point is a small grove of shabby coconut trees, and along those shores are a few draggling fishermen's huts. Nearly in the middle of this side of the island is the only village we had seen westward from Oporoa. 
In its neighborhood, the bases of the mountains retire further from the seashore and a narrow valley, presenting a fertile cultivated aspect, seem to separate and win some distance through the hills. The shore here forms a small sandy bay. On its southern side, between the two high rocky precipices, in a grove of coconut and other trees is situated the village, and in the center of the bay, about a mile to the north of the village, is a high rock, remarkable for its projecting from a sandy beach. At a distance, it appears to be detached from the land. Between this and the high rocky point to the south of the village is a small bank of soundings that stretches some distance into the sea. On the south side of this bank, the soundings were irregular, from 25 to 8 fathoms, rocky bottom. But to the north of it, near the rock, no ground could be reached with 90 and 100 fathoms of line, though not more than the fourth of a mile from the shore. This we found to be the cafe also, a little to the southward of the bank. In both these places, we were for some time very awkwardly situated, without wind, yet with a swell and current that set us so fast towards the land that I was under some apprehension for the safety of the ship, as the united force of the current and swell prevented any effect from the assistance of the boats. From this dilemma, however, we were happily relieved by a breeze springing up that enabled us to increase our distance from the land. The few inhabitants who visited us from the village earnestly entreated our anchoring and told us that if we would stay until the morning, their chief would be on board with a number of hogs and a great quantity of vegetables, but that he could not visit us then because the day was taboo puri. The face of the country did not, however, promise an abundant supply. The situation was exposed, and the extent of anchorage was not only very limited, but bad. Under these circumstances, having, by eleven at night, got clear of the shores, I deemed it most prudent to make the bell of our way with a light S.E. breeze towards Atawai. Tuesday, 20th. We had not reached more than halfway between the two islands by noon the next day, when the observed latitude was 21st and 19th, longitude 200 nasta 18. In this situation, Wahoo extended, by compass, from S88E to S64E, and Atawai N70W to N87W. The weather was now calm, and continued so all the afternoon. This gave to some of the islanders, who were passing from Atawai to Moi, an opportunity to visit the ship. The foremost of these, undertaking so distant a voyage in a single canoe, much attracted our attention. On her coming alongside, she proved to be without exception the finest canoe we had seen amongst these islands. This vessel was 61 feet and a half long, exceeding by four feet and a half, the largest canoes of Ohaihi. Its depth and width were in their proportion of building and the whole of the workmanship was finished in a very masterly manner. The size of this canoe was not its only curiosity. The wood of which it was formed was an infinitely greater, being made out of an exceedingly fine pine tree. As this species of timber is not the produce of any of these islands, and as the natives informed us, it was drifted by the ocean. It is probably the growth of some of the northern parts of America. This it seems, was left on the east end of Atawai, in a perfectly found state, without a shake or a bruise. It remained there unwrought for some time, in the hope of a companion arriving in the same manner. In this cafe, the natives would have been enabled to have formed the grandest double canoe these islands could boast of, but their patience having been exhausted, they converted the tree into this canoe, which by the lightness of its timber, and the large outrigger it is capable of supporting is rendered very lively in the sea and well adapted to the service it generally performs, that of communicating intelligence to Tayo, whilst he is absent from the government of his own dominions. The circumstance of fir timber being drifted on the northern sides of these islands is by no means uncommon, especially at Atawai, where there then was a double canoe of a middling size made from two small pine trees that were driven on shore nearly at the same spot. Some logs of timber 
with three or four trees of the pine tribe were then lying on the island that had at different times been lodged by the sea but were too much decayed and worm-eaten to be usefully appropriated. As this kind of timber is the known produce of all the northern part of the west side of America, little doubt can remain of these trees having come from that continent or its contiguous islands, since it is more than probable that if any intervening land did exist between the Sandwich Islands and the countries on every side of them, and particularly in the direction of the prevailing winds, such would have been discovered before now. And hence we may conclude that trees do perform very distant voyages and sometimes arrive in a found state at the end of their journey. This instance alone will be sufficient to develop the mystery attending the means by which the inhabitants of Easter Island procure their canoes, since the distance of that island from South America is not so far by 80 leagues as Atawai, is from the shores of North America. The object of this canoe expedition, we learned, was to inform Tayo of some commotions that had arisen against the government of Enemo, the regent. But these having been timely opposed, they had subsided without any loss on the part of Enemo or his adherents, whilst on the side of the conspirators, two chiefs and five men had been killed and some others wounded who had made their escape to the woods. The leg bones of the two unfortunate chiefs were in the canoe and had some of the sinews and flesh still adhering to them. In this state, they were to be presented to Tayo as trophies of victory over the rebels. This large single canoe was charged with the official dispatch and important part of the business, whilst the others were employed in conducting a certain number of the ringleaders as prisoners to Tayo for his examination and sentence on their conduct. Amongst these were several of his nearest relations. One in particular was his half-sifter, who had also been his wife or mistress and had borne him some children. The charge of this embassy was entrusted to a young chief, about 22 years of age, named Oyashu. Our meeting him must be considered as rather a singular circumstance, as the business that had carried Puri to Maui, a chief we had taken on board at Wahu, and was on his return home to Atawai, had been some matters of importance relative to the government of that island, in consequence of which Titeri and Tayo had appointed this young man chief of the district of Waimea, one of the most important trusts on the island, where his presence at this time was considered as highly necessary. Puri requested I would permit Yeshu to return in the ship to Atawai, which being granted, the latter instructed another chief with the purport of his commission. This occupied them in very secret conversation for about half an hour, when, the charge being properly and completely transferred, the canoes pushed off, and made the bed of their way towards Wahu, where they expected to arrive early the next morning, having quitted Atawai at sunset the preceding evening. Now, during the night, the wind was light from the northward, but in the morning, it freshened to a pleasant, though unfavorable breeze that prevented our weathering the northeast point of Atawai, as I had intended, for the purpose of examining its northern shores. The water being smooth, and the wind steady in force and direction, I was in hopes we should have been able to beat round it until we had approached the shores, when it became evident we were in a strong current setting to leeward. I, however, did not wish to abandon hastily the project I had in view, and therefore, about nine o'clock, we tacked about two miles from the shore, then extending by compass from N8W to S20W. These extremities, which lie from each other, N, 14E and S14W, are each formed by low land, are about nine miles asunder, and constitute what may he deemed the east side of the island. The former, in a rounding point, projects into the ocean from a very remarkable forked hill, that is in a great measure, detached from the rest of the connected mountains of the island. The latter extends from a range of low hills that stretch along the coast, at a small distance within the beach. Beyond these hills, towards the foot of the mountains that are at some distance from the shore, the country presented a most delightful and even enchanting appearance. Not only from the richness of its verdure,
and the high date of cultivation in the low regions, but from the romantic air that the mountains assumed in various shapes and proportions, clothed with a forest of luxuriant foliage, whose different shades added great richness and beauty to the landscape. About a league to the south of the southern extremity lies the southeast point of the island, formed by a bold, bluff, barren, high, rocky headland falling perpendicularly into the sea. Between this and the low point is a small cove, accessible for boats only, where, near a rivulet that flows into it, is a village of the natives. This part seemed to be very well watered, as three other rapid small streams were observed to flow into the sea within the limits above mentioned. This portion of Atawai, the most fertile and pleasant district of the island, is the principal residence of the king, or, in his absence, of the superior chief, who generally takes up his abode in an extensive village, about a league to the southward of the northeast point of the island. Here, Enemo the regent, with the young prince Tamueri, were now living, who sent Williams, the Welchman mentioned in our former visit, to acquaint me that, in the course of the forenoon, they would visit the ship if we were near enough the shore for them to embark. I understood from Williams that we had gained so much on the esteem and regard of Enemo, the young prince, the principal chiefs and others on our last visit, that for a great length of time, the hogs and every other production of the major part of the island had been tabooed in order that on our arrival, our wants might be amply supplied of these kind intentions we were made acquainted before our departure from Oahe, but I knew too well the little regard that the whole of the great South Sea nation of islanders bear to truth, to rely implicitly on such tales. And it was very fortunate that I did not, and that I had availed myself of the bounty of Tamar Ma and the rest of our Ohihin friends, for I was given to understand that in consequence of our having exceeded the period of our promised return, the pressing demands of the trading vessels and the extravagant prices paid by their commanders in firearms, ammunition, and other commodities for such things as their necessities or fancies prompted them to purchase. The regent had been prevailed upon to suspend the interdiction under the persuasion that we should not return and that most of the supplies had been disposed of. Some few hogs, I found, might probably be procured from the north side, and I was happy to discover that the few supplies we were likely to obtain were in the route I wished to pursue. But I was again mortified on hearing that the current fat almost without intermission from the NW along the north side of the island and following the direction of the shores on the southern and western sides of the island caused a stream almost always round it. So that the easiest mode of arriving at the northeast point, now scarcely more than two leagues distant, was to sail to leeward round its west extremity and then to turn up along its northern side, which Williams informed me afforded no shelter nor convenient anchorage for shipping. Several vessels, he said, since he had been at Atawai, had fallen as we had done to leeward of the northeast point, and all their attempts to beat round it proved ineffectual, one vessel only having succeeded after a week's trial, and which then passed the point merely by an accidental spirit of wind from the southward. Williams confirmed also the account of the insurrection that we had heard the preceding day. He dated that the disaffection had been produced by the conduct of the regent Enemo, or as he is frequently called, Ataya that no harm was meditated against Tayo or his son Tamueri, but on the contrary, it was the general wish of the people that the young prince would either direct the government himself or that Tayo would appoint some other person to officiate in his absence until his son should be considered equal to the task. The principal dislike to the regent arose from his having put several people to death and confiscated the property of others for having been suspected of witchcraft, a notion that universally prevails and is confided in by the generality of the people belonging to the Sandwich Islands. It seemed, by his account, 
to have been a fortunate circumstance. That the insurrection was discovered in its infancy and that he and Rowbottom, with five other English or American sailors, who since our last visit had deserted from different trading vessels, had sided with the governor as, on their instantly attacking the leaders of the rebellion, it was easily quelled. This circumstance was afterwards mentioned by the natives, who spoke in the highest terms of their courage and propriety of conduct. We again stood in shore, and about noon were honoured with the presence of Enemo. On this occasion, I expected much satisfaction in the renewal of our former acquaintance, but instead of deriving any pleasure in our meeting, I experienced sensations of a very opposite nature the instant he entered the ship. His limbs, no longer able to support his aged and venerable person, seemed not only deserted by their former muscular strength, but their substance was also entirely wafted away, and the skin, now enclosing the bones only, hung loose and uncontracted from the joints, whilst a dry white scurf, or rather scales, overspread the whole surface of his body from head to foot, tended greatly to increase the miserable and deplorable appearance of his condition. And I was not a little shocked and surprised that one so wretchedly infirm should have taken the painful trouble of this visit. The compliment was a very flattering one, and I did not sail to receive it as it was intended, by acknowledging myself considerably obliged. Notwithstanding his corporeal infirmities and the decline of his life, he still supported a cheerful degree of spirits, said he was very happy to see us, and much concerned that we had not arrived on an earlier day according to our promise, when he should have had an abundant quantity of refreshments for our use, and lamented that those supplies were now greatly exhausted. I acknowledged that it was our misfortune, not his fault, that we had not arrived at the time appointed, thanked him for the interest he had preserved and the attention he had shown to our welfare during our absence, and rewarded his friendship by presents similar to those I had made the principal chiefs of the other islands. With these he was highly gratified, especially with the scarlet cloak and a complete set of armorer's tools. These are in high estimation, as these people are fond of forming the iron for their several purposes after their own fashion. Enemo remained on board most of the afternoon, made many sensible and judicious inquiries, and soon took an occasion to express, in the warmed manner, his satisfaction at the measures I had taken for the purpose of establishing a general peace. This he had learned from Puri, who had visited Enemo on shore early in the morning. The old regent, with great understanding, adverted to its necessity for the mutual good, happiness, and prosperity of all parties, and observed that to him it would be particularly grateful as it would relieve him from much care and anxiety by the return of his relations, friends, and countrymen. He then desired to know whether on my return to England I would take him thither, as his principal wish in this life was to see that country and to have the gratification of speaking to His Majesty King George. After this, he said, he should die in peace without having another wish to indulge on this subject he seemed so earnest that I thought proper, by a promise in the affirmative, to favour his fond hopes. The ship being near the shore, about four in the afternoon the good old regent took his leave. After acquainting me that as the next day was Tabu Puri, neither himself nor the prince could leave the shore, but that he would direct a chief to bring off such hogs and vegetables as could be collected by the morning and that if we would remain off this part of the island until the day following, he would either bring himself or send off such further supplies as could be procured in the neighbourhood. Thus we parted from this friendly old chief, with little expectation of ever seeing him again. Thursday 14th Soon after the departure of Enemo, Tamueri, attended by Pure, came on board, the young prince appeared to be in high spirits and was totally divested of those fears which he had entertained on his former visit. He seemed to be made very happy by our return, but, as his guardian had done, upbraided us for not having come before, 
when the several productions of his country were in the greatest abundance and had been reserved for our use and service. The approach of night and the distance we were to leeward of his habitation conspired to shorten his visit. I made him some presents suitable to his rank and condition, after which, with the chiefs who were on board, he reluctantly took leave, desiring we would remain in the neighbourhood two or three days, that we might receive such articles of refreshment as could be obtained. This, I said, would depend upon circumstances, and on the departure of the canoes, we made all sail to windward, with a pleasant steady breeze at NNE, notwithstanding which, the next morning we had not advanced more than a mile to windward of our situation the preceding evening. Being near the shore in the forenoon and seeing some canoes making towards the ship, we tacked and brought two to give them an opportunity of coming alongside. These presently were proved to contain our friends Puretu and some other chiefs who had brought us eight middling-sized hogs and some vegetables. This was but a scanty supply and as the apologies we received proved we had little probability of procuring more and as little chance of beating round this part of the island in any tolerable time, I declined, persisting, and bore up for Waimea Bay. There, I intended to complete our water, and then, without further delay, to direct our course to the northward. Having still remaining of our Oiheen stock, a number of hogs, exclusive of fix hogs' heads, and ten barrels that had been salted and headed down, and every man in the ship having been daily served with as much pork as he liked. These refreshments, with those we had before, obtained from our Spanish friends in New Albion, had LB perfectly re-established the health and strength of every individual on board, that I hoped we should be able to encounter the difficulties I had, reason to apprehend in our next campaign, with all the firmness and alacrity that such services demand. Pori and the rest of the chiefs accompanied us, in order that they might afford us their good offices at Waimea, where, owing to the light baffling winds in its neighbourhood, we were prevented anchoring until eleven at night, when we took our former station, conceiving it to be the belt in the bay, in thirty-three fathoms water, dark sandy bottom, about half a league from the shore. Friday 29th. The next morning, as the few natives who had visited us brought little for sale, Puri and the rest of his friends betook themselves to the shore for the purpose of collecting in the neighborhood such hogs and vegetables as could be procured. The launch was hoisted out and sent with a guard of marines under the orders of Lieutenant Swain for a supply of water. I was engaged on shore most of the day in regulating a comfortable establishment that I had procured from the chiefs for our two female passengers, the one named Rahina, the other Taimarau who we had met with, as already stated, at Nootka in October 1792, and had brought them from thence to restore them to this, their native country, from whence they had been forcibly taken and had endured an uncomfortable absence of upwards of a year. This office of humanity, to which their behaviour and amiable disposition so justly entitled them, I was fortunate enough to accomplish to their satisfaction and I had the pleasure of finding that they both acknowledged this, and the civil and attentive treatment they had each received from every person on board the Discovery and Chatham, with expressions of gratitude and the most affectionate regard. Amongst the various reports industriously circulated at Nootka by the citizens of the United States of America, to the prejudice and dishonor of the British subjects trading on the coast of Northwest America, it had been positively asserted that some of the latter had brought the natives of the Sandwich Islands from thence to the coast of America, and had there sold them to the natives of those shores for furs. These two young women were particularly instanced as having been so brought and disposed of by Mr. Baker, commanding the Jenny, of Bristol. And the story was told with such plausibility that I believe it had acquired some degree of credit with Senor Quadra and most of the Spanish officers who heard it. The arrival of the Jenny, however, in the port of Nootka, gave a flat contradiction to these scandalous reports, and proved them to be equally malicious and untrue. As the two girls were found, still remaining on board the Jenny, without having entertained any idea that they were intended to have been sold. Nor did they mention to have received any ill usage from Mr. Baker, 
but on the contrary, that they had been treated with every kindness and attention whilst under his protection. Although I had not any personal knowledge of Mr. Baker previous to his entering Nootka, yet I should conceive him totally incapable of such an act of barbarity and injustice. And if there were the least sincerity in the solicitude he expressed to me for the future happiness and welfare of these young women, it is impossible he could ever have meditated such a design. I do not, however, mean to vindicate the propriety of Mr. Baker's conduct in bringing these girls from their native country, for I am decidedly of opinion it was highly improper. And if the young women are to be credited, their seduction and detention on board Mr. Baker's vessel were inexcusable. They report that they went on board with several others of their countrywomen who were permitted to return again to the shore, but that they were confined down in the cabin until the vessel had sailed and was at some distance from one how. On the other hand, Mr. Baker states that he put to sea without any knowledge of their being on board his vessel but be that as it may, we found them thus situated at Nootka, and the future objects of Mr. Baker's voyage leading him wide of the Sandwich Islands. He requested, as I then noticed, that I would allow them to take their passage thither on board the Discovery. To this I assented, and on our sailing from Nootka, they were sent on board and taken under my protection. The names of these unfortunate females we first understood were Tahiopia and Timarau, both of the island of Wanhao. The former, about 15 years of age, was there of some consequence. The latter, about four or five years older, was related to the former but was not of equal rank in the island. Tahiopia, for some reason I never could understand, altered her name to that of Rahena a short time after they came on board and was continued to be so called. After leaving Nootka, our visit to the Spanish settlements, especially during the first part of our residence there, afforded them some recompense for the long and tedious voyage they had been compelled to undertake from their native country. The fight of horses, cattle, and other animals, with a variety of objects to which they were in your strangers, produced in them the highest entertainment and without the least hesitation or alarm, they were placed on horseback on their first landing and with a man to lead the animal. They rode without fear and were by that means enabled to partake of all the civilities and diversions which our Spanish friends so obligingly offered and provided. On all these occasions, they were treated with the greatest kindness and attention by the ladies and gentlemen, at which they were not less delighted than they were surprised at the social manner in which both sexes live according to the custom of most civilized nations, differing so very materially from that of their own. These pleasures, however, they enjoyed but a short time, for soon after our arrival at Monterey, they were both taken extremely ill, and notwithstanding that every means in our power was resorted to for the re-establishment of their health, they did not perfectly recover until after our arrival at Ohaihi. They seemed much pleased with the European fashions, and in conforming to this new system of manners, they conducted themselves in company with a degree of propriety beyond all expectation. Their European dress contributed most probably to this effect, and produced, particularly in Rahaina, a degree of personal delicacy that was conspicuous on many occasions. This dress was a riding habit, as being best calculated for their situation and indeed the best in our power to procure. Its skirt, or lower part, was soon found to be intended as much for concealment as for warmth, and in the course of a very short time, she became so perfectly familiar to its use in this respect, that in going up and down the ladders that communicate with the different parts of the ship, she would take as much care not to expose her ankles as if she had been educated by the most rigid governess and as this was particularly observable in the conduct of Rahaina, it is probable her youth rendered her more susceptible of fresh notions and of receiving new ideas and impressions from the surrounding objects than the more matured age of her friend Timaro. The elegance of Rahaina's figure, the regularity and softness of her features, and the delicacy which she naturally possessed, gave her a superiority in point of personal accomplishments over the generality of her sex 
amongst the Sandwich Islanders, in addition to which her sensibility and turn of mind, her sweetness of temper and complacency of manners, were beyond anything that could have been expected from her birth or native education. So that if it were fair to judge of the dispositions of a whole nation from the qualities of these two young women, it would seem that they are endued with much affection and tenderness. At least, such was their deportment towards us, by which they gained the regard and good wishes of, I believe, everyone on board, whilst I became in no small degree solicitous for their future happiness and prosperity. One how being the place of their birth and former residence, I had promised to set them on shore on that island, but on our arrival at Ohaihi, I had understood that the inhabitants of Wanhao had almost entirely abandoned it in consequence of the excessive drought that had prevailed during the last summer, which had nearly caused the total destruction of all its vegetable productions. Finding on my arrival at Atawai this information to have been well grounded, I came to a determination to leave our female friends at this island. Being well aware that the mode of living they had lately been constrained to adopt, and that their having eaten at mine and other tables in the company of men, was an offence of so heinous a nature against their laws as to subject them both to the punishment of death, I took much pains to point out to Titeri and Tayo their innocence in this respect, and obtained from them both the strongest assurances that they should not be liable to the least injury on that account, but that on their landing they should be immediately taken care of and protected. These entreaties I enforced with Enemo, in the presence of Rahina and Timaro when he was on board, and had the satisfaction of receiving from him similar assurances of his protection, not only of their persons, but their property, and that whatever articles we might think proper to give them should be secured to them, and no one should be permitted to rest or extort anything from them. These assurances being given not only by Enemo, but by the rest of the chiefs then present, I thought, by the purchase of a house and a small portion of land, to add to their future respectability and comfort this enemo would not permit me to do, but instantly directed Oshu to allot to each of them an estate in his newly acquired district of Waimea, to which Oshu with much apparent pleasure consented. The better to make sure of this donation and to secure the permanent possession of it to these young women, I desired that the houses and land might be given to me, that the property should be considered as vested in me, and that no person whatever should have any right in it but by my permission and that I would allow Rahena and Timarau to live upon the estates. Matters having been in this manner arranged, Oyashu had gone on shore in the morning to fix upon the lands that were to be thus disposed of, and about three in the afternoon he returned, saying that he had fixed upon two very eligible situations adjoining to each other, which if I approved should be mine. If not, I was at liberty to make choice of any other part of the district I might think more proper. In consequence of this offer, I attended him on shore, accompanied by some of the officers and our two females, who had received such an assortment of articles from us as were deemed sufficient to make them respectable without exciting the envy of the chiefs or their neighbors. We found the situation proposed by Ashu to be a very large portion of the fertile valley, noticed on our former visit on the western side of the river, commencing at the sea beach and extending along the banks of the river to a certain established landmark, including a very considerable extent of the inland mountainous country. The contiguity of these estates to the commerce of all the Europeans who visit this island and the territory which it comprehended was in value so far above our most sanguine expectations that I was led to suspect the sincerity of the intended donation. But to this we became reconciled from the protestations of the chief himself, as also from the universal declaration of many of the natives who had accompanied us, and who asserted that Ishu really intended thus to dispose of the land in question, to which he added the most solemn assurances that he would protect them in the possession of it, together with their canoes and all the articles they had brought with them from the ship, which declaration seemed perfectly to satisfy the young women that they would be put into possession of these estates.
and that their persons and property would be protected according to the assurances we had now received. A long established line of division formed by trees and a common road separated the two estates. The lower one nearest the sea, which was the most extensive, was allotted to Rahena, the other to Timaro, each of which they respectively took possession of and in the warmest and most grateful terms acknowledged the obligations they were under for this last mark of our attention to their future happiness and for the friendship and kindness they had experienced during their residence amongst us. They attended us to the beach where they took an affectionate leave and we embarked for the ship, leaving them to meditate on their new situation and the various turns of fortune that had conspired to place them in such comfortable circumstances. On my arrival on board, I found our friends who had been employed in procuring us supplies had returned with little success. Seventeen middling-sized hogs, a few potatoes and some taro without any yams was the whole amount of their collection. Our stock of water was completely replenished and being satisfied from the report of the chiefs that no additional quantity of provisions was to be had at this island, I informed them that we should depart the first favorable opportunity they inquired if I intended to visit the north side as Pure and Tu would in that case continue on board for the purpose of assisting us in procuring some yams which they said were more plentiful there than on the south side of the island. But as nothing less than a very tempting opportunity would have induced me to go thither, I declined giving them further trouble and having presented them with such articles as their services and the occasion demanded, they took their leave with expressions of the highest satisfaction, promising to pay every attention and afford all possible assistance and protection to their countrywomen whom we had just landed and in whose future happiness and welfare they knew we had great interest. A light breeze of wind springing up from the land. About ten at night, we put to sea and stood to the westward to take the advantage of the southwesterly winds which we were led to believe prevailed generally at this season of the year. Saturday 30th. On Saturday morning, Atawai bore by compass from N20E to S77E, Wanhao, S64W to S85W, and Orihua, west. But instead of the promised southwest wind, we were met by a fresh trade wind from the northeast. As this circumstance precluded our making a speedy survey of the north side of the island, I gave up that object for the present. A report having prevailed that Captain Cook had erroneously separated Orihua from Wanhao, it being asserted that the inhabitants walked from one place to the other, and that Captain King had been misinformed as to the number of inhabitants being 4,000. As these facts could be easily ascertained, we steered over for Orihua, and passed within a quarter or half a mile of its shores. It was soon proved that Orihua is positively separated from Wanhao by a channel about a mile in breadth. And though the depth of the sea appeared by its color to be irregular, it was manifestly far too deep for people to W from one island to the other. As this channel lies immediately open, D is exposed to the whole force and influence of the trade wind and the swell of the sea consequent upon it neither of which were very moderate at the time of our examination, it is natural to infer that if the channel did admit of foot passengers crossing it, the causeway would have been visible above the surface of the water, or from the violence with which the sea broke on the contiguous shores, that it certainly would have broken over a space so shallow as to allow people to pass and repass on foot. But the sea did not break in any part of the channel, which, on the contrary, seemed to be nearly of a sufficient depth to admit of a passage for the discovery. With respect to the population, Captain King must doubtless have been led into error. The island of Orihua is of very small extent and wholly composed of one rugged, naked, barren rock to all appearance destitute of soil and presenting no indication of its being or having ever been the residence of human creatures. Having completely satisfied our minds in these respects, we hauled our wind to the northwest and with all sail set, we bade adieu to the Sandwich Islands for the present and made the best of our way towards Nootka. End of voyage to the North Pacific Ocean and round the world by Captain George Vancouver, Book the Third.
Thank you for listening.